Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, regular council meeting for Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. Good morning, council. Good morning, guests. Good morning, staff. And good morning to the viewing public. And we uh, are looking at an agenda that was published on our website. And uh, there is a, an agenda that is uh, available, and there was a slight change to, to allow um, the uh, Item 10.3 to proceed at one o'clock, and that's with our safety committee. And we have members of our of our staff that uh, are working members, so we were trying to have it to uh, to a one p.m. So if I could have um, a motion to amend the agenda to allow us to move the 10.3 to one p.m. I'll move that amendment. Uh, member Allwood, do I have a seconder for that? Member Wickens, any discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor. That is carried. Okay. I see uh, Councillor uh, Lowhead, you're moving up in the world. You're coming closer to the center. And... Yeah. <laughs> I see uh, the deputy mayor is, uh, is on hybrid mode today and he's, he's working remote, but still uh, fully engaged. Are there any other amendments to the agenda that wishes to be brought forward? If not, can I have a motion to approve the amended agenda? Um, Member Dubik, second by... Councillor Lohead, any discussion there? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. So we have approved, since we have an approved agenda now, we do go to our next item, number three, is the open forum. And that's for it, I, uh, items that can be spoken to on their agenda. So our, I'm going to our deputy clerk. Are there anybody registered to speak in open forum? Okay. I'll give you a second there. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Before we go to that, I had it all down and I missed it. Do you with? Eh? So uh, we do have an introduction uh, to our staff and uh, Madam Clerk, I'm going to allow this to, uh, to be brought forward from yourself. Uh, thanks. New to our staff, uh, we have Rennell Harepole. She is not new to municipal government, but she is new to our municipality. She is our uh, municipal services assistant for planning and administration. Hello, Welcome. everybody. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to council. I have felt really welcomed here and I've been enjoying working with the staff and learning my new role. And um, I look forward to watching the role grow and me grow with it. Well, that's fantastic. And, and we want to say welcome to Team Grey Highlands. And uh, I don't know, we have about 10 minutes of questioning from Count. Well, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, welcome to, uh, to our, our team and uh, all the best. And uh, you'll have good leadership here as well. And uh, certainly if you have any questions, uh, as you said, you'll grow along with uh, how we grow. So thanks for, for coming up today. So Madam Clerk, do you have anything else? Or? I noticed last week, all of a sudden, we were getting different emails. I'm going, oh, yeah, that's that new person. <laughs> Sorry about that, Madam Clerk. All right, uh, open forum. So, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, uh, do we have some people registered for open forum? Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Um, yes, we have Boyka Glazier, who would like to speak on item 11.9, Old Baldy Access. Okay. And she's speaking remotely, so uh, I'll just whenever you're ready to queue that up, then, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk. And she, okay, and she has three minutes when she starts. Oh, morning. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I have a few questions in reference to the item eleven point nine on the agenda. Um. Really, uh, number one question is why does municipality of Grey Highland need to legally establish Old Baldy Access Road as a public highway when, by law 2019-050, already states MGH is maintaining Old Baldy Access as a public highway? In that bylaw, 2019-050, Schedule A, it is stated the purpose of municipality what, is of obtaining the title to lands upon which it maintains a public highway. 
in additional Schedule C, in the Schedule C of the same bylaw, it states, the quote, the municipality is acquiring the property for the purpose of obtaining title to lands upon which it maintains a public highway for access to Old Baldy. And then I'll just use an exercise. Um, if I am... Um, if I'm taking a walking route, as an example, just to kind of clarify, I understand this um, uh, registration, uh, legal, uh, it's registration. I I'm walking to Old Bali Conservation Area, for, uh, for an example, it's just an exercise in an imaginative way. I start at the northwest corner of side road 10D, proceeding south on the line 3 Third, on the third line A, and turning right to side road 7B, proceeding west, where side road 7B turns south, and into Old Baldy Access Road to my destination, Old Baldy Conservation Area. Question I have here, are any of the named municipal roads legally established as a public highways. My understanding is that I always have free and clear ingress and egress to Old Baldy Conservation Area via any of the public roads and routes I take. How is Old Baldy Access Road being currently used and maintained that differs from any other years? Uh, I also looked into definition of a highway from the Highway Traffic Act and a definition of roadway from the Highway Traffic Act. Um, and um, I, have, I do have concerns on these uh, both um, interpretations from that of um, requiring legally to establish all Baldy as a public highway. And okay. uh, further in the report plan. Okay, Volka, you, you've first. used up your three minutes. Uh, oh, can you summarize thanks. it? Oh, 10 I minutes? just have finished two. Yeah, one, uh, one minute. Names only one property with a civic address on Old Baldy Axis. There are more than one. I do not agree with the recommended bylaw to legally establish public highway for Old Baldy Axis Road. I support the Old Baldy Axis to be part of the official portion of the Bruce Trail Network. Thank you very much. Thank you for the extension. Appreciate it. Thank you, Volka. And, and we'll be talking about this uh, later on in the agenda. And I think we've captured your comments as best we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, that's uh, one individual speaking to is under unscheduled or, or to the items of open forum. Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have anybody else wishing to speak? Thank you, Mayor McQueen. We did have an additional person registered to speak, Matthew Brooks, on items 9.2 and 9.3, um, but I currently don't see him in attendance online. So if he happens to be in attendance online under a different name, if he would raise his hand, I could give him access to speak. Yeah, we don't see him on a registered list here. So um... We could uh, we can move on and maybe come back if he does pop up. We can. Oh, go ahead, uh, Director Cornfield. Mayor um, McQueen, sorry, uh, Matthew Brooks is speaking to the transportation items of retail intersection and the alignment of um, the West Back Line. Right. So I think that maybe there was a mistake of him signing in as a participant. Oh, uh, he will be joining right. us later on in yes. the agenda. Yes. If council has any, uh, as our consultant for those projects. So. That's right. Now I remember reading the report. He's from G, G and Blue Planet. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now I recognize that where it come from. So thanks for that clarity, uh, Director Cornfield. So then one last call to our deputy uh, clerk. Is there anybody else wishing to speak? There are no further registrations for open form. And there's nobody in the, in the chamber here that's wishing to speak as well. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Um, Hope everybody was able to capture the content of Boca's uh, uh, open forum comments there. So now we have an approved agenda. Are there any declarations of procurement interest with three council members? Uh, Member Dubik or Council Dubik. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So given that I'm on the board of the BTC, uh, the Bruce Trail Conservancy, um, I will step back from item 11.9. Uh, the BTC is mentioned um, in the report and it is part is mentioned as part of an alternate motion. So I'll just step back for that item. Okay, thanks for raising that then and just uh, remind me at that, that time as well. Are there any other uh, pecuniary interests with regards to council members? Okay, if one does arise at that time, you can raise it then. We have the minutes of uh, March 15th, 2023. Can I have a mover and a seconder for those minutes, please? Uh, Councilor Lohead, Councilor Allen. Any errors or omissions on those uh, minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Uh, we have the committee, uh, the min <coughs> sorry, the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting on March 22nd, 2023. Can I have a mover and a seconder for those, uh, Councilor uh, Allwood? Second, Councillor Wickens. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. All right, so we have two delegations to speak today to council. And the first one is the Southeast Gray Community Health Center. And we have Alex Hector and Larry Mann in person. So uh, Alex, last time I saw you had a mask on when we have the anniversary, I guess, or whatever it was, 10th anniversary, I think it was over here. <laughs> And uh, so now I got a, I got the face. <laughs> We're all in sort of uh, in that mode, right? So anyway, you have uh, ten minutes, and uh, your information was provided to somewhat here on our agenda. So whenever you're ready, you come up to the podium here, and uh, yeah, and welcome. Thank you, Mayor McQueen, and Council for having us here. Um, to kick this off, I got to tell you a little story. About eight years ago, I saw my nurse practitioner who suggested after my whining that I go down to emerge and see a doctor whom she knew had done a locum at the CHC, said he would be best to service me. And she said, go down at 6.30 because he finishes at seven, that'll be perfect. I did, chatted with him, young guy from Collingwood, great guy. I whined, he said, forget it. And, uh, but he did say, as I was leaving, he said, you are really fortunate to live in this area because you have probably the best uh, primary health care in the area, if not the province, and it should be the model. And I had no idea what he was talking about because I was a service user and I never really looked at the services. I just accepted them and used them. And I didn't know why he said what he said, but Alex does. <laughs> so I'm gonna let Alex explain that well, you must be in good hands because you look very very healthy today so <laughs> he was <marvelous>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for that uh, introduction larry and uh, mayor and council thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, uh, provide a, a little bit of an update today uh next slide please so really just uh, three objectives today uh first of all is to provide some information on uh, on what we do and how we operate and the benefits that we bring to the community um, secondly, to provide an update on programs that are being funded by the municipality, and that's a very, very important aspect of our operations. And then uh, thirdly, and, and most importantly, express our appreciation for the ongoing support that you provide. Next slide, please. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to, to go through the information package that was provided in advance, and I'm not gonna talk to all the individual points here. Um, I, I, I really wanna say that the Southeast Gray Community Health Center is not just your average health center. Um, we are significantly more than primary care. Um, and um, thanks to that, in part for your financial support, um, we provide um, a team-based approach. Um, and, and we've all been hearing a lot about that in the news lately, about a team-based approach to primary care. There was a just a recent story um, one of our physicians um, um, had a patient that needed some assistance uh, um, related to their particular health situation. And he was able to refer to one of our allied health staff um, who could provide that assistance that was not medical in nature, but lifestyle in nature uh, to address some immediate concerns. The referral happened, um, um, the appointment was made same day, um, and the allied health person provided a report back to the doctor by the end of the day to say, I saw the patient, we talked, we have a plan in place. 
And that is just absolutely significant, uh, both in terms of the ability to do that within the same organization and the very, very timely response that happens. Often these types of situations take weeks, if not months, um, and to be able to do that same day is just absolutely fantastic. We are a top tier uh, performing organization, both financially and in clinical measures. Um, and so uh, Great Highlands provides us with money. And I think it's important to know that, uh, for you to know that we're good stewards of that money, uh, um, ensuring that we get good value for the money that we do spend. Our cost per patient visit uh, is the best in Ontario um, at $117 roughly per patient visit. And our cost per patient served uh, is also top tier at about $750 per patient. Um, so that, you know, in terms of measures, our peer groups are typically, from a CHC perspective, are typically $1,000 to $2,000 to $3,000 per patient. And so we really, really focus our budget, focus our spending on the patient. Um, some additional facts, I guess, um, we really are a community-based organization and we really focus on not just the primary care aspects, as I've mentioned before, but importantly, the other things that influence a person's health. So the feelings of well-being. Um, in our community, as uh, no doubt you're aware, we have um, um, a demographic that is skewed towards the seniors population. And so it's very, very important that we provide services that are appropriate to those seniors. Often seniors have um, um, more complex health needs. Um, as we get older, things happen to us. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's as much as you can try and postpone it, there's no avoiding it. And uh, that's just our reality. Uh, and so we really focus on helping uh, the vulnerable segment in our, in our population, um, the folks that have comorbidity, multiple health challenges, living with chronic pain, chronic disease, and so on. Next slide, please. So we design and del deliver programs to support seniors, as well as the Anabaptist community and youth, as well as the public at large. Um, and um, in addition to sort of the physical aspects the intent of these programs is also to, to, to either maintain or help improve mental health. Um, um, we uh, collaborate with uh, many organizations throughout Graham Bruce, um, both in terms of use of our space, as well as collaborating in terms of program development, as well as collaborating in terms of program delivery. And you can see I've mentioned a few in the presentation there. Um, so social isolation is a very, very important aspect of health. Um, and I think I mentioned this at the last uh, council meeting, which uh, uh, I did verbally, or sorry, uh, virtually. Um, um, and it, it was a bit of an eye opener for me when I learned this fact and that social isolation puts seniors at greater risk than uh, many other things, including drinking and smoking. And so we really focus on helping people to not be socially isolated through our various programs. Um, the need and the demand for program related support um, uh, continues to grow and uh, I'll share some stats in just a minute. Um, we have um, um, really ramped up on our programs coming out of COVID. Um, uh, people are, are re-engaging. Uh, um, we continue to offer virtual as well, as, you know, a hybrid model similar to, to today's council meeting. Uh, but we're seeing that in-person um, um, participation growing as people become more and more confident um, uh, with uh, the COVID related uh, uh, concerns. Um, our programs really assist with the overall feelings of wellness. Um, and that comes through physical activity, through interaction socially, uh, good nutrition, uh, creating a sense of welcome um, and, and, and a feeling of, belong of belonging and, and being cared for. Um, currently, the, uh, you can see the funding for programs, uh, Great Highlands uh, has been providing us at $50,000, Southgate at 25, and Melanchthon at about 5,000. And that's roughly proportionate when you look at the, the sort of the, uh, the percentage of the population that's served in our catchment area. Um, and as I said, we're good stewards of that money, we get good value. Um, I, I sort of just a back of the napkin calculation, um, the cost per program participant. So if I go to a program and participate in it, in it, and then do another one and another one, each one of those participations is roughly $5 and 40 cents. So that's really, really good value from that perspective. Next slide, please. 
And so this is just to give you a sense, this was to the end of, uh, of February. Uh, we're just uh, tallying up marches right now to get the full year picture. Uh, this gives you a view of the types of sessions that we provide, as well as the number of sessions, as well as the total participants. Um, and so we have a wide uh, array of programs uh, and, and this continues to develop and evolve uh, based on uh, input um, uh, feedback from community members uh, throughout our catchment area, um, as well as um, insights uh, provided by partner organizations. Uh, you don't need to be a client or a rostered patient of the CHC to participate in a program. Uh, anybody um, in our catchment area can participate. So that's one of the uh, messages that we continue to um, um, promote uh, through social media, through, through uh, uh, various programs um, uh, that uh, don't be afraid to come and sign up for a program uh, if you're, uh, if you're um, not a rostered patient. All community members are welcome. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to address uh, any questions. Uh, um, if you have any. Well, thank you, Alex. And uh, it's uh, just as a side, it's going to be great news when the new hospital opens up next door to you guys. And you know, it's almost walking distance, right? So uh, yeah. part of that uh, health hub. Yeah, I'll open the floor up. Is there, are there any questions? I know, uh, Councillor Allwood, you are a member of, of that board. I don't know if you have anything you wish to speak to first, and I'll go to others then as well. Not only am I a board member, but I'm also a uh, rostered patient of uh, <laughs> the Community Health Centre. And as uh, President Mann spoke, uh, my first introduction was uh, finding a primary care practitioner when I moved up, up here uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, um, for the first part of that journey, it was commuting back to Newmarket. But, uh, you know, that situation changed when my family doctor retired after 40 years of, uh, of a relationship. So I was able to uh, become a roster patient of the Community Health Center. I'm uh, Im impressed with the service provided, the uh, ancillary uh, services that, that are all in that uh, facility are, are wonderful. So not only do you get to see your nurse practitioner or, or doctor, but uh, you've got access to the other uh, ancillary uh, healthcare providers, and it's a wonderful facility. I can't say enough about it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for those comments. Others, uh, any other comments from council members? Councilor Dubik and then Councilor Allen. Uh, so, uh, so Alex, just thank you very much uh, for everything that you do, uh, your team does, and the center does. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, so, as we're heading into our strategy sessions. Um, over the coming months, um, you know, one of the things that's top of mind for me is, is growth in the area, um, including the pop, you know, the, our aging population, you know, our seniors, um, you know, people are moving up here, um, and also just the demographics, uh, the, the baby boomers bulge yeah. is, you know, coming up as well. Um, so just wondering when you're looking forward, um, yeah. you know, to the coming years, is there anything top of mind for you in terms of opportunities and challenges? Um, that you might want to share with us, you know, so that we can also maybe keep keep top of mind. Yes, absolutely, and and thank you for uh, for raising that. Um, we have recognized um, the that the demand for our services, both in terms of programs, which I've talked to, but as well as primary care, are under a lot of pressure as the, the population is changing um, and. Uh, that change, of course, you know, in the past, rural communities were either stable or slightly in decline, and we're seeing growth, uh, which is uh, very significant for us, and it is putting a lot of pressure on the system. We uh, developed a submission to uh, the Ministry of Health um, in May of 2021 uh, and requested uh, incremental funding of $1.4 million to add physicians, nurse practitioners, administrative support, and some additional operating dollars. Uh, to expand our practice and enable us to roster more patients uh, in response to that uh, change in population. Um, that request has wound its way through the system. Uh, it takes a long time and there is no pro forma approach for it. Uh, it was unsolicited and, and somewhat ad hoc where there's no template or to follow or anything like that. So we developed our own. Um, we just recently received um, approval, but not for the 1.4 million. We received approval for $252,000. And so we are uh, going to be adding one nurse practitioner and a little bit of administrative support um, over the next uh, several months, which will enable us to take in um, more clients, uh, but 
it's a drop in the bucket compared to what's happening both here as well as in Southgate. Um, and so we're anticipating or hoping, uh, that's probably a better word, hoping that um, there will be a call out from the ministry um, in light of discussions that have been happening between the federal government and provincial government on primary care, that the call out will be to existing health service provider organizations uh, to make a request for incremental funding uh, in response to these types of uh, uh, changes. And so we're ready to go, um, just waiting for a portal and a template to open up, which we understand is being developed. Um, but again, I don't have any sense of timing on that, nor any sense of timing from the, uh, from, the, um, from the ministry in terms of response. What I would encourage uh, council to do, uh, if you're so inclined, is to uh, make sure that in conversations with uh, our MPP, uh, as well as any uh, ministerial officials, uh, to remind them that uh, it, uh, housing is all well and good, but we need the underlying services to support it, and healthcare is absolutely vital uh, in our region, given our demographics. Uh, hopefully that's answered your question. Well, thanks for that comment. And uh, fortunately, our local MPP was a member. Of he was, yes. And, uh, I'm just thinking, is that something we need to take the next step that is a resolution from this council to help move that along to to seek more funding? And maybe that's something you could have conversation with our CAO as well. I, I, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I certainly will have a conversation with CAO. I think timing is very critical. If we right. do it too early, it'll get lost sort of in the in the flow of things. But as I get a better sense of 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 you know, when they're getting ready to receive requests, we'll certainly uh, approach um, uh, the municipality and uh, and uh, see what we can do in terms of arranging for support. Along to our with Southgate, West Gray and Chatsworth, we collectively, yep. you know, you know, look at a resolution to sort of, uh, you know, thank you very much for the, you know, the funding, but we have a growing pop, especially with Southgate. Exactly. Yeah. Right, you know, yeah. stuff like that. So good point yeah. raised. Thank you for that. Councilor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation. I have a, a comment and a, a question. The comment is that um, I sit on the Senior Advisory Committee yes. and Jeff and Jim of the uh, CHC yes. uh, attends. He's a non-voting member, but uh, he brings us information mainly to do with uh, uh, information that would be um, informative to seniors. So we really appreciate that. So, and at our last meeting, we talked about um, uh, discussion on primary health care shortages and physician recruitment. So this is going to be added to our next agenda, which is 17th, I believe. Um, I just wondered if if Jeff would would um, be able to speak about doctor recruitment. There's discussion about do we set up one locally uh, to take in the catchment areas of this hospital, but. Um, the CHC seems to be doing a pretty good job of recruiting. So do we leave it to, to, uh, to the CHC? So I wondered if anybody would be available to attend that uh, meeting. Yes, absolutely. I'll have a conversation with Jeff. And um, if, if necessary, I, I can uh, be available to attend that as well to address that specific question. The CHC is very fortunate. So, and, and again, primary care has been in the news a lot and we're all learning through the news media you know things about the different payment models and approaches to how doctors are are remunerated for their services and the challenges you know in, in you know young grads getting um, um you know spaces to practice um before they get licensed and so on um, we operate with it, as you can see in the package, a different model. It's a salary-based model, and that does a, appeal to a segment. Um, not all doctors are necessarily interested in that, but that salary-based model um, frees them of um, um, all of the, what I would call business for self aspects of running a medical practice. Uh, so we look after that as an organization, the doctors aren't burdened by it. Um, and we provide them with all of the necessary supports, you know, in terms of, you know, regulatory compliance, uh, clinical licensing requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and for what we found is for a segment of physicians that are really interested in not only a work-life balance, but also being able to spend the right amount of time with a patient. Um, and, what, and what I mean by that is that in our model, because it's salary-based, and again, in the presentation, we talked about SAMI score, the rosters assigned to um, each of the physicians, as well as the nurse practitioners, 
uh, is geared in such a way that they're able to spend more time because of the more complex medical needs. Um, and that's not necessarily the case in a family health team. And so the amount of time we spend 30 minutes per patient, we can book more time if necessary. They're not under the gun to bill OHIP uh, because we, we're, we're not associated with OHIP at all. Uh, we don't do any billing or funding through them. And so it's, 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 it's a different operating model and it does appeal to some. It, it may be appealing to more and more of the younger generation. I don't know, but anecdotally, I've, I've heard that's the case. And uh, so we've been, I don't wanna jinx it, I'll knock on wood, but uh, we have been very fortunate that we've not had challenges in, in physician recruitment. So anything I can do to help, I'll, I'll certainly- okay. uh, Thank certainly you. Do. So our next meeting is um, April 17th at 1.30. And is it, um, do the terms of reference allow senior advisory committee to bring in guests? I believe it does, okay. So maybe um, if that works, if you could perhaps set up with our deputy clerk. The, sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank absolutely. you very much. Thanks. Thank you for that, Councillor Allen. That's an interesting uh, concept that you're offering because uh, yeah, more and more we hear of uh, new doctors or maybe even nurse practitioners want a, a work-life balance and maybe work three days a week. Yeah. Maybe that works, that's the model because it's uh, the part of, of having that work-life balance and, you know, and that, the other thing is, uh, with our new growth, is, are you finding that you're able to get interest from people because there are opportunities to move here now and there's housing and stuff? Does that help? Is that helping in recruitment someone as well? Oh, I think it is. Um, I think there's a number of factors. Um, uh, it, um, the, in a sense, well, I would call it the exodus from the GTA, but certainly as the pandemic has caused a lot of people to examine their lifestyle. Uh, their financial position and so on. And, and, and we're seeing um, younger people applying from the GTA for roles here. Um, and we've had a couple of recent experiences where nurse practitioners have moved into the area from the GTA to join our organization. So it's, uh, um, I, hopefully it's not a, like a fad. Uh, hopefully it'll be sustainable over time, but uh, certainly we're seeing that, absolutely. I know Councillor Allward was on the doctor recruitment for the Southern Georgia Bay region, but we have a lot in our area to offer, like the recreation and a lot of the kidney yes. things that you can. So I always think you got the best of both worlds. Like we're, this is where it starts, right? Yeah. So, well, we all know that it's the best place to live, right? So that's it's right. just convincing others. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, it's just, yeah. And a lot of them are, are finding that out. I mean, yeah. uh, for sure. I think one fifth of our, our housing is seasonal residents just yeah. from that point, right? So. But uh, just last, any last uh, comments, questions? Well, thanks, Alex, uh, oh, for speaking. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, Councillor Dewey, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, just one last question. Um, so I believe at an event, myself and um, Councillor Allwood met with Larry. We were, I think we ran into you, and we're talking about maybe a possible tour. Um, an on-site tour would be really helpful for us. So wondering if that's... That's could be in the cards for a us. great segue for uh, my final comment. And I was going to sort of just say, can I, I got one more thing to mention. So uh, I will be sending you a written invitation, uh, but if you could maybe hold a little bit of time open on uh, June the 27th, uh, we're going to be, um, we've decided to have a, an open house community day with tours. Uh, we're tying that in with an employee appreciation event. Our uh, Councillor Allwood may not be aware of this yet, but it'll be on the agenda for this week, this month's board meeting, but we're going to be uh, having the board host uh, a little bit of a barbecue for our employees and, uh, and then conduct tours uh, throughout the afternoon as a, as a sort of a build up to our AGM uh, in the evening. So uh, it, mark June 27th, and uh, we'll certainly, as, uh, as we get a little bit closer to it, uh, send out written uh, invitations and encourage uh, as many people to come and see what we're all about. Uh, in the old school board building, which is starting to turn into a beautiful thing. <laughs> so, well, that's, that's great. Thanks for bringing that up, uh, Councilor Dubik. Councilor Wickens, did you have a comment, question? No, okay. Um, so, well, thanks for coming today. And I got one last question to Larry. How's pickleball going? Good. Can you speak with my Eight years, nine years. Right. Okay, you got to go to the mic because, uh, and I, I'm sorry I slipped it in, but I know pickleball is something that's been growing worldwide. Eight years. Well, it was eight years to nine years ago. We came and um, asked for some assistance from this council, not this council, the council at the time with an MOU so we could uh, establish pickleball within the area. 
We have over 120 participants now. I think we're coming up to 150 participants. We're running clinics on a regular basis. We have started with three time slots. We now are looking at uh, two a day over five days, adding another here or there. It is, uh, it's a moving target. It's going incredibly well. It's just growing exponentially. It's uh, as people find out about it and have a lot of fun. You're in, you're started off in the Osprey Community Center, but now I think you're in the Markdell Center. And we uh, started Osprey because we, it, it could facilitate two courts and it was tight, is tight. With COVID, we moved to um, Markdale tennis courts because we could be outside. And being outside um, allowed us to play. Uh, Lynn put, my wife put together a return to play that was approved by the health department, a very len lengthy document, and it allowed us to have 12 people on the court safely. And uh, we started, that's how we got to Markdale. And some people want to continue in Markdale. Some people want to go inside because it's air conditioned. It doesn't matter if it rains, but there's enough room for all. And I know Alex is going to talk about the numbers right now because we have them. Just uh, slightly over 160 uh, individual sessions with uh, about 1,440 participants. Wow. That's great news. So, so yes, it's, it's very successful. Thank you. Well, thanks for and thank that. you for your support. Continued support. Well, that's good. No, and I know that uh, you know we're always looking at new ways of using our facilities. We, you know, with the tax base, the tax base that supports them, and it's great to see that more and more use is happening. If if I could assure you of one thing, we, we can always find ways of using the facilities and be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they're tax based uh, support it, right? So it's important that uh, they are being used for sure. But uh, okay, well, thank you for that and uh, uh, all the best for all the great things you do. And we look forward to the invitation on the 27th. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Take care. Can I have a motion then from council to receive the delegation, please? Councillor uh, Allwood, second by Councillor Allen. Any further discussion there? Seeing none. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you for that. Sorry, I had to slip in the pickleball because I know that is something that's been growing and uh, it's good to hear an update on that. Oh, Councillor Allwood, you're playing now. I'm, I'm not playing yet, but uh, I, I was a racket player. My knees gave out. Pickleball probably suits me, but uh, I just wanted to mention it was invented in Seattle, Bainbridge Island, one of the many things that came out of Seattle, and it is the fastest growing sport in North America. Yeah, I heard it's uh, it's big in the south in, in the winter months and uh, certainly expanding throughout the uh, I guess everywhere. I guess it's uh, how big is your how big is your paddle? <laughs> how big is it? A little bigger than a racquetball paddle. Okay, so yeah, the ball's big too, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's no problem not hitting it. So that's good. All right. Well, thanks for that. Moving on our agenda then to uh, item seven point two, our second delegation today. So it's from uh, Fiddlehead Nursery and Ben Caesar. So welcome, Ben. Come on up to the podium. And just as uh, I know you have attached a video uh, from our clerk's part, we can't play it on this session because of copyright, but I, ha I have viewed it and I'm sure it was there for others to view as well and uh, interesting concept. So whenever you're ready, uh, you have 10 minutes, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Mayor, Cre Mayor Crean. Hi, I'm Ben Caesar from, I run Fiddlehead Nursery just north of Kimberley. And I've been a resident here since 2011 and work and live within sight of the former Talisman Ski Resort. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you today about the economic impacts of residential housing developments, not only in Beaver Valley, but throughout Grey Highlands. Uh, I've suggested that you watch uh, a 10 minute video, uh, which is on YouTube. It's called uh, Suburbia is Subsidized. Uh, this video was a bit of a revelation for me and provides an important economic analysis of the way munic municipalities make and lose money through planning decisions. <clears throat> Take a second there for a second. <laughs> yeah, no worries. There we go. And uh, yeah, so through planning decisions and infrastructure costs, and uh, it presents a compelling argument for the reasons that some municipalities are struggling financially because of decisions made about how to develop and grow. So before the, watching this video and doing the research for this presentation, I had assumed that a housing development would provide a net gain in perpetuity for the municipal budget. 
If you build more houses, you'll have a larger tax base and the municipality will be healthier from a financial standpoint. What's wrong with this picture? It turns out that over the long haul, any place that contains houses and only houses is a financial burden on a municipality. The video provides an example in the mid-sized American city of Lafayette in Louisiana. Uh, this city is full of aging infrastructure in need of repair, but the city itself is broke. So the city, the, the council of the city hired a consulting company called Urban3, which helps municipalities better understand the economic impacts of development. And what it uncovered in Lafayette should be a wake up call to municipalities everywhere. Urban3 figured out the return on investment or ROI for the city. To know your ROA, you need to know two things, your revenue and your expenses. So Urban3 painstakingly analyzed the revenue and expenses for each individual acre of land and the surrounding areas in the city. They then calculated the cost of services for each parcel of land in Lafayette. The results of their, their analysis are illuminating. The first is that the downtown is wildly profitable, even though the downtown doesn't look like much. It turns out that downtowns in general are the economic engines of municipalities. The second is that car-centric suburbs are a drain on city finances. Every property in a municipality needs services, and these services get more expensive the more spread out they are. Roads are the obvious example. The further a development is from everything else, the more asphalt is needed to get there. The more expensive, the most expensive type of road to maintain is a cul-de-sac, which is essentially a municipally subsidized driveway. This also applies to water, sewer, and all other physical infrastructure, as well as the cost of extra policing, fire and ambulance services, and the cost of providing education and healthcare. These results are typical for most, most, American, most North American municipalities. Urban3 has done similar analyses for hundreds of cities and municipalities in the United States and Canada. And mixed use walkable neighborhoods outperform car dependent suburbia every single time. Another way of looking at this is to say that low density car dependent suburban housing developments are being subsidized by every other kind of development. Urban 3's analysis of cities found that any place that is zoned single family residential is always a net negative to city finances. In every case, in every region Urban 3 has analyzed, traditional mixed use neighborhoods dramatically outperform car centric suburbia. But in much of North America, we've made it difficult to build new mixed use neighborhoods because of modern zoning. So how can we encourage growth that will provide a healthy tax base for the municipality rather than draining our budget? We can encourage infill development within existing downtowns, as well as new mixed use walkable neighborhoods. Urban3 also analyzed the ROI for Guelph, which provides a positive example for the kind of growth that enhances a city's finances. Guelph in 2013 needed more room and was considering expanding its borders with sprawl style developments. But after analysis, uh, chose instead to make it easier and cheaper for developers to build infill developments or buildings that encourage walkable mixed use neighborhoods. When you look at Guelph's finances from 2013 to 2019, it's clear that the city has developed in such a way as to create more wealth for itself. This is why what we clearly need to do in Grey Highlands. So why isn't this commonly understood? It's mainly because this financial burden doesn't happen right away. The tax revenue from a housing development initially does provide a boost to municipal coffers, but a development is only financially solvent if it can pay for the replacement cost of its own infrastructure. So over time, car dependent suburbs have been shown again and again to fall far short of this requirement. So the only way municipalities can pay for suburbs over time is to approve new suburbs that pay for the maintenance of older ones. This is exactly how a Ponzi scheme works. There's never enough money to pay for aging infrastructure. So you're forced to approve new sprawling subdivisions. It locks you into a cycle of never ending growth where the only real winners are the developers. This is what happened in Mississauga, which prided itself on keeping its taxes low for decades while it sprawled but has since had some of the largest tax increases in Ontario to keep up with the aging infrastructure repairs. I wanna make clear that this is not just coming from a single source. More and more municipalities are analyzing the revenue streams from different kinds of developments and coming to the same conclusions. 
that suburbia is a net drain on municipal coffers, while infill developments within existing built up areas are money makers. Just last week, an article by Oliver Moore in the Globe and Mail confirmed the notion. Uh, this is a quote from that article. An increasing body of research shows that building low density communities creates a permanent financial headache for municipalities. Fewer people pay taxes for civic services that cost more per capita to provide. Looking at both revenues and costs, consultants working for the city of Ottawa found that homes added within built up areas paid for themselves while suburban homes were a net liability. So let's see how this information would apply to the former Talisman ski resort lands. In the best case scenario, the developer would pay the full cost of bringing the roads, bridges, water and sewer systems up to the standards required for a new subdivision. The houses built would be sold and those owners would start paying municipal property taxes. So far, so good. But eventually, all infrastructure needs repairs and eventual replacement. These are the costs that will overburden future councils and taxpayers. It's become clear that everywhere that is zoned for housing and nothing but housing will eventually become a financial liability. And those subdivisions that are furthest from schools, hospitals, emergency services, and other municipal services cost the most to maintain. So it turns out that the worst place you could possibly put a housing subdivision from a purely, purely, purely financial perspective is on the former Talisman lands, which are at least 15 minutes away from any major town. The bridges on side road 7A alone would require a huge amount of ongoing investment and maintenance. The development company that owns this land will ask you to rezone it as a residential area. And I'm here to ask you not to do so. If sprawl style residential areas are an example of a Ponzi scheme, who's the one winning here? It's quite obviously the developers who bought the land for a song and they'll make hefty profits and leave Grey Highlands with a couple of subdivisions that will become permanent financial liabilities in 20 years. You as councillors are the managers of our communal wealth. You approved a 6.1% tax increase this year and last year it was 6.6%. These are substantial increases and I know it's not easy to keep these increases as low as they are. I run a business, so I know how hard it is to maintain financial viability. The way that growth is managed will affect the ability of the municipality to provide services to the people of this area and to keep taxes at a reasonable rate. The key argument here is that it is the distance from any development from other services, such as schools, hospitals, grocery stores, shops, etc., that determines the economic benefit to the municipality over time. By approving single family residential areas built far from larger towns, you would be destroying our collective wealth. The former Talisman lands are also on some very sensitive land. The Beaver Valley is a biodiversity hotspot. If you were to look at this development through a climate change lens, you'd have to agree that any type of housing development which requires residents to get into a car and drive 15 minutes to get anywhere would be environmentally irresponsible. So please take this into account when deciding whether or not to approve the development on the former Talisman lands. While you might assume that a project like this is part of economic growth, this would in fact be a long-term economic burden. As a businessman and a taxpayer, I'm asking you to reconsider what eco economic development really looks like. Thanks very much for your time. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I don't know if there's any questions uh, for clarity or comments from, from uh, council members, but uh, no, no. Council, go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor McLean, and uh, thank you, Ben, for that presentation. I'd say that this was a really enlightening video. It's something that um, we don't uh, we don't hear talked about very often, and um, the data was quite clear um, and very well presented. It's difficult to get your head around these sort of complex problems, um, but I really appreciated the the insights here, uh, and clearly, this is something that's pertinent to Grey Highlands, not, you know, in, in particular right now, as well as North America in, in general. Um, so I, I, yeah, again, really appreciate you bringing this information forward to council. Um, certainly lots of food for thought. And I think that we need to keep this kind of approach in mind as we decide how it is we want to develop this municipality. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we are going to be looking at uh, reviewing our zoning bylaws. So sometimes changes for density and height and all that stuff have to change in order to increase density. So that's something we were, we'll be going through a process and getting public input on that zoning bylaw as well. So there are opportunities there as well. Councillor Dubé. Um, so thank you, Mr. Mayor, it was through you. So Ben, thank you for, um, for the presentation. Um, you know, I think, you know, 
during the election, you know, we, there has been a lot of discussion about smart growth, um, about strong towns. Um, and I think, um, you know, those principles of, you know, those models are in line to um, the uh, the video that you provided to us and to um, to what you've presented here. Um, I think the the power of the video uh, was showing um, the data in a, in, a, in a visual manner, right? To, to clearly understand um, and to you know to support um, the principles of of, of um, smart growth, you know, about walkable walkable cities uh, that are in mixed use, sort of that traditional you know um, approach is typically uh, more profitable at the end of the day. And, you know, with that, and it supports the triple bottom line of people, um, planet and profitability. Um, I thought what was interesting as well, um, my takeaway from the video was Guelph. I thought Guelph was um, sort of a good example of, um, of what they have done and how they have grown, you know, their, their town. Um, I'm just gonna go out on a bit of a limb here. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I know I've, I, I've, you know, people always do remind me and I always um, like to remind myself of, you know, it's always, it's always good to reach out to those how, who have done something before you um, to gain best practices or get some tips and um, et cetera. And wondering, I'm just gonna sort of put it out here, um, you know, if it might be worthwhile to reach out to a community like Guelph or maybe a, a different community um, and bring them into council, maybe to a, you know, a committee of the whole, so that, you know, maybe we do have an opportunity to share um, learnings. Um, you know, we are, Grey, Grey Highlands is sort of in this cusp of growth. Um, and it's, it's always, I think, always great to have those conversations about um, finding learnings from others. Um, so I'm not, you know, so I'm, I'm just going to put it out there. Um, you know, maybe it's, it's a possibility to, um, you know, to, to, to partner with another, you know, kind of community just to, to gain those learnings um, and, and just to maybe, you know, approach and see a community that might be open to sharing their learnings so like it's something that could come through either now or through a notice motion later or whatever i know the county has used a number of university students for their planning side of, of things as well right yeah and 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 i think it's always you know because i think you know we want to i think we all want to ensure you know that we develop gray highlands you know, to its its best potential um, and there's, you know, there are, you know, there are certain complexities about, you know, growing, mm -hmm. um, you know, a community. And um, I think the better prepared we are by just, you know, gaining learnings from others who have just, um, who have gone through it might be beneficial to us. I, I totally agree with you. I think uh, the mayor in Guelph at the time, I was living in Guelph at the time, actually, and it was Mayor Karen Farbridge and uh, she was really smart. And I think she'd be a, a wonderful one to reach out to and see if she could talk to us about how those decisions were made. It's not easy, you know, to, to manage growth. I mean, wherever you put growth, there's going to be people upset with, with the styles of growth. I mean, you can easily throw a nimbyism, you know, accusations of nimbyism around and saying like, I live within sight of talisman. I have a personal stake in this, but, uh, and, you know, another way of, framing nimbyism is that you care about the community and you care you know what happens so so it's it's not easy to sell the idea of infill developments either the people living in markdale or flesherton are you know are going to be somewhat resistant to the ideas of of taller buildings and and mixed use neighborhoods but um but these can be done in such a way that is you know re respectful to the, the the scale of the town i think scale is a huge um question is like how how do you grow well and and not make it overwhelming and not kind of ruin the the sort of the, the feeling of it of a of a place so yeah these are and i think that, that. and the timing i think is great you know given the fact that we are reviewing our zoning so it's so it's like another input you know for us um you know to maybe gain learnings from others 
well, zoning, but then it, all, then it goes back to your official plan as yeah, well. Official what, plan, what, yeah. what which is next. Well. Right, but it, it's almost official plan needs to be looked at as well before you, because yeah. it allows you what to do and the zoning tells you what you can do on those areas, right? So, yeah. and that sort of thing. But uh, density, that's one thing with Guelph and I watched it is they went out instead of going out, they went out. So, yeah. you know, the part about buildings and you're, you're absolutely right, there's, you know, keep it the way it is. Don't go up. Don't, you know, it's going to shadow my property or whatever. You see that more in Toronto and stuff like that. Right. And yeah, you know, and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's finding that balance. Right. I know we, uh, Councilor Dubik and Councilor Head and myself, we attended the Southern Georgian Bay Institute for Stability, Sustainability. And part of the issue there is, is stability for housing and for young people and, and affordable housing. And, you know, there's all that aspect of it as well. And we've seen how that's all gone, you know, through the roof and how can, you know, seniors and young people, anybody to forward housing at the way it's gone too. Right. And it's, it's trying to find that right spot as well. So there's a lot of dynamics that are on that are in, in immigration. Like I think they're looking at targets now of a half a million people coming to Canada or more. So you have that, that pressure as well. You know, probably big part of the, big part of that is, is the large cities or you know the gta but then they maybe they exchange people coming from the gta allowing that space they come here right there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics that change without uh, throughout uh, and there's also the planning act in ontario and a lot of that sort of is is sort of the what do you want to call it the legwork or the um the uh, foundation of our planning process so that maybe has also at the provincial level has to have some because then there's also the, the appealable part and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of dynamics that need to come in play. Obviously, Guelph, hit, you know, did it on their own and changed some ideas there as well. So, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of there are a lot of places that are doing it well and right. and doing it in such a way that maintains the financial viability of the municipality. And with our downtown revitalization moving forward and all that kind of stuff, uh, density is is something and supporting businesses and people and workable and walkable towns and you talk about it as well, right? So a lot of dynamics for sure. Any other questions, comments? So, so Councillor Dubik, is that something more through a notice of motion and, or do you want to add it? So I'm looking to receive the delegation and I don't know if there's any action coming. Usually if there's a, actually a report to come back from staff, but yeah. Councillor Dubik. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, so I'll leave that as a notice of motion um, and then yeah. we'll just maybe just uh, in terms of the motion for uh, this um, presentation, we'll just receive the information. Should we be moving that then? I'll, I'll move that. Okay, do I have a seconder? Councilor Lohead. Any further discussion on that? Thanks for sending the video. Seeing there's no comments. Uh, all in favor? That is carried. So thanks for educating us today and uh, and interesting uh, concept for sure. Thanks very much. Right. I like the spears, the spears going down. And <laughs> First, it looks like tall buildings, but it's just the, the financial part of it, right? So I'm going to suggest we take a break. Uh, to 1115, that gives everybody a chance to uh, move around, stretch your legs and do what they have to do. And uh, so we'll come back at 1115.
All right, we'll call this uh, council meeting back to order. It's uh, uh, 11 16, and we'll start off uh, with our agenda at, at item eight on our agenda. And so from that, we have the uh, minutes of uh, the police services board, and I'm going to pass it over to uh, Chair Lowhead to deal with the items under that uh, area of eight. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. So uh, 8.1, we have a recommendation that council receive the 2023-03-28 Police Service Board unapproved meeting minutes for information. Uh, can I get a mover seconder for that? And Councillor Dubik and Councillor Wickens. Uh, any discussion on that item? All in favor? Okay, that passes. And 8.2, a recommendation that council receive staff report CLS uh, 2227 draft public nuisance bylaw and that council direct staff to bring forward a public nuisance bylaw for consideration at an upcoming council meeting. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Councillor Allen and Councillor Dubik uh, in discussion on 8.2. Mayor McQueen. Thank you, Chair uh, Lohead. And just uh, this came up through the uh, police services uh, board meeting and it came to council, I forget the date, and it was referred back to the police services board to make comments. So they supported moving it forward. Two comments. Um, so this is um, sort of uh, making more depth to our, our nuisance or, or, or with regards to our bylaw enforcement. I, I, I'm asking uh, two questions, one, could we take this to a, a public um, forum to get some feedback on the part of creating a nuisance bylaw? And then also in the fee schedule, I don't see it here, and it was attached to the police services board, it talks about the fees at, of $300. And I wondered if that could be reduced to $100 to see how, I, I, I think of um, looking back, I'll leave my second comment first. I just wonder, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with the first one first, uh, Chair. Okay. Okay. So is there a recommendation there in that comment? Well, I just wonder if there's a, what, if there's a process, I would, I sort of wonder if it would be, uh, I guess the process, I know through a public uh, process with our planning, we go to, a, we go to the uh, fourth Monday of the month and we have a public with regards to public files. Uh, I guess the other option, and I guess I'd love through you to maybe to um, our Madam Clerk of, of opportunities or processes, and I guess you could always have a, a section of a, of a council meeting where you could have a public um, section as well, that you mm -hmm. just go to the public and get that. So I, I look through you to maybe get some options maybe from our, our clerk. Okay, thank you, Mary McQueen. Is there any discussion on that comment? Uh, thank you, I'm open to council direction, whatever form. Okay. Yep. So I would like to move an amendment to the motion. I, I, shut, I was good. I shut it off. Um, <laughs> I'd like to move an amendment that, that we uh, could take this bylaw um, to a public forum to get feedback. Um, I'm not opposed to it. I understand that, you know, it's tools in the toolbox, but I just think it would be good that it's something, it's a newer direction for us. And I think it would be something that we, I think it, to be fair, I think it's something we should get feedback on on that and if it could include the fee structure so of, of the fines to get feedback on that as well i think that would be beneficial so you're moving that amendment yes it's okay can i get a seconder uh, councillor Allwood, any discussion on this amendment all in favor and that carries unanimously okay and that's it sorry chair Yep, sorry, I missed you there. I forgot that you're, you've been so quiet. This is your first time speaking this entire meeting. That's Go ahead, it. Deputy Mayor. All right, sorry. Chair Lohead. I just had a, a question. Just um, the motion just said go for community feedback. Correct. Just wanted yeah. clarity on what the motion was just asking. So, um, did we want to give more specific direction? Do we want a survey? given it to the public, or is this an item that we're hoping to have added to our next or our first town hall meeting that we're hoping to plan? Yeah, this, I mean, this is, 
Yeah, go ahead, uh, <laughs> Marlene. Uh, thank you. So um, based on uh, Mayor McQueen's comments when he was making his motion, the wording that I put was that the main motion be amended to include after public consultation at a public meeting at the end of the last clause. So um, because he had mentioned that he would like to have something kind of like what the zoning does, we would uh, schedule some kind of public consultation where it's open for the public to speak much like the um, public meeting. Okay, thank you, Clerk Martel. Does that answer your question, Deputy Mayor? That does. Thank you very much. Okay. So the main, oh, sorry, Mayor McQueen. So the, it's too bad the deputy mayor didn't raise this before we voted on it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm back not back opposed to getting all kinds of feedback. The part is, is getting feedback, right? right? And, and I think about the public, and I guess that's more of my, what I'm used to going through, but certainly, you know, getting as the deputy mayor suggested, I mean, the idea is getting feedback. You know, this is at a, a pivotal point of, of moving forward with more enforcement. Um, I'm I'm not opposed to all sources of feedback. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not. Uh, so maybe there needs to be another amendment. Is that? Uh, through you, um, if we were to go forward with the public uh, consultation at a public meeting, there would be notice out and that on that notice, it would also give uh, where email comments on the draft would go. Um, this draft bylaw has actually been on our website in draft form um, for public consultation for over a year and a half with no comments received, um, but there was no push out um, while we were waiting for the police services board to have their comments come through. Thank you, Clerk Martel. Okay, so that's passed and we look forward to getting feedback from the public. Main motion is amended. Thank you very much, Clerk Martel. And one more comment from Mayor McQueen. Sorry. Uh, uh, Sure, we'll hit. Another thought I, I had, and this will go back to feedback that we, you know, move forward if this is moves forward in the sense of uh, being supported, is the question I have, is this a more of an urban type bylaw versus a rural type bylaw? And the only reason I know it came from, I think, King Carden, I think it was King Carden, am I wrong? I think it was King Carden. And probably, I know King Carden has a, a beach area and, you know, there's, there's maybe more public interaction. So I wonder, is this like as much to a rural type of bylaw or is this more to an urban setting type bylaw where you get people in more density and they're, you know, yelling at each other. Or, you know what I mean? I, sure. I just, I just throw that out there. Is that something that, and, and we can leave that to get comments back, but it's just a thought I had is, is, you know, uh, King Carden does have a, a rural and an urban <clears throat> setting. And, and I know, um, uh, Sabo Beach and, and South Bruce Peninsula have had issues around, you know, certain things that are sort of spoke to, sp spoken to in this bylaw as well, and probably Wasaga Beach and other areas that have, you know, in an infusion of, of summer population and, and different things like that. Not saying that it doesn't happen without that, but I just wondered if that's, I know um, Inspector, um, i trying to think of the OPP, uh, Richardson. Richardson had spoken that it originally came from uh, King Garden, and I think they were having some challenges with certain things in their bylaw enforcement. So anyway, just food for thought at this time. Uh, sure. <coughs> just some thoughts. I, sorry, and I, I guess I, if I can comment to that, then if you do go through the bylaw, <clears throat> all of the, the sorts of prohibitions that are listed, although they would be, you know, um, uh, effective in an area like King Carden um, or any urban area, they're also, each one of them could reasonably apply it, be applied to anywhere in, in Grey Highlands, things, you know, like public drinking or graffiti or loitering or, you know, illegal camping, et cetera, all uh, sorts of nuisances that we might experience here as well. So just throwing that out there. Okay, so should I pass the chair directly to Councillor Wickens then? So, but uh, we did, we need, oh, I thought it was voted. Sorry, my mistake. So we need a vote uh, as the, on the main motion as amended. Then, so all in favor, and that carries unanimously. There we go. Okay, thank you for uh, taking care of those two items, uh, Chair Lowhead, and uh, moving on into uh, our section nine, uh, transportation, and uh, there's a number of uh, of uh, reports there. So I'll pass this over to Chair Wickens. Thank you, Mary McQueen, and good morning, all. Uh, so we're moving on to item 9.1. It's the award of RFT F18 2023-03, one new tandem truck with combination dump, spreader body, and snowplow harness. So we uh, had a tender out 
and uh, there was a truck sitting in the queue that was uh, met our specs and uh, there was only the one tender and uh, I wrote it down here somewhere it's from Lewis's and uh, so I don't know if, it, if you want to ask any questions or any comments about this Yes, Mayor McQueen. Thank you, Chair Wiggins. And uh, I see that there's a seven year extended warranty um, for, uh, I think it's a reasonable price, 400 kilometers on the engine. I know a few years back we had a particular truck, the engine went, we didn't get warranty on that. And I would presume this would cover that uh, through you to the director. It was uh, one of our fleet and I think they had a bit of an issue with design. I'm not gonna speak anymore, but this would 400, thousand kilometers is, is probably something i'm not sure what our life expectancy for kilometers on our our, our snow plows but i would think that seems reasonable and, and protects us so through you mr chair yeah so i guess i i probably should have had put this on the floor uh the council received staff report tps 2305 and the council support awarding rft f18 2023-03, one new tandem truck with combination dump, spreader body, and snowplow harness to Lewis Motor Sales, Inc. in the amount of $379,083.90, excluding HST, and that council support the purchase of extended engine and after treatment warranty for $9,200, excluding HST, and that council authorize funding any variance following the sale of the surplus truck from the transportation reviews. So could I have somebody, uh, Ms. Dubik and a seconder, Councillor Lowhead. Any other questions or? So, so I just wonder for that question I was raising for the warranty if I could get a response from our director. To you. All right, uh, Director Cornfield. Through you Councillor Wickens to Mayor McQueen. Um, obviously warranty is something that um, for us as staff, the aftermarket is a very, very important one. Um, it's something that um, can be very, very costly. So it's important. The um, engine warranty there is for major components. So obviously 400,000, I, I do believe it is a very valued warranty package overall. Thank you, Director Cornfield. Um, any other? Yes, Councillor Dubik. Uh, thank you. So just a quick question. What's the expected life, life expect expectancy of the, of the vehicle? Through you, Councillor Wickens to uh, Councillor Dubik. Um, you caught me off guard. I believe it is uh, 10 years, but it might be 12. Um, but I can get that information back to you. Uh, I apologize. I don't have it in the top of my head. Due to global warming, the snowplow trucks won't be needed after next year, so it may have a 25-year lifespan. Anyways, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> no, uh, just a little joke. Uh, any other questions or comments on that? No? All right, then uh, we'd uh, take a vote. Uh, all those in favor of awarding this? Uh, uh, opposed? None, seeing that, carried. So on to 9.2, the West Back Line Road Improvement. Uh, the design update is 60% uh, complete. And the motion here is that council receives staff report TPS 2307 and that the council support option one West back line culvert replacement and that council support Burnside engineering to finalize the design for the culvert replacement. So Chris and I talked about this and the, uh, the culvert replacement will be put in in such a way um, right now realignment of the road is as Burnside was, it's, it's very cost prohibitive at the at the moment but the culvert would be put in in such a way that if we do decide in the future 
uh, it's going to be long enough that uh, the realignment to straightening of the road, I guess, more or less, um, it will be able to do that. Um, all, there will be a, a speed restriction likely placed on that. Um, did you find out, Chris? There is no, uh, no, there's, it's 80 right now, isn't it? Probably the engineering will um, ask for a, for a speed restriction uh, there. And uh, let's see what else. So the cost for the pipe replacement right now uh, is 425,000. And uh, that's, uh, uh, if they were to do the road realignment as well, it's about 1.2 million. So they're saying uh, for the traffic that's on the road right now, just replace the culvert. But then that begs the question too for uh, an emergency uh, detour route around Highway 10. Uh, Chris and I talked about this too, and uh, there really isn't a good way if Highway 10 gets closed down. So that's something that council needs to look at in the future as well. Um, anyways, uh, I guess uh, we have uh, a mover to get this on the floor. Yes, Councillor Allwood and a seconder, Mayor McQueen. But so uh, we, uh, Council support this, and uh, I guess we'd have a, a vote on that. All those in favor? Oh, sorry, Mayor McQueen. Thank you, Chair Wickens, and uh, thanks for the report to you, the director, and uh, certainly support the culvert replacement to, for that. That wouldn't uh, preclude that if we were to rebuild the road, the culvert is one step toward that next step. Uh, absolutely, as an alternate to Highway 10 close, I know we talked about this, gosh, Chris, I think six or seven years ago, you know, and when there was a situation where the road was closed and we were getting increased pressure on the west back line or even east back line, depending on how they're rerouting traffic. And so I, I, I certainly, uh, two questions is uh, support it coming back in a, in, through the budget process. And, and it could be something that we could budget over two or three years or I mind you the price keeps going up every time you wait but I, I would think that we should at least have it on the books but the, the main question is if if we get to the design stage which it sort of says in option one if there were ever hypothetically saying funding or grant opportunities it would be at that level that we could go out because it's engine it's we have the engineering already done so I'll throw you to the to the director Uh, Councillor uh, Wickens and to Mayor McQueen, um, the um, EDR is something that's on everybody's radar, um, especially since the increased traffic on Highway 10. Um, it's something that um, I would recommend back to Council if you have any opportunities through um, your uh, AMOs or uh, um, good roads that you have those conversations to start planting the seed because I'm not really sure that the municipality should bear all the costs for a, an EDR for a, a provincial highway. Um, the other part of this decision from Burnside's recommendations from Burnside's and from staff supporting it, um, there's also, you know, where's the connections? So does the, uh, for the section of Westback line, if it ever became an EDR, does it go right to Dundalk? Does it stop at Proton? There's other issues, uh, the uh, alignment of the bridge at
seems like I'm the only one with internet still going. We're getting some people back on here now. How are we still working some questions? Today? I'm still here, Deputy Mayor. There you go, <laughs> Chief Wellwood. <laughs> me too. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you now, really. Okay. We are still streaming live. Trying to entertain the public while we get through this power search. We're back to our council meeting. We had a, a brief interruption, uh, Hydro uh, Outage, and uh, we're back up. I think we lost about five minutes there. So going back to uh, was Chair uh, Wickens looking after our second report under 9.2, and uh, Director Cornfield was uh, explaining uh, the process of the design. Through Councillor Wickens to uh, Mayor McQueen. So just to finalize on the... Um, the possibility of the EDR, um, it would be, you know, a decision that we would have to work with MTO as well, um, either on funding opportunities and or design and uh, what those access points would be because um, it's quite a distance between Proton Station and uh, Flesherton and again from Flesherton to Markdale. Um, but we have, as you had indicated, have seen times that unfortunately, um, because of a very serious accidents, that's the highway's been closed for an, an extended periods of times. Thank you, Director Cornfield. Yes, uh, Mayor McQueen. Just to follow up, uh, I will bring a separate motion after this motion is dealt with regards to maybe setting up a delegation with the MTO at AMO in August and maybe having conversations with Southgate as well, because if that's looked upon as a continuation into Southgate, then I think we need those conversations as well. But I'll bring that in a separate motion. Thank you. Any other questions, concerns, comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Yes, now Mayor McQueen. Yeah, so I'd like to bring a, a subsequent motion to item 9.2 that uh, with regards to the design of the Westback line that we delegate to the MTO in August at AMO with regards to our uh, conversations about a parallel road with Highway 10 and is there an opportunity for funding or, or partnering on a design or, or not design, but in funding in the sense of, of, of uh, upgrading the uh, Westback line. And, and secondly, uh, that our direct our staff to have conversations with our neighboring municipality of Southgate to uh, have a conversation on the sense of the continuation of the Westback line into Southgate and their Make, too many words in there maybe but just having a conversation about future development of the west back line if that makes it simpler thank you mayor mcqueen councillor nielsen he's seconding it i will second mayor mcqueen's motion okay i'll just wait uh, for uh Clerk Martell to uh, get this finalized and I'd have her read it back for clarity and then we can vote on the motion. Through you, Chair Wickens, uh, to Council. The Council directs staff to request a delegation with MTO at the AMO conference in August regarding a parallel road for Highway 10, and that staff be directed to have discussions with neighboring municipalities regarding the extension of Westback Line into Southgate. Any questions, comments? All those in favor? It's Kerry. Okay, uh, item 9.3 is the uh, Reeds Hill update. Uh, 
that council receive staff report TPS 2306 and that council authorize RJ Burnside's to finalize the engineering drawings and that council authorize issuing the tender for the Reeds Hill intersection improvements. Can I have a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor Allen, Councillor Dubik. So the uh, the design is, is, as you can see, is 90% is done. Um, it's just, it's more or less ready to go to tender. Um, any questions? Mayor McQueen. Thank you, Chair uh, Wickens. Um, thank you for um, recognizing me. And I just wondered to the Director of Transportation, I understand you had a site visit a week ago. I just wondered how mm -hmm. how that went and uh, everything as, as far as state, you're staying within the road allowance and uh, there's gonna be quite a cut there right, looking at the plan. So I, I know that there were some issues raised and I just wondered if there's mm -hmm. any comments from the Director. Yeah, and I, I might add too that uh, Matt uh, from Burnside is available if anybody has any questions for him about this. Yes. Through, through Chair uh, uh, Wickens to Mayor McQueen. Um, yes, we had a, a, an on-site meeting with, uh, with our consultants, Burnside, myself and our manager of infrastructure. Um, they had reached out and basically um, we're wondering about the overall project and how it would affect their adjacent properties. Um, they also had some concerns of um, the uh, availability through the construction period to access their properties. Um, we are uh, basically through those uh, meeting on site, uh, we've have agreed that we will work with them, keep them in the loop as the process by process. Once the tender is awarded, um, we will, or um, in the drafting of the tender, we can kind of hopefully restrict some of the timelines that might fit within the umbrella of the property use of uh, the individual. They're, they're hosting a wedding <laughs> and they would like to have not to have a whole lot of construction on, which is, is a reasonable request. And hopefully we can meet those, uh, those timelines through the tendering process. Um, they've also asked for some feedback on and kept in the loop about the rehabilitation of the excavation through the, um, uh, of the hill and uh, the fill area. So we have had some correspondence again since our, our last site meeting. Um, I think at this point, everybody's satisfied to move forward of, of, from my perspective anyways at staff. And um, it's uh, a promise and a commitment the staff have made that we will continue to keep them in the loop. And we're, if they have any questions as going through the project, they're always available to reach out to us and we're available to for comment. Thank you, Director Cornfield. Any other questions? Okay, then all in favor? That's carried. And lastly, on my docket here, it is uh, item 9.4. It's the award of tender RFT F18 2023-04 Wyville Bridge Replacement. That council receives staff report TPS 2308 and that council support awarding RFT F18 2304 Wyville Bridge Replacement to 2274084 Ontario Limited, owned and operated by GMP Contracting in the amount of $1,037,414.71, excluding HST. Can I have a mover and a seconder? This. Councillor Lowhead. Councillor Dubik, second. So we had questions uh, about the uh, the bridge, uh, the BCI bridge condition index, and uh, I don't know if any of you looked at the pictures of the underside of the bridge with the the re rod is it's uh, it's starting to show its age. Um, don't know if anybody 
Uh, is there any questions or uh, we have the uh, Matt is Matt's not here for this. This is this is a different uh, right. Sorry, this is blue. Yeah, sorry, blue plan. So okay. Um, any questions or anything for Chris or myself? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of awarding the tender? All those opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. And that's my business for the day. I pass the chair back to uh, Mayor McQueen. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wickens, and uh, we'll still get input from you yet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, moving on then to item uh, 10, uh, section 10, that's uh, chaired by myself. So I'll continue on then. So we have the uh, multi-municipal uh, wind turbine working group and uh, there's the uh, minutes. Uh, the municipality of Greyhounds approved the update terms of reference with re uh, revised March, 2023 for the newly named multi-municipal uh, energy working group and at the annual fee of uh, $400 for maintaining uh, membership. And uh, do I have a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor Allwood, do I have a seconder? Councillor Wickens. Uh, uh, Councillor Allwood, I know you are the chair of that committee and I don't know if you have anything else to add, but. Uh... Uh, thank you, Worship, through you to council and staff. Uh, yes, basically the, um, <laughs> The new RFP from the IESO requires that uh, energy be available uh, on demand and for a minimum of four hours. So wind turbines and uh, solar uh, would need some sort of storage. So the, uh, the there, there are some issues surrounding battery uh, energy storage systems that are uh, fall under the, uh, into, into the same sort of um, concerns that the wind turbine working group had. So uh, it was decided uh, that the terms of reference be changed to incorporate this new technology because that's the way the world is going. There's actually a facility proposed for Chesley and some real concerns uh, surrounding those. Uh, and then at our March uh, 9th meeting, those issues uh, were discussed and there was reports on uh, um, some of the issues that have to do with fire safety and uh, um, there, there was an example given of a uh, fire at a facility in Australia in August of 2021 <coughs> that took 150 firefighters three days to get under control. So, uh, you know, I think we heard our, our own fire chief talk about the issues with lithium battery fires in electric vehicles and some of the issues so you can imagine uh in container sized uh battery energy systems storage systems rather that there there are concerns and training for our first responders on and setbacks so the uh the problem is that they're not regulated right now under the uh, renewable energy act and uh though i'll be speaking more to that one when, when the minutes of our uh, march the 9th uh, meeting comes before council, but basically the terms of reference were were changed to uh, uh, bring in to um, effect the uh, battery energy storage systems, and again work on best practices and uh, mutual concerns for our member municipalities. So I would uh, hope that we would. Uh, and these are all sent back to member municipalities for uh, approval by council. So that's why they're here today. Thank you. Comments? <laughs> Any other comments, questions? I know that uh, looking at the financial statement, uh, 2021 was blank, but I'm thinking we had a holiday that year, did we not, as far as fees? Is that right? Right. Uh, thank you, Worship, through you to council. Yes, we uh, waived the fees that year because of uh, it was a COVID related thing and we were in the process of setting up the uh, virtual meetings. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, any other comments, questions? The motion has been moved and second and read out. Seeing no other comments, all in favor? That is carried. There are minutes coming up later in the consent agenda on that. Uh, then moving on to the uh, accessibility plan with regards to the AODA. 
the council receives report HR 2303 AOD multi-year accessibility, accessibility plan 2023 to 2027 and that council approved the AODA uh, multi-year accessible plan 2023 to 2027. Would somebody care to put that on the floor? Councilor Dubik, somebody second that? Uh, oh, sorry, Deputy Mayor, I got to keep looking, keep my heads up. So Deputy Mayor seconding at that. The report's there. I know uh, Manager Yip is here today and I don't know if you have anything you wish to bring, but uh, the floor is yours if you wish to uh, add to the report. Uh, through the chair and Mayor uh, McQueen, uh, I think the report is really self-explanatory, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you have on the report or the accessibility plan. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions with regards to the plan that's in front of us for uh, consideration? Um, I do remember a time a few years back, and I'm not sure you were here, Debbie. Uh, oh, I got Debbie, Deputy Mayor in a minute. I'll get to you in a minute. Where we did an exercise where we had to deal with uh, impairments of some sort, whether you're blind or couldn't hear, or you had one arm tied behind your back or however. And I always found that was quite a, a very um, truth-telling exercise. And uh, and I, I don't know if you do that with staff or new staff or that, but I just I just remember that was, it really, it really landed things home and gave me comments to that. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor McQueen, through you to council. I have not done that exercise here at the municipality since I've been here. However, all staff do receive training and refresher training on AODA. This legislation has been around since 2000. So it's almost been, well, it's been 23 years. This is part of our language now. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anyone that doesn't understand accessibility as they move around our communities. And, you know, it's just so much part of, um, our culture now to talk about accessibility. Right. Yeah, and I think there, I think I read in here somewhere that it's a two day course, isn't it? One one or two days or something here. Maybe that was another report I read. I can't read a lot of reports. So, Mayor McQueen, through you to council, it used to be oh. because it's part of our culture now. It's just refreshers because everybody has a front of mind. What right. you know? How do we move around our communities with a disability? Whatever the disability is. I mean, it's not just a physical disability, we have mental disabilities as well. Cognitive learning and all of those disabilities. So it's not just about the playgrounds and how you access the playgrounds, it's just not about access to municipal buildings, but how do we communicate and talk to persons with disabilities. And recognize those disabilities as well, right? So, and recognizing those disabilities when you see people are, are, uh, you're doing business with. Deputy Mayor Nielsen, you had some comments. Thank you very much, Mayor McQueen. Just a comment was gonna be that I appreciated um, having the plan brought forward for us to review and be able to see. And it's good to see some of the items that we have um, already started in the works to ensure we're um, conforming with legislation as well as doing our best as Greyhounds just to even go above and beyond legislation where we can. So this just was more of a comment on thanking staff for bringing it forward and for the information. Okay, well, thank you for those comments. So it's uh, been moved and second. Uh, any further comments? If not, all in favor of the motion. That is carried. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Manager Yip. All right, <clears throat> moving on then to, uh, we're going to leave joint and health and safety till one o'clock. So we'll move on from that. Uh, planning, I guess we can start. Uh, Councillor uh, or, or Councilor Allen for chairing that section. So we'll move into section 11 and 11.1 .1, required server upgrades, Councillor Allen, Chair Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item 11.1, .1, server upgrades. The recommendation is that council receive staff report CLS 23.16 for information and that council authorize funding up to $22,000 to replace three servers from the office equipment reserve. So would somebody like to put that on the table? Uh, Deputy Mayor, seconder. Councillor Wickens, discussion. Councillor Dubik. Uh, thank you. So um, in the report, it does discuss the need to actually upgrade all six servers. Um, and, um, you know, I would, I would uh, actually put another motion on the floor that we 
you know, it, we fund, you know, all six servers right away. Um, the way the report, you know, the, the report states that those servers do need to be replaced um, by the end of this year. Um, and so I'm not sure if there's really any benefit to wait. Um, I think there could be maybe just, you know, some, you know, um, savings of, you know, staff time if, if they just address all six servers at one time, as opposed to, you know, delaying it for another six months. Um, and so I would be willing to put an, an alternate motion on, on the floor. Um, an alternate or an, an amendment to the main motion? Oh, I will do an, an amendment to the okay. main motion. I'll second that, Mr. Chair. Okay, seconded by uh, Mayor McQueen that um, we basically we replace all six servers immediately. Now the three were in the budget, the other three were not. So is there something else required since it's not in the budget? Clerk Martell. Uh, thank you through you to council. So this, uh, these amounts weren't included in the budget. Uh, these weren't actualized until after the budget was uh, created when um, one of the um, programs included on the server was going through an upgrade it was realized that the program now no longer works because our servers were out of date and that's when we started going through this this um, process okay thank you councillor dubik um thank you so um so for six servers um the the, fun the funding request is um up to fifty thousand dollars the reserve um then would drop to only contain about five thousand um, dollars you know once those expenses go through um, so just a question to staff if there's any if you're for, foreseeing any additional needs in this current year from the um, you know from the equipment office equipment reserve clerk martel uh thank you um the office equipment reserve is, is a corporate reserve for all departments. Uh, we don't generally outside of budget ever like to bring forward anything outside of the realm of, of that um, or use the reserves for things that aren't such as this an extenuating circumstance that comes up. So we do not foresee anything. Um, but as, as always, our treasurer would always remain on top of that and be able to assist us if uh, such an extenuating circumstance were to arise. Okay, uh, Councillor Allwood. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair Allen. I wondered whether there was any money left in the Municipal Modernization Reserve. I don't recall, uh, the clerk is shaking her head. <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> That's a no, thank you. Okay, any other discussion on the amendment to the main motion? Okay, does everybody understand the, the amendment just to, to replace all six? Um, perhaps the clerk will read. The yes. amended motion. So the amendment. Amendment to the main motion. Yes, yes. Is that the main motion be amended by changing the second clause to read that council authorized funding of up to $50,000 to replace six servers to be funded from the office equipment reserve. Okay. Last chance for discussion. Okay. Seeing none. All those in favor. And that is carried unanimously. Okay. Now the main motion as amended. Clerk Martell. And the main motion as amended reads that council received staff report CLS 2316 for information and the council authorized funding of up to $50,000 to replace six servers to be funded from the office equipment reserve. And that was moved by uh, Deputy Mayor Nielsen, seconded by Dan Wickens. Okay, thank you. Any discussion on the main motion as amended? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? And that's also carried unanimously. Okay, on to 11.2, great transit route. The council receive staff report CLS 23.17 regarding the gray transit route, gray road four MOU amendment to extend term and the council authorize the mayor and clerk to sign the MOU amendment to extend the term to 2025. Anybody like to put that on the table? 
Councillor Dubik and Councillor Allwood seconding that discussion. So this is the route that was on the chopping block. What um, what happened, <laughs> Dep or, uh, Mr. Mayor? Well, I think if you looked at uh, myself and the deputy mayor in the mirror, we'd be both have the same puzzled look on our face because that's he reached out to me and I said the same. I, I it was brought to us last. I think we, I don't know if it was brought to us in December of the new council or whatever, and and it was suggested that that was going to uh, not be renewed, and that April would be the end. But I did see on here <clears throat> that the warden and the current clerk have signed it in January, which tells me that it is still on the table. So I'm not 100% sure what changed. I don't know if the deputy mayor has any comments or any follow-up on that, but um, it's, it's a pleasant surprise that it is continuing. I think uh, there's a number of people that do use that uh, that route. And I know we certainly talked in favor of it the day it came up to county council and uh, it takes time to build a route, to build a transit uh, usage. Um, but it was, it was one that was, totally funded by the county of Gray. It didn't have any subsidy to it unless something changed. So unless maybe the, the clerk, maybe there's some other information, but it, it does, it is signed by the warden in January and the clerk. So that's all I can say. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Nielsen. Thank you, Chair Allen. Um, the only thought I have, and I, I was going to reach out to um, the county, but I haven't had a chance yet was if the agreement had an expiration date, I know the plan from the county was to um, have this route extend, I think until the end of April or even into May before they actually close the route down, giving ample time. So I'm wondering if the, the agreement expired before the plans to terminate the service. And so they had to renew the agreement to extend it. So I'm just wondering if that was a principle. Yeah, I think I did read that it was the end of March, wasn't it? That it was expiring. So, so. Um, it's on mute if that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, Clerk Martel. Uh, thank you. So yes, I was a little late in getting this on the agenda. It should have been before the March thirty first, um, but I, I was not aware of the um, route that you've been speaking about that it was going to be terminated or whatever, but I would, I would assume that uh, the County was just on top of the facts that we have an agreement, an existing agreement that is expiring. And in order to maintain the agreement for the entirety of until that termination happens, they've uh, proceeded with their, with their extension agreement at this time. And that way they're covered until such a time it terminates or if it continues on. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just to follow up on that, I mean, I think part of the reason the deputy mayor maybe uh, correct me if I was wrong, but when it was brought to council, I think there's a, a clause in there that you must give notice, of, and I think it was like three months or whatever, and that's why it was came to the certain point, and I think there was a resolution. I thought, but anyway, that you need to give a certain time of notice uh, if you're not going to renew something, and uh, but again. That I, th I thought that notice was given to the end of March or, or April, or whenever that was. So, I mean, that was, I think that was the reasons why it was brought to us a few months back, or even before Christmas. I can't remember the exact date, but. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? And just, uh, I'd like to, to um, point out that um, on these reports, there are environmental impacts. So thanks staff for including that and that this one has a positive uh, impact on the environment. Okay, all those in favor? That is carried, thank you. 11.3, canine care, foster dog addition. The council received staff report CLS 23.18, canine care, foster dogs addition, and the council approved bylaw 2023-034, being a bylaw to amend bylaw 2021-071 to include provisions for the keeping of foster dogs, and the council approved that staff proceed with utilizing the approved foster organization process in substantially the same form as attached here too, as the starting point for applications 
and agreements for approvals and that council hereby delegate authority for approving and revoking approved foster organizations to the senior staff in charge of canine control for the municipality of Gray Highlands. Somebody like to put that on the table, Mayor McQueen and Councillor Wickens discussion. Councillor Wickens. Do we have anybody in the municipality that does this now? <laughs> foster dogs foster dogs um clerk martel thank you um through you chair allen to councillor wickens i am not aware of any but we've never had a type of um registration process in order to be aware of such the only thing i am aware of is when this came up it was because uh, somebody was fostering dogs which was over the limit and that's how uh, mayor mcqueen's notice of motion came to light because there was somebody um, actively involved in fostering here in the municipality thank you okay seeing no other discussion all those in favor that's carried <coughs> 11.4 committee of adjustment meeting minutes that council receive the 2023 0314 so march 14th committee of adjustment meeting minutes for information somebody like to put that on the floor councillor dubik and mayor mcqueen any discussion all those in favor that's scary. Okay. 11.5. That report PL 23.11 related to planning application Z01 2023 be received and that bylaw 2023-035 being a bylaw to approve zoning bylaw amendment Z01 2023 be approved. So we'd like to put that on the table. Councillor Dubik. Deputy Mayor Nielsen, thank you. Any discussion? And just um, going back to committee of adjustment and, and also the planning hearing that there were no concerns brought up regarding this file. Mayor McQueen. It's interesting, it's interesting when uh, I did view the site for the committee of adjustment, it was across the road from one that we approved uh, a year prior, half agriculture, half rural, and I, I noticed they built a nice house there. So yeah. I, I was quite, uh, I was quite impressed about, you know, and I only reason that because it was on site, it was across the road from another one that we dealt with, so. Okay, no further discussion. All those in favor? That's carried. 11.6 that Council receive report PL 23.12 related to deeming bylaw application D01 2023, and that Council approve the related bylaw being bylaw 2023 so this is for the three lots in Flesherton that will end up with 10 units. Um, they need to be joined together basically to allow this to go forward. So um, yes, a mover. I'll move that. Councillor Allwood, Mayor McQueen. Um, any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's carried. All right, the big one. The council received report PL 23.14 for information related to the new zoning bylaw, including a draft copy of the new zoning bylaw, and the council directs staff to proceed with the public consultation and review process that is established in the process map within the report. 
And before I get a mover and seconder, is Manager Rapke aware that, okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, so who would like to put this on the floor? Councillor Dubik and Councillor Wickens and discussion. Councillor Allwood. Thank you, Chair Allen. I was wondering, and through you to council and staff, I was wondering whether this should go to a committee of the whole before the public uh, consultation process begins. Well, I knew that would come up. <laughs> <laughs> so I did have discussions with our manager of planning yesterday. Uh, we spent about uh, over an hour discussing um, items in this uh, draft. And his, his thought was, uh, and and I was on I was on the same page as you, um, thinking that it should maybe go to the committee of the whole. But this is this is a draft that is quite different from the our original zoning bylaw. And yes, we could go to committee of the whole and probably spend four or five hours talking and deciding what we like and what we don't, and then we would go to the public, and we're going to get hopefully lots of feedback from the public and perhaps some of the things that we took out or put in the public may not like so it's kind of you know one of those things where which comes first the public consultation or council consultation and we're also thinking that it could be the type of meeting where um, there's almost like the budget open house where there's interaction and the public is saying and asking questions, saying, uh, making comments and that council is doing the same thing, that it's, it's all new. And um, we just have a back and forth conversation about what we like, what we don't. Um, so, but obviously it's up to, to this council to make the decision. So I'll, if there's other comments on that suggestion that we go to committee of the whole, Councillor Allwood. Uh, just as a follow-up, Chair Allen. I mean, it's a it, it's a well-written report. There's a lot of changes in in there, proposed changes, and uh, you know, I, I have some concerns that there's no mention of industrial wind turbines, although wind turbines are mentioned, but not not the industrial wind turbines. And there was a recommendation made by the uh, wind turbine working group on on changing uh, minimum setbacks from noise receptors and property lines that uh, I was hoping would be incorporated. And certainly our former director of planning uh, indicated that he was looking at that favorably, but uh, I noticed they're not in this draft. And I, I just thought, you know, I, I guess we could address it as you suggested uh, with an interactive meeting with council and, and the public, but uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only council member that might have some issues with, with the well-written report, and uh, it, it takes quite a bit uh, of, um, uh, to absorb it all, it takes quite a bit of uh, time, and I, I want to make sure that, uh, from my own perspective, that I understand it in its entirety, but uh, that, that was my reason for bringing it up, Chair Allen. Thank you. So, yeah, going back to the, to the process... I think if if we do have a committee of the whole meeting and and we again make changes and then we go to the public, there may be more changes. There probably will be more changes. So this could end up saving more time in that we get council's comments and the public's comments at the same time. And then we go to a committee of the whole meeting and discuss not only our concerns, but the public's. And when you say about wind turbines, perhaps when we're discussing that, there'll be members of the public that also have comments on that same topic, which I think would be valuable. So, Mr. Mayor. So I, I strongly suggest we go to the committee of the whole first. Um, um, from a couple of reasons is we have three new councillors that maybe may or may not be as familiar with what a zoning bylaw is or the understanding of how it is. Also, the track changes from our current bylaw, because our bylaw was originally uh, concepted in 2004, but I think it's 2006 or whenever it was finally approved by the, through the OMB. If we're making a drastic change, I think one is, I think that all us councillors need to have a little bit of a walk through what those changes are. 
Uh, obviously, the zoning bylaw has been in place for quite a long time, and uh, you know changes you know uh, to the better in, in some sorts. But there's other comments. I think it's better that we have a bit of an understanding of the changes and the on, on the process and what those changes are from our current bylaw because um, you know there's nothing worse than getting comments from the public and you know before it's like a budget we sort of review the budget before it goes out to the public so I just think it's I think it's a, a little bit of the process of going to a committee whole first walking through it understanding the changes you know uh, you know not only from myself has been around for a while, but new members to understand what that means. Because, uh, you know, I, I found this <clears throat> citizen guide to zoning bylaws. I, I guess it was paper form a few years back, but from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and stuff like that, of what it is. And I remember my first days being, <clears throat> going through an, an official plan in the early days of Great, Cat, Great Highlands was done in 2001 and it for, like, for three years. And then, and then the zoning bylaw was in place after that. But there is, there is a relationship you know, not only with the zoning bylaw, but to the official plan. I think there's a, an understanding of, of that and, and just maybe a, a little bit of a one-on-one -on -one of how this all works. I understand there's streamlining and, and moving to a simpler form of, of the process what's been written here. And I want to thank uh, Manager Ma uh, Rapke for uh, taking on this and, and bringing it forward. But uh, as, as Councillor Allwood has said about uh, wind turbine setbacks and a number of other things, I know in the back of my mind, there has been things over the years that, you know, for, you know one example was if there was a fire and, and somebody wanted to rebuild on an area that was somewhat compromised or some area, they would have a bit of a, a plus or minus that they could rebuild on the same footprint, but it wouldn't have to necessarily be on the exact footprint. It could be based on square footage or, or certain things that uh, could have some flexibility and uh, certainly through here, there's a lot more flexibility. So anyway, I would suggest that we, you know, and there's also, when you go to the public, you go to the public with mapping, uh, a lot of the mapping, uh, the zoning bylaw, you know, uh, has a lot of the mapping for all the different configurations. And I'm not sure uh, if there's any suggestions on, on that part, but mapping is also because my experience, people don't, get involved or make comments unless it affects their property um, personally. It just, it just, people just have no clue. What do you mean? I got to do the zoning or whatever until they do something or get a building permit or, or whatever. So I think there's going to have to be ways of creative ways of, of reaching out to the public. And maybe that's a public consultation workshop, but we go out and this is a one-on-one -on, -one on what we're proposing for our zoning bylaw, because it's so, so important that the public understands uh, what a zoning bylaw is, and also what you know the changes that we're making from the current uh, the current bylaw that's been in play for a large long time. So uh, I certainly understand its importance, but I think we as council just need to get a good understanding of what those changes from a current one are. And and I know I think uh, Chair Allen and when we've gone through official plan changes and stuff. There's usually a track change what what it was and what's being changed and stuff like that. Is somewhat important as well. Um, so anyway, those are my comments. Okay, thank you. The mapping is going to come later. Um, it was done this way for a reason that didn't want to perhaps complicate things with with mapping. Just get a feel for the the actual bylaw. Um, our manager is available to speak. I was going to uh, mention the format that we spoke of yesterday, but I think I will let uh, manager Rapke um, bring that to us. It, um, it convinced, I, again, I was on your, the same page and, and it, I was convinced that this is the best process. So perhaps if he speaks to you, uh, he'll do the same. <laughs> so manager Rapke, please. Thank you, Chair Allen. Just going to my process map here on my screen. So I hear what everyone's uh, saying, because I went through this in my mind too, when I was making this process map about what makes sense. Um, this is a really big change. It's a really big bylaw. It's probably the biggest bylaw that we have. Um, it affects a lot of stuff and I agree with everything uh, Mayor McLean was saying. Um, everybody has to understand it. You're gonna need to see some maps. Everyone's going to have to, you know, there's going to be a whole bunch of questions. Um, but this draft 
as it says in the report, there's kind of I had some objectives in writing it of the stuff to tighten up. Uh, problems we run into all of the time. We do regular amendments over and over again. Things that are a barrier to achieving kind of regular or expected outcomes. Um, this is just draft though. Uh, this is not the final document at all. I've developed at the bottom of the report an issues list of, of stuff that I've ranked as what I think has high, medium to low significance in terms of a change. Uh, I could be wrong about those things, that's just my opinion that there's kind of an item list that I think needs to be discussed for sure. Uh, and then other ones that I've noted, there's a change that I think most people probably aren't gonna care too much about, but again, could be totally wrong. In terms of the committee of the whole, um, I just don't know what the output of that would be at this point. So my thought is by going to a public meeting, we had to first have a public meeting I'd provide an overview of what is planning, what, what are we even doing with planning in general, what is the legislative framework, why are we doing this right now, what impact does the zoning bylaw have on everything we do, what is the project, uh, where are we now in the process, and how are we going to communicate with the public, collect feedback, so on and so forth. That's kind of an introduction to the public, now is the time to kick off the engagement. And that first meeting in my mind wouldn't even necessarily be getting into talking about the details of the change. That would be kicking off the process, establishing how we communicate. And then we'd have a series of uh, consultations, so meetings, uh, tools to collect feedback for a number of months, collect a bunch of this information. Council can make their own list, they can provide feedback and so on. And then we go into a committee of the whole with a kind of a list of stuff. Uh, so the public now kind of understands the process, what the involvement is, they've got involved a bit, we have that list. And then council provides direction to make some changes. We come up with a new draft, like a second legitimate draft based on all that feedback, go back to the public again for again, another series of engagement sessions that are probably gonna be a little bit lesser than that first one. Consolidate the feedback again, go back to committee of the whole and then after at that point i'm hoping it could be kind of tightened up so maybe there's kind of some there's this iteration here where depending on the significance of changes maybe you don't go all the way back to the public you kind of just do a couple committee of the whole meetings uh with changes there pop out we we confirm that we're you know okay with the, the framework of the words and then we start the mapping exercise and the reason the mapping hasn't been done yet is because the zone structure has changed substantially and to go ahead and just assume that council and the public is okay with that and to do all the mapping, there's hundreds of hours of work there that could just be flushed away if, uh, if we started that now. And the words themselves have to kind of stand on their own. You just paint, you paint the map afterwards. And then after we do that, that'll be another public consultation phase of having the public audit the mapping, see where the zones have actually been applied, and then again, collecting feedback again, and then maybe you tinker with the map a bit based on that. That's kind of the thought behind the process and not going to committee the whole right away, just because I think it's a bit premature to get into talking about all the changes before publicly discussing, you know, what's the process at this point. I mean, we can do one. There's, there's obviously council will do what they do. Um, but that was kind of the thought with that, that approach there. Okay, thank you for that. And back to um, your comment about mapping, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, any properties and correct me if I'm wrong, Manager Rapke, but any properties that are changing drastically in, in their, their zoning will be notified. Is that correct? The plan. So most of the, the mapping changes don't really constitute a change. It would be, you know, we got a residential full services zone specifically now in the zoning bylaw. There's an increase in some permitted uses to align with provincial direction. The zone symbol will change, but the underlying principle is not really changing. There's a couple weird properties scattered throughout that are industrial and in areas that don't really make sense. The plan is to approach those people who are kind of mapping them out, say, hey, we think your property should be this instead. Uh, and before actually making them legal non-conforming, make an effort to make sure that that makes sense or if there's something that we can't tell from the mapping that is currently occurring. So that is the idea there planning on making a uh, online map that would have survey capabilities so people could actually drop a pin and put in their contact information and their concern. And it wouldn't be visible to the public, but it'd be visible to us. And then that gives us quick feedback and helps audit all our mapping. So that, that's a later phase of the project, but it is planned. Okay, thank you. 
So any other comments, Mayor McQueen? So just to follow up, I appreciate the comments. There's a lot of stuff in here, you know, and to, to you know, in my mind to get into a lot of discussion. And I think our procedure by this is if we spend more than 20 minutes on something, it needs to go to the community hall. I still think it needs to go to the community hall, just in the sense of a high level view for, for you know, the new members and us old fellows that uh, maybe needs to be, uh, you know, have a question or two on there. I just think process, but certainly when we go to the public and we go to the public with mapping, it's so critical that we go either to one of our community centers or whatever, because it's the mapping that, that really, people like to see that's that seems to be where they're more interested in is how does it affect my property it's it's you know i've, I've seen that so many times even when the county's done <coughs> done reviews and stuff like that it's just people show up and they look at oh and then what's it okay well if there are changes and stuff like that so again i'll leave it at that mr chair okay thank you yeah today wasn't meant to um, get into a lot of no. questions and comments it was just to present and get to um, confirm next steps. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair Allen. Um, I have two comments. Uh, one quick question first um, to Manager Rapke. From the process that you've laid out, what is, do you have a timeline in your mind as your, your goal? Is the goal to have the, this, this is a very fulsome process concept. What is the goal to have it done in like six months, eight months, nine months? Do you have a timeline in your mind as to the, that following through? Manager Rapke? Uh, that's a good question. And a lot of it depends on that iterative cycle in the middle and um, how many committee of the whole council wants, because that, that will make it take longer, depending on how many times we do that. Um, which is why the thought is to kind of do a whole bunch of public, make it as linear as possible, but still loop where, where necessary, right? So in my mind, I'm hoping we would have something fairly concrete by the end of the year, uh, maybe tipping into the new year a bit, depending on how many times we spin there. Um, and then, you know, then you pass it and then there's appeals and stuff that generally happen with every new comprehensive zoning bylaw. So when it's in effect, is, is a different matter, but that's kind of the thought. Thank you very much. Another comment, Chair Allen, if I may. I, I don't disagree with Mayor McQueen in that a large part of our job and role as council is to help bring information to the public and that the sooner council can understand some of the significant changes that are being presented or suggested in the zoning bylaw, um, the, the better we are able to help answer questions or I don't know if there's a better way to put it other than like drum up community interest. The um, zoning bylaw process, like what we're about to undertake is a pretty significant document for the municipality as a whole. And I don't want to have a situation where um, community members are feeling left out of the process or caught off guard, or maybe not understand everything that's happening. And the sooner that, we as council can get out there and, and drum up the interest and drum up the excitement because really a lot of the changes are exciting to what we can do now. There's some significant zoning concepts and changes from um, how things were done 20 years ago in a municipality versus what Plan Arapke is presenting. So I don't disagree with, with the mayor that the sooner council can have a discussion to fully understand some of the big changes the better we are as a council to be able to get the public engagement and answer questions and direct the, the public in the right areas of the new bylaw. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, um, now we have something at one o'clock. Is it firm one o'clock or do we have a little bit of leeway? Because we're gonna have to uh, take a break for lunch uh, very soon. Um, is there a little bit of leeway and when item 10.2, I believe it was, comes onto the agenda? I can start. So through our, our uh, review of the agenda, the idea was one o'clock because we have community members that are staff that for them to, you know, stop their day, they can be available at one o'clock. So one o'clock is pretty much a hard, uh, okay. hard time that we need to go to. So. so then we need to be breaking now. So can we break I guess we can break part way through a discussion and carry this on after. 
Uh, Clerk Martel. Uh, thank you. Uh, because there will already be a motion on the floor when we break for lunch, when we come back, we would have to continue with this motion. So my recommendation would be that somebody move a motion to um, defer this item until later in the meeting. Okay. Until after item 10.2 is dealt with. All right. Uh, Councillor Allwood and Councillor Dubik to uh, defer this until after um, 10.3. Okay, 10.3 is dealt with at one o'clock. Okay, any discussion on that? All those in favor? Okay, thank you. So I'll, um, I'll turn the chair back to you, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to break for lunch. Thank you, uh, Chair Allen. And yeah, we'll take a break for lunch here now and we'll come back right at one o'clock.
Okay, uh, welcome back everybody from a enjoyable lunch break and uh, welcome to the public as well and staff and, and council. Um, so as we made a slight change on our agenda this morning, we uh, set aside 10.3 Joint Health and Safety Committee overview to one o'clock so we could accommodate our staff. So at this point, there is a report there, but I see our manager uh, for uh, our HR uh, manager, yep, is here. So I'm going to pass the floor over to you to do some introductions and uh, who's going to speak. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Can you hear me on this? Okay. Again, thank you, Mayor McQueen, uh, through you to council. Uh, yes, this is a, uh, an overview of the Joint Health and Safety Committee. We're going to talk about our duties, the employer duties, and we're going to talk about what we've done so far and what we're con continuing to do. Um, I want to introduce the Joint Health and Safety staff members that are here today. We have Rob Del Duca, Rob, Maya, Kylie, Gavin Metcalf, Sherry Brown, uh, Shirley Ann Fulford is part of the committee. She is on vacation this week. On the management rep side, we have Karen Holt. Karen Holt is on vacation as well this week. Uh, Marty Wellwood is a management, uh, a management rep on the committee. He was going to be here, but he got called out to uh, in an accident. So Marty will not be joining us unless he um, wraps it up quickly. <laughs> And myself, I'm the manager co-chair of this uh, meeting. Teresa Crawford is here. Teresa is the HR coordinator and health and safety coordinator for the municipality. She's, she has a supporting role. Jen Egan is not here. She's in training, uh, training course today, not in training, but on training course. Uh, Jen is trying to rotate off the committee. She's been on the committee for a number of years and made significant contributions to the committee. So her role right now is a supporting capacity to help transition uh, us to you know, the next level. So, oh, thank you, Amanda. Are you doing my show? Thank you. I'm on slide two. Carry on, okay. So um, the Ministry of Labor enforces the Occupational Health and Safety Act and they called OSHA. So Occup Occupational Health and Safety Act, OSHA. OSHA has been the backbone of health and safety in Ontario since 1979. I, uh, it probably seems like a long time ago for some of you that are you know, younger than me. That seems like yesterday to me. Uh, I know, Councillor Albert, I see you smiling. We kind of, yeah, I get it, right? <laughs> I know I was listening to you this morning and that whole healthcare thing. It's like, yes, I'm there too. With the purpose of ensuring workers are protected from workplace hazards. So there's a backbone and it protects, ensures that workers are protected. It provides a framework and guidelines for employers to establish policies, procedures, for pre preventing and handling hazardous materials. So at the very um, lowest level, handling materials, um, anything hazardous can be sharps, anything right to violence and harassment in the workplace. So right from here, all the way to um, investigations to violence and harassment. So managers and supervisors and all employees, regardless of their status. So if you're casual, volunteers, permanent full-time, permanent part-time, everyone um, has the right to know. The right to know what your hazards are. When you come to work every day, what are the hazards? Employees have the right to know and how to deal with them. They have the right to participate, participate in investigations, participate in identifying hazards, participate in the Joint Health and Safety Committee. So employees have the right to participate and the right to refuse unsafe work. Any employee that thinks their work is unsafe at that moment in time can call a work stoppage. At that point, there'll be an investigation a certified member of the Joint Health and Safety Committee would have to attend the site. And there'd be an investigation on the spot. So that's what Occupational Health and Safety Act does and what we do. Now, there's a lot of notes for the next slide, employer's duties. I had to make on my screen here, the slide really small and all of this print here, because there are a lot of responsibilities for the employer. So from the slide, you can see that there's lots of responsibilities. And this is not an exhaustive list. These are the important and overarching high responsibilities. 
employers must take all possible and reasonable precautions to protect the health and safety of all workers. Employers also need to ensure that equipment, materials, protective equipment are maintained in good condition. It includes tools, chainsaws that are operating properly, um, hydraulics are operating properly. So the maintenance of the equipment is really important. Employers must provide information, instruction, supervision to protect workers and ensure their health and safety and well being. This is accomplished through safety talks. So our directors and managers and team leaders have safety talks at the work sites with their staff. SMT is actually incorporating safety talks into their monthly or weekly agendas, depending on how, how often they speak to their staff. And um, we're keeping the health and safety policies and programs updated. Our most recent updates on policies have been pushed out through HR downloads. We've done a number of new updates uh, to health and safety policies. And we, we um, include training on that too. So training and policy receipt. I've read and understood the new um, health and safety policies. So the employer is required to cooperate with the health and safety committee, meaning they can't ignore the committee. When the, com when the committee brings forward an item, it needs to be addressed. It becomes a, a record of hazards that have been identified. So it has to be addressed. Employers are required to post a copy of the OSHA in the workplace. And this is really housekeeping, what we need to do, which we do do. Um, all the documentation is posted at all on all um, health and safety bulletin boards. Lastly, on the slide, the employees are required to prepare and implement a written occupational health and safety policy and post on all bulletin boards. And you remember late last year when this council was new, we talked about the health and safety policy and we had lots of dialogue around that. Um, so that is signed, it's on all the bulletin boards. So this list is only a list, but it comes alive when senior management team supports and believes in the benefits of a health and safe work environment. The Joint Health and Safety Committee wishes to commend SMT for their commitment, participation, and encouragement to make Greyhounds an example of good safety practices. We've had, you feel proud of yourself, Michelle? Um, as our one SMT member here. Um, we- Oh, oh and you stepped on that oh, one. I'm sorry. Well, Raylene, Raylene, you're in your clerk role. Right, SMT, thank you, Raylene. Um, so we've had some feedback from external organizations that we're doing an amazing job on health and safety. So just before you change that page, yeah. so just going back to equipment or uh, tools. So it's at the end of the day, 3.30 and something goes wrong. Is it tagged? I'm going to defer that to Gavin. Uh, here, wait, you have to come up, come here to speak. So at the end of the day, if we have an equipment breakdown, either depending on the situation we're in, if it's a snow plow, it gets fixed. Um, chainsaws and small equipment, it doesn't necessarily get tagged. It does get removed from service and put on the workbench and then either we fix it or we send it to wherever to get fixed. And the reason I say it is a chainsaw, it maybe won't run, but if it's something that could hurt an employee, it's end of the day, rushing to go, as long as there's a process that it doesn't get used by the next shift or somebody else comes in and then, oh, right. So here, here in Great Highlands, we only have one shift. So the guys that used it the day before, also right. the guys that would use it the next day. When equipment gets broken, our guys are trained and the supervisors are present to say, you're not allowed to use that, it's broken. And then it gets fixed. Okay, I was thinking if there's a, on the winter maintenance, sometimes you have, um, like I guess it's a 10 hour shift, what, four days, 10 hours. Mm -hmm. If it's, if, if, yeah, if somebody came, you know, that was, wasn't there the day before because of the day off, as long as there's a mechanism that they would be, know that something was wrong with something and, and you're reassuring me that there is, so that's good. Yes. Yes. There is. Okay. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions before I go to the next slide? No, good. Okay, this is the role of um, the Health and Safety Committee. So the role of the Joint Health and Safety Committee is to ensure there's an internal responsibility system. So you say, what is that? What that is, is it's a comprehensive approach to health and safety workers and employer 
uh, work together to make sure it comes alive. So we have Joint Health and Safety Committee, we have the employer. So internal responsibility system, we work together to make sure it's embedded in our organization. So the committee's made of reps of both workers and management. Uh, any workplace greater than 50 employees has to have at least uh, four members, uh, two management and two um, worker reps. We've exceeded that requirement. Some of the key roles of the committee are to identify hazards, perform workplace inspections. And uh, I think Rob's gonna speak more about the, or Gavin, Gavin's gonna speak more about the inspections. <laughs> uh, investigate work refusal, refusals, uh, critical injuries or fatalities and make recommendations to the employer on improving health and safety. Um, we've had, uh, last year, we had a critical injury. And when we get notice of that, we have to stop what we're doing and investigate immediately. The committee must be consulted about and, and, and be present at the beginning of any testing, any health and safety testing that happens at the municipality. So I'm turning the mic now over to Maya. Yeah. Good afternoon, Council. Um, so I'm just going to be speaking on um, what a certified member of the Joint Health and Safety Committee is. Um, so a certified member is someone who has taken specialized training in occupational health and safety. Um, so employers might, must ensure that the Joint Health and Safety Committee has at least two certified members, one representing the employee and the other one representing management. Um, and we've exceeded that minimum requirement as well. Um, so then the next slide is on the training itself. So there's two parts. So to become a <coughs> joint health and safety member, you must complete part one and part two of the joint health and safety um, certificate or certification training, sorry. Um, and that training can be completed virtually or in person. I completed mine virtually. Um, part one is the three-day course and it touches on health and safety knowledge, the applicable legislation and standards, as well as how to perform your workplace inspections. And then um, part two is a two day course um, and it goes more in depth on how to actually conduct those assessments on hazards and um, help identify any workplace training um, as a result of any hazards identified. Um, so I recently completed my training um, and I found it really insightful. It kind of opened my eyes of how important the Joint Health and Safety Committee is. Um, the administrators that I had um, were really great. They allowed for productive conversation to actually grasp what we were learning so that was really good so if there's no questions i got a question yeah. so when you identify a hazard is there like a sheet that you write up and then uh do you have to put in their actions to mitigate the the hazard or how does that work then once you identify it yeah so when i'm doing my inspection so i do um gavin will touch on it a little bit more but when i do the um environmental services one. So if we ran into a hazard that was identified at one of the say water treatment plants, I would note it on my inspection sheet. Um, and then I would let my SMT member who signs off know they're aware of the hazard. I then submit it to health and safety, which will go to Teresa and Debbie. They're aware they track it. And then through their health and safety, SMT and myself work through resolving that hazard. So, so then it, everybody's aware of it. Is it identified as low, medium, high in the sense of? Uh, yes. Yeah, so when I submit it, Teresa will then look at it and then she'll usually reach out to, in this case, Sean is my SMT member, reach out to him and myself, and then we evaluate it from there. And it could be as simple as I write yeah. it. You may take care of it right there and then. I don't know. Yeah. Like one we had was a fuel cabinet was needed. So it was as simple as addressing it and it was approved during this budget. So then we purchased it and now it's no longer hazard. Okay. All right. Great. I don't have to be the only one ask ask questions here. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. No problem. Is it going to be Rob or is I believe it's Gavin? Perfect. Afternoon, Council. Um, as you can see from this slide ahead of you, um, we have a number of joint health and safety um, committee members, more than we actually need. Um, we are going above and beyond and many of them are certified. Most all, we're working on um, certifying them all. And that way, um, through attrition, um, we will always have a solid knowledge and there will be no gaps in our um, combined knowledge and performance. Um, monthly inspections are one of our um, jobs, I suppose. 
and nobody really thinks about the time it takes to perform monthly inspections. We spend, um, I spend over a day, generally, I have four shops. I'm in the transportation depot, um, inspecting the shops and the domes surrounding them. Um, Maya, she is the, um, she is in, <laughs> Yes, I'm just nervous. <laughs> She's environmental services, Careful and she has, say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and also public utilities. So she has all of our lagoons, all of our pumping stations, all of our landfills, and those um, places. And it takes her almost two days, I believe, to complete them. Um, Sherry Brown, she's in charge of libraries. Um, she keeps those looking beautiful and safe for the rest of us. Shirley Ann, she wasn't able to make it today. She does all of our arenas and parks and open spaces. And arenas are large buildings. She goes through all the buildings. She checks for lights that are out, slippery surfaces, make sure the ice is good, whatnot. Um, yeah. And that is that for members. I believe that it is Rob's turn. So with all these inspections uh, for safety, but also Sorry, Rob, um, <laughs> but also from a, a liability or a due diligence that must that must make our insurance company happy as well, because you were out there, you know, doing the inspections as well. So hopefully we get a 10 percent break on the, our insurance on that as well. But uh, it is it is reassuring that, uh, you know, you do your double duty in a way. Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> It's important for us because it's a lot of money for our insurance as well. So, but it's also about the safety part as well. Yeah, Rob will actually touch on the due diligence of the oh, employers. Oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, yes, uh, just, and thank you and everybody in attendance. Um, Gavin touched on, or you touched on the... Um, the safety of our facilities. I mean, mostly public access there. So yeah, it's a very, very important thing to make sure that everything is tip top shape there and working properly uh, in all our facilities, halls and arenas. Um, okay, so I've got the, I drew the short straw for the, for the downer slide here. Uh, so we, so through HR downloads, um, our uh, managers, supervisors all take their due diligence courses. Um, those courses basically outline the actions that supervisors have to take in protecting the workplace and the workers. Um, as we all know, there's some big fines there for the corporation, for the employer, if, if we're not following the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, so, you know, we, we're making sure that we, we do everything we can. And again, SMT supports us in that and allows us to give us or gives us the time that we need to do it. Um, next slide, please. So this one's a little bit more fun. Uh, if you think back, I don't know, personally, I'll say think back 10 years, health and safety wasn't necessarily the most fun thing in the world. Uh, it was done because we had to be done, but it wasn't necessarily um, exciting. So I think I, I'm happy to say that I think our, our health and safety committee with the help of SMT and our colleagues, I think we're making it a little bit more fun. Uh, last year, for example, we did our um, health and wellness um, uh, planned and we did it throughout the whole year. We did monthly themes. Uh, don't ask me to name them all because I can't remember, but we did some, um, you know, mental health awareness. We did sleep tracking. We did water intake tracking. We did um, Movember to raise money for um, prostate awareness. Um, so, yeah, so we do a lot of fun things. Um, I've personally seen over the past few years, and I'm sure everybody else can attest to this, that we've had a huge uptake in, in participation in health and safety. We're seeing more reporting as uh, Teresa will comment on later. Um, we're getting a lot more engagement as well. Um, we're, we have people coming to meetings, speakers, guests, um, SMT members are rotating coming to meetings as well. Um, help build the relationship between the committee and SMT, making sure that they are aware of what we're doing as well and show that our, the time we take and they give us is, is paying off. Um, we review and update our policies frequently to make sure everything is up to date. We have to stay up with current legislation and that's very important because if we don't, we're, we could, again, we can run into problems. Um, our meetings are bi-monthly. Um, and I think that's all I have. Um, if there's any questions, uh, easy questions, I'd be happy to field them. Mayor McQueen. 
No, I'm I'm very happy that you guys have come today. I know uh, last year uh, there was a lot of questions uh, with Kern and, and the new councillors of you know what you're doing and how you we're all working together on this. And I know myself and the CEO, uh, you know, have uh, high regard to what you do and also are responsible representing council and the staff as well. So it's a, around uh, a well-rounded way of understanding what you do. And after we pass this, I'm going to suggest that we do a picture with council and, and, and your committee. So then the uh, public understands there's a committee that's out there looking after everybody's safety is, is yourself. And uh, so I think that's very important from, from that perspective as well. Councilor Dubé. Uh, thank you. So, uh, so I do have a question for, um, for, for the worker members. Uh, so anybody who might be interested in responding. Um, two-part kind of question. You can pick and choose whichever question you want or both. Um, so this is um, an additional um, sort of accountability that you're taking, you know, above, you know, above your role. Um, so wondering, A, um, you know, what made you decide to step up and join the committee? And or um, B, um, what has made you proud of being part of the committee? That sounds like a teacher question, but anyway, <laughs> we would like to go first. Yeah, uh, I joined the committee just for the main purpose of wanting to not only make sure everything is safe at work, I, it was also get to know my colleagues. And um, I started fairly early on in my career with the municipality. Uh, so it, it gave me that opportunity to reach out, get to know other departments, see what the, how things are going. Um, I had also allowed me to see other locations that I normally wouldn't see, um, you know, through assisting with inspections and whatnot. Um, I have to say that um, I absolutely love the, the um, camaraderie, I guess you could say, um, the teamwork that we all do. It, the communication, I think, is the key point here. It's such a great group for communication. Um, nothing will get by any of us. If there's something going on in health and safety, we'll all know about it hmm. very quickly as well. And certainly you uh, were sort of the, the glue that stuck at held everything together during COVID and mm -hmm. in, the, in the office and talk mm -hmm. about safety during that time too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if you have any reflection on that or not, but uh, you were the only guy here in the office, so person in the office, right? <laughs> yeah, it was very, um, yeah, it was a very interesting time, I could say. Absolutely. But, we, but everybody did their part. We, we worked together to make sure that, you know, contact was very limited. Uh, if people needed anything in the office, if there's something I could not do for them, they came in, they, we, we, we did what we had to do, masks, gloves, we had sanitizer, we stayed apart, and, and we got it done. That was very good. Absolutely. So uh, thank you for letting me. Thanks, Rob. So personally, um, I'm a farm kid, grew up on a farm, working on a farm, and there are all sorts of dangerous things that should not be there should not be dangerous and you have to be aware of the hazards and it's common sense that doesn't help when you're in a setting such as this um, and it's not fair to people who just want to come to work and do their job and go home and do a good thing to have to be aware of those hazards um, so I want to be out there and fixing those hazards and making them safe and um, giving people the knowledge they need to avoid those hazards and helping to make those hazards go away because it's not fair to anybody to get hurt never ever so well thanks for that and i think you would be really interested in joining the great county farm safety association <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> we can speak later okay um, so mine's very similar to rob so i only joined the municipality i'd say not even a year and a half ago and i joined soon um, I joined the health and safety committee soon after starting. Um, it definitely was at first a way to meet my peers, get out. Um, as I work in the office, I don't get to see all of everything that's out there in Great Highland. So now I have a lot more knowledge about our, our treatment plan. Okay, uh, thank you to the worker reps. Uh, Teresa is going to come up now and, and uh, talk to with you about her role as the uh, health and safety coordinator. And she's got some stats for you. Good afternoon, Council. Um, so I actually just want to piggyback off that there. So I started as a worker member as well a long time ago uh, in automotive. And um, that was my first ever experience with safety, health and safety. And it kind of 
molded me into what I wanted to be, you know, when I grew up. Um, so that's kind of why I'm here. I mean, you, you see what you can do to actually help people and make sure that people go to work safe and go home safe. And I mean, it, it had a lot into what, you know, played a lot into my role now as to why I'm here. So, so that's good. Um, so as Debbie mentioned, I'm going to go over some of the stats. Part of our role in health and safety is to ensure that we're watching the trends of what's happening and, you know, seeing where the issues are. Um, so what we want to do is we want to track all of our um, incident reports that do come in and we want to see where the trends are. Um, so from the stats that we have, uh, we've had seven um, incidents come in to the date that we uh, completed this presentation. We've had three more since then. Um, I know it seems like a high number for the beginning of the year. However, it's actually a good sign. It's a sign that people are reporting now. Uh, we don't want people to go undercover or underground and, and hide any incidents because we want to be able to see what's happening and put you know, things in place to make sure that they don't actually become something more serious. So we always want to root cause any incident that happens and try to eliminate it before it becomes more serious. Um, so with that, uh, all of our reports that we put together, um, these are some of the metrics that we do track. Um, so we have types of in, uh, injuries. So the majority of our incidents uh, result in no aid injuries. So that's an injury that um, doesn't require first aid or medical aid. Okay, so um, we've had uh, four of the seven as no aid injuries. Um, they are mostly struck by, so somebody bumps into something or got hit by something. Um, our transportation department makes up the majority of our incidents, but that's not unusual. They are our biggest department here. So um, also causes of our incidents are mostly related to unsafe conditions, which means that we do have a lot of work to do as a joint health and safety committee to, to, to rectify those unsafe conditions. So Teresa, on those, what triggers WSIB reporting mechanism? Or maybe you're going to get to that. No, well, that's a good question. Um, WSIB is usually involved once um, an, uh, a worker seeks medical. So if they get medical care from a physician or okay. uh, go to the, the hospital or anything like that, that's when we open a WSIB claim. Okay. Okay. Um, there has been none of those this year so far. So good. Um, so for locations, we found that our Rockland Arena has the most incidents. Mm -hmm. um, where uh, they've had the most out of, I guess they've had three of them. So it is kind of spread across, but um, Rockland just seems to come up most often right now. Uh, six out of seven of our incidents are a result of a sudden specific event. So rather than a gradual onset, so something that happens right then and there, it's an event that you can pinpoint that's what caused it. Um, and most of our incidents are property damage or near misses, as opposed to an injury to the bottom or the body, which is positive as well, positive in a way. <laughs> okay. So next slide. Um, I know you guys uh, were introduced to our involvement in the WSIB Excellence Program. Um, this is a program that was established by WSIB and um, it's open to workers um, or to organizations to help them to solidify their, uh, their health and safety department. Um, make their policies and procedures um, more effective and efficient and um, helps to control, helps companies to control their hazards and um, improve on any particular areas of health and safety. Okay, so this is our first year uh, to have adopted the WSIB Excellence Program. Okay, and um, there are three parts to the program. There is the foundation, um, which is more of a um, basic knowledge and awareness of the health and safety program. There's the intermediate, and then there's advanced, which gives you a more accredited and, re accredited and recognized health and safety management program. So we are in the foundation stage right now. There's 10 topics to choose from. Um, we choose five each year. So this is our first year. Um, and we've chosen five and they focus on eliminating or controlling hazards. So next slide, I'll go into which ones we chose. All right, so our five that we chose, the first one was leadership and commitment, health and safety communication, uh, health and safety participation, injury, illness and incident reporting and first aid. So those are the five elements that we chose to improve on or implement if we didn't already have them in place. Um, now that the, these five are pretty well completed, um, 
we will move on in the next stage for next year, we'll pick another five. And when you pick the other five, we still need to maintain these five. So these aren't just to check off a box and say, we've done them. We need to um, ensure that we're always, you know, carrying them along with us, maintaining them and improving on them every year, and then adding more elements each year as well. Okay. Great. So this is the, um, this is basically our implementation or our plan of implementation to track our progress. Um, as you can see, the bottom one there is first aid. It's very small writing, sorry, but the bottom pink line there, that's first aid. So prior to my start, first aid was already completed. So one of the five elements were already completed when I started. Um, now, when I started in November, um, our deadline for this program is April. So we had to really fast forward these elements to get them done in time. There's a lot of work that goes into them, policy implementation, um, approvals, all of that. So we ended up working on all the, the remaining four together at the same time, trying to get all policies done at the same time, approved at the same time and, and whatnot. So um, we did really put a lot of work into this in the last few months. Um, so to date, I can tell you um, that we have finished all of them. So we are just in the process of uh, uploading them to WSIB for their evaluation. Um, and then we'll hear back to see if we get um, our rebates at the end of the year. Okay. So uh, really a lot of time and support was required from Joint Health and Safety and SMT to, to get all this done in such a short time. So I do appreciate that. Okay. So I'll move on to our health and safety wellness initiatives that we chose for, for this year. This is um, as Rob was touching on earlier, we do choose some fun things to do um, just to kind of create awareness uh, to health and safety topics. Um, and this one here is specifically health and wellness. So for February, we chose to um, recognize the blue theme, which is, you know, kind of anxiety, depression, all of that. So what we did was we sent out a communication to our, our employees um, and it was recognizing the signs of um, mental illness or um, mental health concerns. And it also provided resources, including our employee assistance program, how to um, contact them and uh, where you can go for help. Um, in April, we're doing spring refresh, which is um, tracking your sleep, making sure you're getting enough sleep because sleep is really kind of a root cause of a lot of um, our mental health concerns. Um, June is going to be our get active um, theme where we're going to have long games out front um, and just get everybody active to socialize. Uh, August, we're going to do a scavenger hunt where we will identify key areas of gray, gray highlands and um, we'll have employees go around and take pictures uh, that they've been there and then, you know, have some kind of a, a winner at the end of that who's, who's made it to all the locations. October will be healthy eating. So we're going to put up, we're going to ask for recipes from members and put together a uh, healthy eating recipe book. And then November, we're going to do our Movember again, which is again, awareness for prostate cancer. Okay. So that is all I have. Questions? Councillor Wickens. Yeah, in regards to your first aid course, does all the workers inside and outside take first aid? So we have, uh, we open it up to whoever wants to take it. Um, we have quite a few members that have it that are in each department so that each department does have somebody that that is first aid qualified. So um, yeah, it, it is open to everybody because we want everybody to have that, that training, um, but it's not mandatory for everybody. It's just uh, if somebody has an accident and- uh, Yeah, we do have key people, our supervisors. Yeah, but the, the key people may not be there. That's, that's, that's the issue I have. Right. Where, uh, where I came from, everybody took the first aid. There was yeah. no, you, you didn't opt in it was mandatory. And I wondered if that could be extended to the council as well, if we decided we would like to join in because I would be one that would. Yeah. Let's see. Um, thank you, Councillor Wickens. Uh, through you to council, um, there is legislation that requires certain members to have first aid training. So every, you have to have one person on every shift. 
So in our small depots, we're gonna have four people on the shifts. It makes sense to have everybody uh, in first aid, but we have budgetary constraints as well because there's an expense to this. So it's really a juggling act. Who needs to be trained? How many shifts do we have? How much can we afford to do? Because uh, health and safety is one of them. And I think uh, in the depots, there's always somebody on that has a uh, first aid training. <laughs> what if they're the ones that get knocked over? <laughs> That's, a, that's my issue. You know, exactly. And so I want to actually kind of broaden that, your concern there. Um, sorry, Councillor Wickens, I'm going to broaden it. Um, you bring up a really, really good point. The Health and Safety Committee and our Health and Safety Initiatives have come light years in the last few years. Light years. So we're not where exactly where we could be if we had the Rolls Royce of a Health and Safety Committee and policies and practices. We're not there, but we're not the Volkswagen anymore. We're certainly probably about a Buick. Okay, you guys agree, right? Um, so, so we're getting there. We'll, we'll buy a fancy tire next year, right? Get to the BMW um, later, right? What's that? Get to the BMW later. Yes. <laughs> Um, I did I answer your question. Yeah, it's it okay. just uh, um, if there ever was a situation like that, and the person that did have the training was the one that was hurt, and there was nobody there to help them, or nobody that would even had some kind of an inkling of what to do. Okay, so I'm going. To... I know you run to the phone and phone nine one one, but there are things that you can do that uh, you know if they're sitting there and they're bleeding to death, you know. Mm -hmm. what to do in that situation so, or, or just CPR. Right. Know. So through you uh, to council, we have a policy in place we're working on right now. It's called working alone policy for that very reason. Mm -hmm. I've talked to all the directors and I'm confident in the practice. We have working alone practices that are working. What we're doing now is putting into a procedure for each department because we need to know where employees are. Are they working alone? Were the safety mechanisms in place? And who, you know, how do they reach out for help when they're working alone? So we're we're really aware of um, this concern. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, Councilor Wiggins there is a good point because you never know when you need it, who who needs it at the time and, and that type of thing. And I know legislation changed that if you attempt to uh, do CPR or or first aid, you're not held liable. And no, I think no, that you're not. No, no, it's it that, which is because that was a concern at one time that you know. It's, it's, it's not the case anymore, right? So, uh, you know, you, you're there as a, doing a good measure, right? So, other questions? I believe that's the Good Samaritan Act. I believe it is. Yeah. You know, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we do have a resolution here uh, that HR uh, 2305 report joint health, joint health and safety committee meeting be received for information. I have a mover and a seconder for that. Councillor Dubik, Councillor Allwood. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. So before you leave, we're gonna do a picture with council. We have to take a five minute break because we gotta turn the cameras uh, around to, uh, to change for our rest of our meeting. So uh, Madam Clerk, do I just sort of adjourn for five or just what do, you, what do I need? Recess. Okay, so we'll take a recess for five minutes at, uh, we'll come back at uh, 2.45. Good stuff. All right, let's get up.
All right, we'll uh, bring this uh, council meeting back to order. And just before lunch, we re no, we deferred to after lunch uh, item 11.7. So I'm going to go and pass this back to Chair Allen and to resume our discussion on, on 11.7. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And is our manager of, there we are, okay. All right. So we were discussing whether we go to a committee of the whole meeting prior to going to the public. Um, Manager Rapke, did you have anything more to say or had you wrapped up your comments? Uh, just to reiterate a couple points. Um, again, you know, council can, can do that. My thought was just that it's, it's, I don't know what we're achieving there. And if there's an idea of what to talk about, for sure. I, the plan is not to present this to the public. Like this is a bylaw that's ready by any means. Like this is, you know, we address those principles in the report. Now is the starting point to talk about where we want to go. How do we comply with the official plan? The speaker this morning brought up a bunch of really cool planning stuff. Um, stole a bit of my thunder because I've been wanting to spam council with that YouTube channel for a couple of years now. Uh, so it was, it was exciting to see that come up because that's some stuff that we should talk about through this process. Um, and I think by kicking it off with, with what's already written down, we can get into some of that discussion find out how the public feels about some things, what the issues are, and then come back. But um, like, I, I would be curious to know what the outcome would be for the committee of the whole meeting. And if I'm to prepare something in advance of that or, or what the plan is there, if that's the idea. Okay, thank you for that. I didn't know if I would say this earlier, but um, but I think I will. Going, going to the public first um, would allow council to blame our manager <laughs> for anything they didn't like <laughs> so if that's point. not incentive enough i don't know what is so <laughs> so comments from members of council there is no motion on the table other than um to re what was the actual motion to receive um for information and to to uh, proceed with the process as outlined so at that point there that is what we're discussing now so mayor mcqueen turn turn your mic on there i want a motion that we receive the uh, uh draft report from our, our manager of planning and that we refer this to uh, uh next upcoming committee the whole with a high level further discussion on the on the uh on the draft by law itself. I know that uh, going to the public, it's good to get information back, but this, this, is, this is a fairly large document and part of our procedural, like we could get in here and ask a bunch of questions today, but I think it's, it's a, you know, if it's past 20 minutes, and we've probably been almost 20 minutes talking about it now, is, is to kick it to that community of the whole. I, I don't disagree that we do want to get public feedback, but I think, um, you know, getting into the in-depthness of, of the Sony by law, I'd like to have a, a see a little bit more opportunity at the committee, the whole level, especially for our new uh, three members of council here as well. So I'll put that on the floor. Uh, okay, so there is a motion on the floor. Oh, so correct. you would- Well, then this will be amendment then, I guess. Oh, yeah, amendment too. Yes. Well, I still we need to receive it, right? And then, and then push this over to a committee, the whole so meeting. you're referring it to a committee, the whole? Okay, hall, yeah. But the next committee, the whole is full. Or a so special, we, then it could be a special, it could be a, a special council or a special committee, the whole meeting. So we could split the question. So we could vote on the first one that we receive it for information. Does that work? Clerk Martel? Okay, so um, sorry, I had to wrap my head around it because when you're referring it, it's it's you you have received it and you're refer you you're saying you've received it, but you want it to go to another body for further communication. So you don't have to split the motion. Okay. It literally is just a motion to refer, which take press takes precedence in the order of operations of the main motion as it is. So we would just take the whole thing and refer it to a committee of the whole. 
um, at issue right now is that the next committee of the whole is scheduled for something um, under public utilities. I'm not sure if it's time sensitive or not. So whether that's a special committee of the whole meeting called specifically for this item or not, I'm not sure. Okay, so the motion is to refer this to a future committee of the whole meeting. And just um, point, of, point of procedure, Mr. Chair, we could speak about that in meeting in the meeting section right, of the agenda. Right. Um, Manager Rapke, did I see your hand go up? Yeah, thanks. Just just so this doesn't get lost and so that we have direction in the interim. I don't know if you want to do a separate motion or something, but um, if council's okay to, to provide direction that we can start advertising at least the draft and in the background work on the process of setting up the meetings and whatnot, and then we would catch a, a committee of the whole potentially prior to a meeting, or do we, we sit and wait and not schedule anything until after committee of the whole? Okay. Uh, Mayor McQueen. So, so I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think it could be advertised that the, um, I, I don't disagree what the manager up here is saying is, it could be advertised and promoted that we're going to first talk about it at our committee, the whole meeting, so people can listen in and, and get a better understanding of that along. So you're not going to lose anything from a public perspective, and that could be advertised or, or, and, uh, or whatever. And maybe it's, a, maybe it's a separate committee or maybe it's a special meeting of council that I it's sort of like the idea though it's a committee this this is something I think uh, uh, Chair Allen this is sort of as as we talked about this new term if there is a, a special meeting or, or a separate committee of the whole that's specifically dedicated to a certain part of our department this would be something that'd be under you as chair of planning and then you would you know this is, would totally be under yours your um as chair of planning, right, and, and that sort of thing. And we do have that, we did make that change that if there was a, a reason for special meetings or whatever of a certain topic, that individual council would be chairing those meetings. So however that needs to be, maybe it's different in the committee of the whole, maybe it's just a special council meeting, special meeting of council with regards to the specific item. Okay, thank you. Um, but I think we could, if, if this, passes and we're going to have a committee of the whole meeting first then but we could start advertising and perhaps also choose a date for public consultation um, so that we're not losing is if we wait till we get our committee of the whole meeting done and then we schedule we've got to give a certain amount of notice um, maybe clerk martel <laughs> uh Thank you. Um, I think the main reason that this was brought to council before we started public consultation is because we do need council permission that we put this out there publicly. So if you're not okay at this meeting with saying we can put it out there publicly, if you're waiting because you want to go to committee of the whole before you say it can go out there publicly, you won't know whether you want it out there publicly for comment until after your committee of the whole either. So I, I think that's what Manager Rapke was saying before, like um, is the process wise and, and if we're not referring this, then it could be just an amendment that we don't hold any of the public consultations until after council has a committee of the whole first, may be a better recommendation to move forward with if it meets the intent of what I, I'm kind of hearing from what council's saying, instead of referring it just adding an amendment to the main motion that that the public consultations occur after Committee of the Whole. Mayor McQueen. But I think it's important that the public knows when we go to that special council meeting or Committee of the Whole or whatever it is, that we are reviewing it in a draft form. And so they get tuned in to what, what we're seeing. So at least they get themselves familiar. So I, I, I agree with what the clerk is saying. We need a, a shot at it first, but it doesn't say that the public can't learn as we go through that process of, of walking through it a little bit more in, in depth. So <coughs> do I need to change my motion just for clarity or do I have a small amendment to that? And I will. Would Either that or we vote on on this motion to go to committee or to refer it to committee of the whole, because if it passes, then we can make another decision as to whether we allow the public to see it prior to, but if it doesn't pass, then we would be going to the public. If you refer it, it's gone. It's now no longer in your hands to make any further decisions. That's what I'm saying, but we have to vote on referring it. Did you get a seconder? 
The mayor no. moved it. There's no second or snow on the floor yet. Well, <laughs> I'll second the motion. Okay. There. Yeah. <laughs> Just make it more difficult. Uh, yeah. Councillor Allwood. Thank you, Chair. I mean, this agenda is in the public domain and the draft is attached to the agenda. So the public exactly. that are interested will yeah. have had a chance of seeing the uh, uh, the draft. Yeah. But uh, I think the public engagement side of things, I mean, I, I fully expect to be hearing from the public not long after this meeting. Tonight, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my concern was that, uh, you know, that we, we as council have a chance beyond this meeting in a committee of the whole to uh, come to a consensus um, and uh, under, understand the, uh, the, there's a lot of detail in here that needs to be absorbed and understood and maybe explained why we're doing it, how it's been done. I mean, we're not, we're not, we're not directing staff. We're, I'm certainly not the planning expert that tells our director of planning or planning manager how to redraft a zoning bylaw. Um, but uh, I, I'd like to understand. You can get answers to your questions. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. I'll go to the deputy mayor. Sorry, we keep um, forgetting about you up there. That's okay, Chair Allen. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Uh, Councillor Wickens, for pointing out. Um, a question to Mayor McQueen and kind of with what Manager Rappi was saying. Oh, Mayor is distracted at the moment. Just make sure he's yeah. paying attention. Okay. Sorry. The deputy okay. mayor is um, proposing or is putting a question to you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just a, a question, Mayor McQueen, is is your goal for the community the community of the whole for us to be able to ask questions of the manager of planning to fully understand the changes he's making? Or is the goal to deep dive the new zoning policy and try to make changes that we think should happen in there? I'm just trying to understand, because I, I, I agree to go to a community of the whole if the purpose is to fully understand the zoning before we go to the public, like I was saying, so that we, we can be almost cheerleaders for the zoning and drum up interest and get people engaged. I think if the community of the whole premise is to start trying to make changes or then I'm a little bit lost. Mayor McQueen? Well, it's a document that's maybe taken a different direction from what our current zoning bylaw is. And I think one, we need to know where we're coming from and where we're going. And I think from, from a perspective of all councillors, if we don't understand it or we don't, uh, we have questions, uh, as I think Councillor Albert or somebody said, if we get a question on the street, well, what are you doing that for? Well, uh, well, mm -mm -mm. We, at least we have a better understanding and ex explanation of why we're going there. Not saying we wouldn't, but I mean, this is a, this is, you know, generally I think moving forward a zoning amendment or sorry, a zoning bylaw review. Uh, it, I think it was through our planning act now are looking at like a 10 year window of, of having it in place. Uh, if we look at the 10 year past, well, we're past, we're past due. Right. And, and that sort of thing. Right. So, I mean, a lot of legislation changes, and that's part of the reason why you have a review to catch up to your legislative changes as well. If there are some and stuff and mapping and all that kind of stuff, which is mapping is later. So um, I, I just think from due process, this is the proper way of doing it, just in the sense and what I've seen in the past. So. Any follow up, Deputy Mayor? No, I'm OK. Thank you, Chair Allen. OK, we've got two hands on council and we have our manager are you res you uh, responding directly to mayor mcqueen's comments uh yes thanks chair okay. allen um just for clarity again it's fine to do it through committee of the whole the intent would have been through public consultation because I, I see uh you know in everybody else's seat big document a lot of changes uh what's the justification so the intent was to start uh just out in the public Here's the stuff we run into all of the time that's kind of been addressed. Here's the justification for this and that. Here's a whole list of things that are in here that are totally arbitrary, uh, that just zoning bylaws have. What's the direction? Get the feel the vibe of the community and council themselves and establish that list and then get into the nitty gritty after we do that and start going through those things. So that can be done through committee of the whole or in an, uh, a bigger setting with the public because council 
at that meeting wouldn't have to be justifying, you know, why the document is the way it is now, because it's just a starting point, right? But if council wants to kind of have some of those answers themselves before having the public setting, I, I get going to committee the whole, but it's just going to be, I would assume still me kind of speaking to a lot of the document just directly to council rather than the broader public. So by going to the public first, you would be explaining things to council and the public at the same time, as opposed to explaining it to us and then at a public meeting, explaining it again to the public. That was the intent and not uh, having council kind of come up maybe with a list of ideas of things that they think the public would want. Like I've obviously made a bunch of assumptions of what's good policy and stuff too. And then we get out, we do all this work and we go out there and we hear this and that, and then council, you know, we're just doing more work, right? It was kind of the, the idea is to, to listen first. Have a, here's, here's what's been thrown out there. Let's hear what everybody thinks and then get into it. But if you want to start with that committee of the whole, we still end up having to do that anyway, is kind of my point. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go to Councillor Dubik and then I'll go to Councillor Lohead. Thank you. Uh, so I've actually just been kind of flip flopping throughout this whole conversation in terms of where I where I've been where I stand. Um, but you know what what I'd like to do is just go back to purpose. Um, so you know what's the purpose of this, um, and then talk about um, what's the best way to actually you know have it. Um, so if so if the intent and the purpose is to have a grounding of say you know best practices, a bit of the philosophy, the guiding principles, and then a walk through, like, you know, in terms like best principles around zoning, um, you know, our goals, etc. cetera, um, you know, learnings in terms of what's changing and then sort of a walk through. So it becomes more of a, a training slash walk through. Um, I would be fine then um, doing that if it is, if it is, if that would be both, uh, if, if that would be um, the way it would be presented to the public, public like having a, a first public um, venue um, so that then um, council and the public can ask questions of you um, to better understand, um, it, I, I would be fine with that. Okay, Manager Rapke. And that was the intent. Uh, thanks, Councillor Dubik. Um, it was a very long report, and I didn't get into the nitty gritties of the intent of the very first meeting, but that would be the idea. The first meeting is like an education, just general what's a zoning bylaw, what's the review, so on and so forth, which would be probably a couple hours and wouldn't necessarily even get into all of the change. I suspect there will be a couple questions about some major changes. And then a couple successive meetings, like maybe there's one per week for a couple weeks straight or something, or a couple per week for a couple weeks straight. So it gets condensed, you get a little bit of feedback, and then you can go into a, an early committee the whole even. Um, but that was kind of the idea. Like if everyone, council included, would just be able to see what's thrown out there and, and everybody gets their input just to kind of fast track things a little bit. But either way it works. Any follow-up? No. Okay, Councillor Lowhead. Well, thank you, Chair Allen. So I guess, uh, like Councillor Dubik, I've sort of I've been back and forth on on this. I think you know, um, speaking personally, I I know that I, as a new councillor, would certainly benefit from uh, some time in say a committee of the whole um, a meeting where we could have this kind of conversation before going to the public to help me really. Uh, grasp um, the complexities of this issue. And this is a, a big, you know, complex and important issue for, for Gray Highlands. But, you know, that said, if um, if we do want to go forward and have that type of meeting out in the open in the public, I think there's a lot of merit there too. So, um, you know, I think, but I, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going with that. I think well, <laughs> we can go ahead and just decide to do this or not do this. And it's either way is going to be fine. Okay, any other discussions? And the motion on the floor right now is to refer this to a committee of the whole meeting. Okay, I'm gonna call the vote. All those in favor of going to a committee of the whole. Okay, so one, two, that's four. It looks like that's gonna carry. Are those opposed? Okay. A recorded vote was requested by Mayor McQueen on the following motion, that this item be referred to a future committee of the whole meeting. We'll start with the person who requested the recorded vote, Mayor McQueen. Yes. 
You didn't have your mic on. Yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor Nielsen. Opposed. Uh, Councilor Wickens. In favor. Uh, Councilor Allwood. In favor. Councilor Dubik. Opposed. Councilor Lohead. In favor. And Chair Allen. Opposed. By a vote of four to three, that motion has been carried. Okay, thank you. Moving on, 11.8. The council approved bylaw 2023-036 being a bylaw to adopt the rules of procedure for the property standards appeal committee. Yeah, have somebody put that on the floor? Councillor Allwood. Anybody want it? Councillor Wickens, thank you. Any discussion? Mayor McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've only experienced one of these. Uh, I think it's two terms ago. I'm not sure if you were here, Councillor Allen, or, mm -hmm. and it was in regards to a property and uh, they had to comply with it. I think there was an extension of, of uh, compliance or, or moving some material or something like that, but it doesn't happen that often. But uh, anyway, you gotta have the mechanism in place to deal with it. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's carried. Okay, the next one is regarding the Old Baldy access. The council receive, council receive report PL 23.13 and the council waive the requirements of policy A09A01 related to naming this portion of road and the council approve. Okay, and sorry, uh, Councillor Dubik has declared a pecuniary interest in this, so she has stepped back from the table. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'll start that over. The council received report PL 23.13. And the council waived the requirements of policy A09A01 related to naming this portion of road. And the council approve a bylaw to deem part lot six, concession three, part one, plan 16R 11483, Euphrasia, Gray Highlands, as a public highway known as Old Baldy Access. Would somebody like to make a motion to put that on the floor? Councillor Lowhead, Councillor Wickens, thank you. <clears throat> Discussion. And this is, um, we had our open forum um, delegation this morning speaking on this item. So Mayor McQueen. Yeah, I was, it was hard to hear Volca, what she was trying to say. Did, did, did you get exactly what she was trying to say was, can you explain it to me? Because I wasn't quite sure what she was trying to say there, but. Cliff Martell. Uh, thank you. I think some of the inquiries that uh, Ms. Glazar was speaking about was why was there a need for um, deeming this as a public highway? And I think it's a little bit of a lack of understanding of what the deeming process for public highways is. Anything prior to January of 2003, um, and it was, if it was included in a plan of subdivision, it was already deemed a public highway um, under the Municipal Act. Because this property was only recently acquired by the municipality, it is deemed to be just a parcel of land that the municipality owns. In order for it to be a roadway and deemed a public roadway that the public has the right to um, travel on in vehicle, it has to be deemed as such under bylaw, which is why we're going through this process where we don't normally go through this process for other roads. It's because it was just a parcel of land. Thank you okay. for that explanation. Thank you. Any other discussion? Mayor McQueen. So there's a bit of a history with this. I know our, our Madam CEO is not here today to talk about this and, and the process that we have 
where we got to this point. Obviously, I have no issue with the Bruce Trail using that. And it's been used for quite a long time. And then there was a disruption a few years back over the, the particular road and who owned it and some issues that were going on with parking and stuff like that. So the municipality moved forward with uh, assuming the road and it's been plowed by the municipality for a long, long time. I think at one time we had thought we owned that strip of land. Actually, you said assumed the road, but again, it's not a road. No. Well, the, the, did, did, we, um, did we negotiate the purchase or did we um, expropriate? I believe we expropriated. Yeah. Um, I think we negotiated because that was our avenue was to expropriate, but okay. I, I know it, we, we covered the legal fees and I think we covered the legal fees on both parties on that okay. the, uh, one adjoining neighbor. Again, the CAO has, a, you know, this was quite a long file for a period of time uh, moving forward that um, because of the issue that all of a sudden no parking signs went up because it was private property and, and it, it does give access to the park a lot of old Baldy. And then there was, I remember there was discussion around something that was legal access from the, whenever that parking lot was created by uh, Grace Hobble Conservation Authority. Okay, so it was an expiration agreement. I guess maybe that was the easiest. And, but anyway, I know that it was negotiated to that point or there was discussions with the neighbor. Anyway, um, so it does give access through to that uh, parking lot. But I think when that parking lot was 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 granted or created, it was through that document that they had legal access to get to that parking lot through this lands. And I think it just by it made sense that the municipality take over that strip land or however expropriated whatever because of that. This this rolls into a lot of other discussions that uh, I know that. Uh, Roka has brought up before, and I know she brought up, and I went back and saw, uh, I guess it was December, the December 2nd meeting, I think it was December 21st, where she came as a, as a, as a, I don't know if she came as a delegation at that time, she's came a few times, or as a, as a, uh, speaking to items on the agenda, but at that meeting, and, and I went back to the um, motion that came out of that, is this, all of this discussion was to go back to a committee of the whole if needed. It was the way it was worded. And I did raise this to the CAO a few weeks back that I thought this was one of the items that was supposed to come back to the CAO was regards to the access to the parking lot. This is not really to do with that today, but I'm raising it because it was something that was raised that has sort of a relationship to this part of the access to that parking lot and, and that type of thing. So I'll maybe leave it that and raise it maybe in Councilor Pelvich's or whatever on that sense. But there is an issue here with regards to access and that. But anyway, this this was, but this part I'm okay with because the idea is just cleans it up and, and moves it forward and allows it as a public access. I think that was uh, uh, Volca, Ms. Geyser was talking about it in the sense that do we need to do this because it was access, but this there's a process and why it's here and this is why we're doing it. So this makes it uh, for, for sure a public access through deeming it. Okay, thank you. thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Lowhead. Thank you, Chair Allen. So I, I, I guess I, what I'm wondering is, uh, as it currently stands, if there's any sort of, <clears throat> uh, if there's any risk to, to leaving it, um, it's not deemed as a public highway. Um, in terms of like, um, I don't know, uh, litigation or, or maintenance, anything like say, you know, an accident were to happen, unlikely as it is on that small stretch of road, um, are we more open to some sort of lawsuit, et cetera? Um, I'm just wondering if there's, if we can somehow find an answer to a question like that and what the, what the benefit beyond cleaning up the language to the bylaw, what the benefit is to the municipality of Great Highlands to deem this a public highway? Okay, so do we, you're okay with that, yep. uh, Clerk Martel? Yep. Um, so when the agreement of purchase and sale went through for this property, the intent in the purchase of agreement and sale did state that the municipality was acquiring the lands to be added to our, our public as a public highway. So we are following along with the requirements of that, um, as well as um, following up with uh, this came about that we never actually did this. Usually it happens at the same time we do purchase the land. Um, 
it came about when the Bruce Trail asked about adding this location into their trail mapping, and we verified that the deeming bylaw uh, to deem it as a public highway was never completed. So that's kind of full circle how it came about, but the purchase and sale agreement does specifically say the purpose of acquisition was to deem it as a public highway of the municipality. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Alwood, did I see your hand? The clerk covered uh, the point I was going to make, okay. Mr. Chair. All right. Okay. Any other comments? Mayor McQueen, your microphone. Yes. You're just on the last uh, paragraph. Uh, my my question was around nine one one. Now it says your current the current property that fronts onto the road has a civic address number of 117 Old Baldy Access. As such, staff are recommending that the council waive the requirements of naming, renaming um, external municipal property, buildings, roads, whatever. I guess my point is if, if we're deeming it as a road, but we're not naming it, does the one the 117 Old Baldy Access is adequate for 911? I think we are naming it, we're just, Oh, well, not following the regular procedure and going to the public and things like that. So we're we just, are going to call it old, old Baldy access. Yes. That's what we're going to name it. Yeah. Okay. So then that does, so the 911 system, nobody will have to get included if it's not called the access road today, is it? Or is it called that? Because usually when there's a new name or a new road name, they have to redo that book and all that stuff, right? For ambulance purposes. Clerk Martel. Uh, thank you. So there's already iterations of Old Bali Access included in the 9-1 system on mapping, all of those kinds of things. We're asking that um, uh, instead of spending the time tracking down the history of when that happened, how it occurred, those kinds of things, because it's already listed as Old Baldy Access, that we not go through the policy that we have for our naming, renaming, and just have the bylaw that it, it deems it a public access, already deem it as a public access known as Old Baldy Access, because that's what it is known as. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that clarity. Okay, no further comments. All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. And just to follow up to that, Mr. Chair, I think it, somewhere there was some communication that because it's not up to municipal standard, it's, we're not required to bring it up to a certain municipal standard. It's, we're assuming it the way it, way it we're assuming. <laughs> yeah. I guess, there could be. I guess there could be a petition through any of our roads. You know, people could petition our roads to bring them up to municipal standard, but it's up to this body that would make that decision. Okay, moving on. Eleven point one zero proclamation <laughs> requests, foundation emergence. I don't know how good my French is. Request to proclaim May seventeenth as the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. And the recommended motion is that council hereby proclaim May 17th as the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia in Gray Highlands. Would anybody like to make a motion in that respect? Councillor Dubik and Deputy Mayor Nielsen. Any discussion? <coughs> okay, all those in favor? Oh, oh. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Councilor Chair. Dubik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just in the spirit of community and inclusion, um, you know, I'm just proud to, you know, be part of moving this forward. So thank you. Any other comments? Mayor? Okay, Councilor Wickens. Thank you, Chair Allen. Um, this is coming from a special interest group. I, I guess I you would say that I'm not keen on special interest groups because they they uh, polarize people, and if you're not with them, you are against them. And an issue like this, I am indifferent to it. I, uh, I don't care what other people do. Um, you know, 
uh, as long as they're not hurting anybody. Um, I'd sooner see, uh, I'd sooner see the town or the municipality have a day where it's just be kind. We, we don't need. How about 365 days? Absolutely, in perpetuity. Um, um, uh, this, this has kept me awake. Last night I was awake from, I would say 3.30 on till probably six o'clock thinking about this and, and how, how I would make my feelings known without everybody thinking that I am a homophobic, which I'm not. And if you do look up phobia, it's an extreme uh, reaction to something, uh, extreme fear. Just, I don't know. Um, it's very, it's not, I have trouble getting my true feelings out. And I don't want to come across that, uh, you know, as, um, these are personal decisions these people make. And, and sometimes I don't think they have any control over it. And I don't understand it. I don't, I don't pretend to understand it. You can't know somebody else's mind. Um, anyways, uh, that's all I have to say about that. Okay, thank you for that. Previous, I think, to, um, I'll come get to you, Deputy Mayor. Um, previous to, I think, last council, the municipality had a policy of not uh, making declarations. And um, it, um, I th think perhaps they would recognize events and um, days, but not actually make a declaration. And it was changed last term. Um, just for your information, Councillor Wickens. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Nielsen. Thank you very much, Chair Allen. Um, through you to Councillor Wickens. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. It is not an easy topic to try to politically balance a response. Um, to you, Chair Allen, last term when we were discussing a flag raising policy, Chair Allen was trying to um, do a similar thing by balancing the flag policy, making sure that um, we did not, we, we followed through with the human rights code as a municipality and that we honored what the human rights code is trying to share and express and develop and protect. And um, through that, this particular motion is trying to support um, a concept of that's really just kind of anti-hate. So um, to you, Chair or Councillor Wickens, you're right. Like somebody else, you don't know what's in somebody else's mind or anything like that. But the objective is to say that Grand Highlands is standing against hate for a not understanding. To, to, to have a phobia and a, a severe reaction is not necessary for people who are transgender or people who are homosexuals. And so that's what this is trying to do. And I think this kind of supports what the council did decided last term, which is to support the human rights code. And that really everybody's entitled to be their own person as long as they're not trying to hurt anybody else. That's kind of the objective, the be kind, the just be yourself and, and be comfortable in who you are. And you have a right to not be um, hated for just being yourself. So I think that's why I'm in support of the um, request today. Perhaps we should just be stating that, that we support the 
rights under the, um, um, what is it? Sorry, you mentioned uh, the human rights code. Um, so, but anyways, there's a motion on the floor. Is there any other discussion? Okay, all those in, oh, sorry. Deputy One Mayor. last quick question, Chair Allen. Um, do we, I, I don't know if I do, understand the difference between a proclamation or recognizing? Um, Clerk Martel, is there a difference in how the municipality would re respond to if the municipality, sorry, the municipality recognized a day versus a proclaiming a day? Clerk Martel? I don't know that there's any difference. Our, our proclamation policy um, references proclaiming um, and um, I don't know that it specifies any difference between recognition and proclaiming. Were you thinking of an amendment to recognize? Sorry, trying to click the unmute button. I was just trying to understand if there's a difference in how the municipality respond. Um, I would think by make by in both cases recognizing or proclaiming that the municipality will be having some kind of a communication go out uh, on this particular day through our social media or other avenues. Um, so if we recognize it, we'd probably just be doing the same um, objective. I know um, last year. We had requests to fly the transgender flag in the years past and, and um, the pride flag. So I would not be surprised if those requests came again this year and, and, and as part of that policy. So, yeah, I was just trying to understand if there's a difference, Chair Allen. Okay. Um, the clerk is going to, uh, she's looked up. Uh, thank you, through Chair Allen, to Deputy Mayor Nielsen. Um, I did pull up the uh, proclamation policy, and the scope of the policy says a proclamation is an official public announcement issued by the mayor or council to formally recognize. So I think uh, the difference is that a proclamation is a formal recognition. Mayor thank McQueen. you for that, Clerk Martel. Yeah, and I think your microphone. Good discussion here. I think the last sentence on the letter sort of says it all. Together, we create a country that fully accepts sexual and gender diversity. I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's, you know, what we're, we're accepting. And, you know, it's a, a free country and free to, you know, express all, you know, all that part of it. I think it's described in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. There, there's, a, there's a thing there that spells that out. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the proclamation spells it out that we recognize that. I think that's what you had said, Madam Clerk, the proclamation recognizes that this, this council recognizes. And I think the bottom line is, is what I just read at the last of that, that sentence that, uh, you know, the freedom of to do, to be whoever, whatever you want individually, right? So I know it's, I've seen a lot of changes in the last 25 years of how we've move forward in, in, in who we are as a country. And, uh, you know, you see other parts of the world where <laughs> they don't have half the rights that they have here in Canada. So, you know, it's, uh, but I, I think there is something maybe to be said, that, you know, is, is maybe what Council Wickens is, is saying is we're recognizing it, we're proclaiming it, it's up to individuals' rights, but then it comes to the point where you don't push those rights on to other people. Like you don't, like you, you keep, you know, it's, it's, everybody has rights and freedoms and i think this is recognizing those uh, rights and freedoms and, and and to what's being asked so it goes back to deputy mayor's comments about whether we proclaim or recognize recognize would just be at this council meeting we're recognizing that that day is is specifically set aside proclaiming it a public announcement goes out so the way it is right now, it's a proclamation. Did I see your hand go up, Councillor Dubin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so um, I don't have a specific comment on the proclamation or the recognition, um, but I, I did just want to um, 
And just to pause on a word that Councillor Wickens, you know, had mentioned about kindness. Um, and, and I think that's really um, uh, an important um, sort of word that he's put out there. And it's re it reminded me of the, uh, the town, I think it's the town of Blue Mountain that has the kindness award. And, you know, I just think like, I, I'm a big believer of um, borrowing and being inspired by, you know, other people's good ideas. Um, and, you know, I'll just sort of put the seed out there that, you know, maybe that's something that, you know, we can consider uh, for our own municipality is a, is a kindness award. So I'll leave it at, at that. So it's funny you say that because when I brought up that we didn't have a proclamation uh, policy prior to last term, I would, um, I would always vote against any kind of proclamation, um, even um, citizen of the year or senior of the year, because there are hundreds of seniors and hundreds of citizens that, that um, deserve recognition. Why single out one of them? Um, so I, I have a little bit of a problem <laughs> with, the, with that. And, um, but that's kind of a sidebar. Okay, we're gonna to go to the mayor again, and then we're gonna vote. I think that, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna say this very carefully because um, I think you look at action or different action, and sometimes action or an action that this council could take could speak the wrong meaning. I think by supporting this uh, moving forward, it, it, it sends a good message, but if we change this or receive it for information, I think inadvertently they could send the wrong message, which would be the wrong message. But I think it's something that uh, we have to be careful as a council and you know that I think it's important that we uh, don't send the wrong message. And I only say that wholeheartedly because I, I look around this table in our, our society that everybody wants to be kind to everyone. It's just, we, I think we have to be careful that we don't send the wrong message. And I think that's, that's, and I'm not saying that is what's going to happen, but I just think it's, it's important that we don't send the wrong message. I, uh, Councillor Wickens, I um, struggled with this a little bit too, because as I just said, I don't like to make proclamations. I don't like to pick one out of a hundred seniors, but then I got thinking whether it's, homophobia, transphobia, arachnophobia, or any phobia, we shouldn't be putting down or hating or disliking or anything, anybody, whether as you say, you can understand it or not, it is what it is. We shouldn't be putting people down. So, okay, are we, done so discussing. People are watching because I'm getting messages. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. We're ready for the vote. Okay. All those in favor. Okay. That was carried unanimously. Thank you. I heard this morning. Well, I'm going to pass the chair back to you. No, but just I... before you leave. Okay. All right. I want to speak to you as the chair. Okay. Is, uh, I heard this morning that April 28th is recognition day of a person killed on the job site which we just had a safety committee group here uh, our Greyhound and safety committee spoke here to just a, an hour ago and I think it's something that would would warrant a, rec a proclamation or a recognition of that day because um, every acts or every walks of life of our business and everything we do there's been a lot of people killed on the job site or at work People who haven't came home, you've seen the commercials, even in farm safety and farmers and different things. And that's maybe something I was thinking this morning when I heard that maybe that's something we should recognize as a council as well, just in the sense that those people that don't have their son, daughter, father, mother, whoever come home from work. And, you know, you can imagine, and I know Councillor Wickens, you worked in the construction industry. I, I, I'm not asking for your comments, but I know that. I think they said this morning there was a lot of close misses and a lot of situations, but there are those circumstances that do happen. And uh, 
something to think about. Okay, thank you for those comments. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I'll pass the chair back to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Chair Allen, on uh, that uh, section of the big part of our agenda with planning. <clears throat> so moving on to then section 12 of uh, building and I apologize for that planning and CLS. I, I wholeheartedly apologize for that. <laughs> Moving the day along, building and economic and community development. I'll be careful not to miss that one either. Is chaired by uh, Deputy Mayor Nielsen and there's a number of reports. So I'm gonna pass it over to you to share those uh, sections, section 12. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor McQueen. Section 12, item 12.1 is economic development advisory unapproved meeting minutes. Do I have a mover? And a seconder to receive those. Moved by Councillor Dubik. Seconded by Councillor Allwood. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments regarding the meeting minutes? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Approved. Moving on to item 12.2 is the Eugenia Vote Launch Year End Report. That council receives ECD 2305 and that Eugenia Boat Launch 2022 year end report for information and that council directs staff to renew the memorandum of understanding with the Eugenia District and uh, District Community Improvement Association for the operation of the Eugenia Boat Launch to December 31st, 2026. Do I have a mover? Mayor McQueen. Seconder. Councillor Allen. Thank you very much. Um, any questions or comments on the report? Mayor McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just wanna make the comments that, uh, uh, thanks for the report uh, with regards to, and then the, the few years prior to this year. And I just wanna thank uh, the individuals that do look after our boat launch area in Eugenia. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's one thing that uh, uh, looks after the interests of, of Great Highlands, creates an opportunity for our, some revenue. I know it's been tough for a few years in their uh, operational report there, but uh, I think we're we're indebted to this group to take on that and look after that for the uh, users of Lake Eugenia. So, so just thank a big you thank very you. much, Mayor McQueen. Oh. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor McQueen. Yeah, the Eugenia District Improvement Community Association does um, great work around the boat launch, and they've used profits in the past to upgrade that area of the municipality. Um, they've done some significant improvements to the swim platform, the swim area, as well as the boat launch dock. Um, and it's because of the volunteer work that we're able to have that continue moving forward. So thank you very much to them for sure. Any other questions or comments regarding this report? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? That is carried. Moving on to item 12.3. Uh, being that council approved bylaw 20, 2023 041, being a bylaw to amend the museum board terms of reference. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Mayor McQueen, seconded by Councillor Allwood. Questions or comments on this item? Seeing that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? That is carried. 12.4, that council approve uh, bylaw 23037, 2023-037, being a bylaw to amend bylaw 2022-103, 2022-2026, appointment bylaw. Looking for a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Dubik. Seconded by Councillor Allwood. Any questions or comments on item 12.4? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Moving on to 12.5, Maxwell Hall Board year end report. The council received ECD 2306 for information and the council directs staff to renew the memorandum of understanding with the Maxwell Community Center Board for the operation of the Maxwell Hall to December 31st, 2026. Looking for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Wickens will move. Councillor Lowhead second. Any questions or comments regarding this report? Seeing, oh, Councillor Wickens. Sorry about that, sir. 
Sorry, I'm way over here in the corner, waving my eyes. Um, I was at the uh, Maxwell Hall board meeting on Monday night and um, this document, or I guess this MOU will um, take effect whenever we, uh, I guess, verify it, if we do today. And it will end on the 31st of 2026. So that is, I guess, in conjunction with the council of the day will be, be done. There'll be a new term come up. They wondered, uh, I guess the, the MOU that they had expired and they went back for a new one. And the answer they got is we can't do it now because there's a new council coming. So they wanted to make sure that their MOU would be renewed, uh, you know, looked at again uh, before uh, the council of the day was um, done their term. So uh, do you know what I mean, Raylene? I, I, I see the look on your face. Thank you, Councillor Wickens. I think that'd probably be more of a question for Director Harris, Clerk Martel. Director Harris. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Council, and through the Chair to Council. Um, and I probably will defer to the clerk at one point, but the reason we had this through the term of council in the past, these used to be annual MOU, so we thought it makes sense to do the term of council. Our understanding is that one term of council cannot bind a future term of council, which is why we had this go to December yeah. 31st, 2026. Um, like this year, um, this what this MOU, we are, we're operating in good faith from now until this approval. So we're not anticipating any problems moving forward, but I take my guidance from Clerk Martell and I try to learn my lessons from her. So I am hoping I'm speaking correctly. Thank you very much, Director Harris. Councillor Wickens, does that help with your concerns or the Maxwell board concerns? No, that makes perfect sense. Uh, I don't think there's any more. I will take that back to them and tell them the one council cannot make the next council do things that they don't want to do. We can try our best, but there's no guarantees. <laughs> Clerk Martel, I see your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to clarify, it's not that the, the, the current term of council can't bind the hands of a next term because you, know, you all should be aware that you make decisions all the time that proceed into the future, um, but it shouldn't happen um, for the benefit of both parties. When it comes to something like this, uh, the current council should not make a decision that the next term of council could then overturn within the first couple of months. There's no continuity. There's no um, completion for that. So uh, generally, speaking when there's anything of the sort you generally try not to make decisions that should be in the hands of the person making or of the body that is in control of what those decisions should be um, in that term so um, yes Michelle was correct that they shouldn't bind make decisions that would bind the hands of council um, beyond what is actually required thank you very much Clerk Martel Councillor Lohat I saw your hand raised as well uh, thank you, Chair Nielsen. So I just wanted to <clears throat> a comment here. I know that during the, the budgeting process, I received some uh, questions from the public as to the you know, necessity and viability of um, small halls around Grey Highlands. And in particular, I did get question about the Maxwell Hall and whether or not it should remain open. And um, this report, I think, is just a, a great highlight as to why we maintain these halls and we keep them open. I mean, it's, uh, it was used in, like, over 200 times throughout the year, um, you know, the, the bowling alley, which is a, a real gem of a place. And if you, if you haven't been, I, I recommend you go. It is, uh, you know, it's neat. And there's so few of them remaining across Ontario. Um, it's still there and, and alive and well. And I mean, it's just a hub for the community, the small community of Maxwell and the seniors who live there. Um, so, you know, seeing this report, just uh, I, I found it delightful and um, really pleased to, to read it and see just how much uh, the hall is used and well loved. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Lowhead. Any other comments regarding the Maxwell Hall report? Seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor? That motion is carried. 
That was a very efficient section of the agenda. Thank you very much. Mayor McQueen, chair is yours again, sir. Well, th <clears throat> thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Nielsen, for chairing that portion. And we're into section 13, environmental services, and there's two reports. And I'm going to pass the chair, chairperson over, or chair, I can't say chairmanship because I don't know how they work. So the chairpersonship, I guess, over to uh, Council. How do you say that? Pass the chair. Yeah. Pass the chair. <laughs> pass the drink. I'll take the chair. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ma uh, Mayor McQueen. Um, so on the agenda, we are at 13 environmental services, 13.1, amending the Artemisia waste diversion site hours. Um, the motion reads that council received staff report ENV.23.05 regarding amending the Artemisia waste diversion site hours and that council maintain the current schedule of hours at the Artemisia waste diversion site. Um, do I have a mover? to put this on the floor. Councillor Lowhead and a seconder. Councillor Wickens. Um, so um, if you do take a look at the report, uh, just a little bit of background. This notice of motion was presented back in February of 2020 um, um, during that council uh, as there were some restructuring of departments. Um, it did get bounced around a little bit and it, it was reassigned to the new environmental services department to investigate. And so it's being brought forward now. Uh, when we do take a look at the current hours of the waste diversion sites um, across our three sites. So Markdale, Osprey and Artemisia, uh, we are open um, five days a week. The Artemisia is only open on Sundays from 10 to four. Um, if there is a, um, a desire to open up another for another day, there, there, you know, given the fact that we would be increasing services, um, there would be a financial impact. Um, there would need to be two, two attendants hired for this. Um, the uh, the envir environmental services team is running at capacity. Um, so the additional charge of opening up for another day uh, with two atten attendants would be twenty-six thousand uh, plus uh, a bin cover lid, additional four thousand to help um, just uh, maintain, and also consulting fees for the certificate of approval as another three thousand. So um, that would bring it to about thirty-three thousand um, dollars in terms of the financial impact uh, plus some additional charges for um, any transfers that would happen also additional transfers that would happen throughout the year. So opening the floor up for comments, questions. Oh, Councillor Allen. Thank you. I'm uh, disappointed in this report under the background it says that council directs staff to bring forward a schedule for landfill hours that would ensure that the artemisia waste diversion site is open on a day in addition to sunday and that's not what this report has done it has basically pointed out all the negative aspects to opening another day. Um, if you read, if you've read the report, there's one spot where it's saying about comments received in a survey, all the comments specific to Artemisia are negative on having it open just Sunday. There's a comment about the hazardous waste. Uh, I'm just trying to find that part. Mm. Basically, it's saying that if and when we get a hazardous waste depot, that it would confuse people as to what day they could drop things off. So by that, I'm assuming that the hazardous waste depot would be going into Artemisia site. And if that's the case, 
I don't think it's at all appropriate to have a hazardous waste depot only open on Sunday. Um, the Joint Waste and Diversion Site Committee, we had a meeting on Tuesday, Monday, Monday, and Councillor Dubek is now the chair of that committee. And there were comments from um, council member from Chatsworth wondering about whether we would be able to reduce the number of hours at the Holland um, site, the, the uh, Holland Chatsworth Markdale site because all of our waste now is being diverted. So there's not the trucks going in there on a daily basis, which I believe previously a reason for being open more days was partly because trucks were going in on a daily basis and they had to you know, compact and cover. Um, so if they had to do that, they might as well be open. So I think there's concern from Chatsworth that um, it's maybe four days is, is a bit much. Um, so that would open up opportunity to have another day at the Artemisia site. Um, I don't think Artemisia being open only Sunday is um, meeting the residents needs. I would, and lots of other people would rather see it open one other day than, than just Sunday. If we can't have two days, then at least change the day to a actual day that more people will use the site. Um, I think those are all my, oh, uh, Two or three or four weeks ago, we had our committee of the whole meeting on what we heard on the campaign trail. And one that many of us, maybe all of us heard was about the uh, tail wagging the dog. And I just feel that this is an example of that. We asked for a specific report and that report was not, in my opinion, carried through. Thank you. Do we have um, Director Moyer? Uh, hello, Director Moyer. Um, so th there were a few uh, sort of questions um, posed. Would you would you like to respond to that? Uh, yes, I guess. I'm not sure that question, or is it about the direction of the report? So I believe that council hires staff uh, to give our professional opinion on recommendations or questions that they have. So staff wrote this report. Uh, we took into consideration the hours that we are currently open at all our sites. We outlined the reasoning for our decision and we gave you our opinion on what we feel the hours are, how we feel the hours are currently. Council has the option to like further in the report, it outlines if there's another day we would recommend that day be, I believe it's a Wednesday or a Thursday when other sites are not open. And if council wants to pass that direction along, we will make that happen. And the financial implications with that are outlined in the report. Uh, so thank you. So, so yes, I do believe it is a, so the, the recommendation is um, if we would like to add another day, it is a Thursday. Um, and the, and the um, additional expenses have been laid out 
to, to move to another, to add an additional day. Um, there was also um, the thought of, you know, would we, would it be possible to, so Markdale has, is open four days a week. Um, is there, you know, based on volumes and usage that you're, that um, the environmental services team is seeing, um, is there a case to maybe be made where maybe one of those days um, gets, instead of being, you know, maybe make Markdale open three days a week and make Artemisia day, you know, add that extra day over to Artemisia um, based on volumes sort of um, that we're seeing, do you have maybe a sense of that at this point? So Director based, Moyer? Based on my short uh, tenure in the waste and diversion side, uh, the both Artemisia and Osprey sites are transfer sites only. We don't accept trailer loads or large bulky items. Uh, so I believe the reasoning for having Markdale open is for mainly contractors and people that are doing work and have the larger loads and items that come in. Uh, the items all get disposed of in Markdale and buried if that's where they're going. So the idea of having Markdale open the most days is so that that large waste that is coming in from contractors that are working throughout the week and such have that opportunity to take it right to the site uh, where it is disposed of. And then by having Osprey and Artemisia as the transfer sites and allowing bagged waste uh, to come in there is for residents that uh, work during the week uh, or they have a cottage up here and are going home. So I thought the, the idea of having Artemisia open on the Sunday is that if people were returning to the city and uh, were heading south anyways, uh, if they wanted to pass by that site, that it's open and they can dispose of their waste on the way home. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, we did have that discussion at our joint waste uh, meeting uh, on Monday as the ex official I sat in on that meeting. I think looking at the comments and certainly as we went through an election pro, uh, cycle, there was a lot of comments with regards to the Artemisia site uh, only open on the Sunday. And I know of one of the comments uh, with regards to a certain community group uh, not having access to that site uh, any other day than, than a Sunday and Highway 10 and, and our Markdale site is a, a very busy road and it's always it's that feeling that could there be another day uh, for the Artemisia site to be open? I think that's sort of the what brought it forward to start with is to look at a different day. And I and I certainly agree with the director that I think there was a little bit of a shift <coughs> because originally when we changed these days, everybody wants Saturday, <laughs> but we just can't do Saturdays everywhere. And so it was decided that that uh, Markdale would be open Saturday, Austria would be open Saturday, and, and Artemisia would open Sunday. So then it does give that opportunity for uh, weekend or, or people that have time on, on the weekend to, to, to attend a site. Mm -hmm. um, so we sort of we sort of sort of met that objective, but it is, you know, it does repeatedly come up about the, you know, uh, a certain community group that um, maybe not use the Artemisia site on a, on a Sunday and is somewhat um, somewhat maybe problematic um, on Highway 10 and, and from that community group and, and their, their means of transportation. I'm trying to be very <laughs> neutral here on how I say this, but it, it, you know, it has been came up very a few times. So um, I, I wonder to you, Mr. Madam Chair, is could we get some data? And remember, data drives a lot of stuff. Could we get data? Maybe this is a, an amendment to this report, or, or, or could we have a report come back to give us some data on the traffic that does uh, attend this, the Mark Dill site on those four days and to see if it is possible that maybe one of those days could be reduced to three and, and maybe switch the staff. I don't know through our budget process. Like, I mean, we just went through a, 
a budget, <laughs> you know, and, you know, as I think Deputy Mayor said, we're going to have a challenge next year as well. So we have to sort of be conscientious. But I wonder through you, uh, Madam Chair, if I move a motion that we get some data um, on the volume, current volume of traffic through the Mark Dill site now on the current days that are open. It was pointed out as Councillor Allen has said that uh, a lot of our, well, all of our uh, curbside uh, material is now being shipped off site, like it's going out of the municipality. So I, I think to, to be fair, I think it would be nice to see that data and, and get some feedback on that and, and then, you know, bring that back. And, I'll, and maybe part of that is, is, is there a possibility of, of, of changing those days to one day with the, with the recommendation, what would be the best day that would be, um, could be provided to the Artemisia site and, and sort of let staff come back with that information. And, and that as far as the, um, the uh, maybe I better stop there to, to craft this motion for the chair or for the, to the clerk, Madam Clerk, did you capture what I sort of put together? Oh. The diversion site in Markdale, or how do you want to capture that? I don't know. Well, at the Markdale site, yeah, because it's open the four days. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll move that for now. I got another comment, but I'll wait to if I get a seconder for this. Uh... No, this is for the amendment. For the amendment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that the main motion be amended to add the following clause, that staff be directed to provide data on the daily attendance counts at the Markdale diversion sites. And that would mean that this report would be received for information and that that would be a following information to come forward, right? Uh, Right, okay, yeah. seek a seconder for that, Madam Chair. Um, do we have a seconder for that motion? Uh, Councillor Wickens? Uh, it's open for discussion. Councillor Allen? So the second clause here is going to stay, the council maintain the current schedule. Um, so, I think at this time we, yeah. that would stay. Um, then, as we receive the data, yeah. um, then we can make you know we can have a further discussion after we receive the data. And sorry, could I also have a response to my? I guess I maybe didn't. <coughs> say it was a, a, as a question, but the hazardous waste comments um, is the plan to have hazardous waste um, at the Artemisia site and on Sundays. Uh, Director Moyer. Uh, through you, Chair, there will be a report coming, I believe it's scheduled for one of the next council meetings about the has-been. Uh, so as we move through the process, the municipality has our, two of our own sites. So what staff would be recommending is uh, that the bin, we would uh, change both of our C of A's and PDO's for our two sites, both transfer sites that are open on the weekends. So we're, our thoughts were on that, that if the residents uh, were able to come on weekends with their hazardous waste, that we would have it located and be able to, to move it from Artemisia and Osprey uh, to Osprey uh, on a quarterly basis and then have it open uh, one to two days a month, I think is what we're thinking right now. Um, any follow-up, Councillor Allen? So then <clears throat> there's the one paragraph saying opening hours are outlined in the certificate of approval to open the site on another day an amendment to the c of a is required and this would open up the whole c of a but if we're going to open it up for the hazardous waste then 
we could do another day at the same time, which if it's gonna result in a new requirements, it would be triggered regarding the hazardous waste anyways. Thank you. Uh, Director Mori, do you have any um, comments for that? No, that's correct. If we're opening it up for one thing, we can amend whatever we want. Uh, I think the comment in the report was more around just ensuring that like if we open it on the Saturday or the Sunday, sorry, and the bins there and somebody comes in with hazardous waste, if it's open another day, there's a chance like we're, we don't have enough staff to have the has been open every time that uh, the site's open. So just to try and eliminate or make sure there's no confusion on whether it's open or not. Uh, was what the comment that was in the report was about. Okay, thank you. Um, any follow up? No, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you had your hand up. Thank you very much, Chair Dubik. Um, a question through you, um, Mayor McQueen's amendment is asking for some data to help drive the decision here, which I appreciate. Um, I'm wondering if we want to put um a timeline on that data collection um i wouldn't want to do a small sample size i'd want to do large enough sample size to give time to drive the data just my reasoning being unfortunately with changes that we had in staff this particular motion um kind of got put on on the back burner for a bit there and i wouldn't want to see it be another 18 months before the data comes back we revisit this decision Okay, thank you. Um, Director Moyer, um, so just a question. Um, in terms of receiving data, um, is that something that you feel the, you know, the team at the site can manage easily? And, you know, what's, what's the, um, maybe um, how, I mean, so we we will, I guess, council will 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 make a determination in terms of timeline. But um, is there maybe a timeline that you would feel that you can gather a substantial amount of data based on uh, based on your uh, based on the team there? Through you, chair, I guess it really depends on what data we're looking for. If we're just looking for number of people coming through, we do have way scale tickets and, and stuff that we could uh, get just some raw numbers, if that's what we're looking for, of number of residents going across the scale. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, maybe a little bit of clarity and thanks for, from the director on the comment. I guess data would be something that came out of our meeting on Monday was um, uh, obviously before we uh, diverted our curbside material there was probably more work done at the site and what how is that how has that changed and maybe it hasn't changed that much i i don't know i you know it was suggested and i think councillor allen sort of pointed that out that was raised at that and that meeting obviously there won't be the covering of of that material coming in i and it, it, yes uh the data that's coming across i guess it's sort of the data in the sense the daily operations and the and the daily material and and you know ultimately I'm, I'm you know i'm quite supportive of finding an extra day at artemisia and 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 i guess i'm trying to see if the data can support us you know moving from four days to three days and give that extra day to artemisia and trying to balance without having to to, to go to the extra cost other than the bin transfer obviously that's something else i'm just trying to see if, if there's a way to make it work without having to spend a lot more money in. And, and the one thing, again, was pointed out was obviously where the curbside material is going somewhere else. So, which is a good thing, right? That's, that's one of the things that came out of the positive things that came out of the uh, out of that contract. So, you know, it's sort of the data that could, you know, could it revert back to three days a week and, and does, you know, or, or like, you know, maybe you're, 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 maybe it's part of your data that your way tickets are like it's it's booked from like nine in the morning to five o'clock and there's a lineup every day like that 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 tells you something right mm -hmm. or you know could those four days be rolled into three and and obviously it's a saturday friday monday and a tuesday you know and maybe it from that data <clears throat> you know 
uh, it, it shows that there's a certain lull day. Maybe there's a day that it's only half the volume comes in that day. I don't know. I can't, I can't surmise. And I, I guess, you know, sometimes information's in numbers, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's, it's looking at, is there a way, you know, from the data, you know, that's there. And, and, and I think this is, this, this is coming from staff. It's not us making the decision, but it's sort of something that, you know, is there other ways to achieve what we want to do, but through a way that through, you know, working through the system and, and trying to make it, make it work. So, and I think, you know, going back to what Councillor Allen said, it was sort of something that we have heard and, and comments here that, you know, there is a real desire to have an extra day at Artemisia. So just looking at ways of, if there is there a way to make it work without Great. having to hire an extra day in staff. Right, so, so thank you for that, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, so based on uh, the, um, the deputy mayor's comment and um, amendment. So we do have an amendment to the amendment that the amendment be amended by adding the data be collected during and a timeline. Um, would it? So I, I'm going to throw out a, a timeline here. Um, let's get some more reaction. Would four weeks be adequate um, to to receive uh, the data? Would that provide enough, maybe, um, information to be able to form, to start form a decision? You know, also understanding that there could be some seasonality to, you know, to, you know, the waste, you know, waste, uh, the waste sites. Um, you know, that's always going to be a challenge. Um, so I'll I'll put it out there. And uh, does anybody have any thoughts, Councillor Allen? Thank you. Yeah, season does make a difference, but I think because of the uh, reporting that we have to do, I think there's probably information that we would have already from the number of uh, people coming in because we have to know whether they're from Gray Highlands or Chatsworth. So there's got to be some tracking mechanism for that. So I kind of think we would be able to pull up information for you know, the last year, even. Director Moyer, uh, would you be able to comment on that? Do you, does your team have um, data sort of at its, you know, already available that we could make an assessment? Yes, like I, I mentioned before, like we have way tickets of people as they cross the scale and who comes in and out of the site. Uh, so that's tracked. I don't think we have it summarized in like daily reports or anything but if it's the wish of this group or council that we come back with that information then we can summarize that and bring it back okay so is is that a reasonable request um director moyer i'm not sure what the request is i guess what to, like, to, to for the to, last to year or <laughs> point of order i think it was time frame could it come back by yeah. the second maybe the second meeting in may would that work that's that's still a bit over a month right because we're at the first meeting of april end of april first of may in may or maybe the first meeting in june i yeah i right sorry that's just point of order. Mm. um so if we're going back and using the old data that's already collected we should probably remove the daily attendance counts and just provide that we're giving data. It's one thing to start from scratch to get daily attendance counts, but it's my understanding that they don't have like daily attendance counts and that would be a lot of work to kind of coordinate all of that, but just that you they provide data of a time period. Does that make sense? I think so, uh, Mr. Mayor. Well, I think it's data of, of how busy our business is, but there's also, daily duties of the people on site so if there's you know i think it's sitting there there is two site attendants an operator who is covering or bearing and then there's a site superintendent that that attends and and moves around Mm -hmm. so i guess my question is if if we don't have the curbside material coming in five days a week from our own curbside does that free up some time to do other duties does that does that all of a sudden become a three-day versus a four-day job that's that's the type of data it's also it's also in it's also staff duties as well 
because obviously Sorry. Through you, Chair, and, then, and then we'll. So, 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 one moment, one moment, uh, Director Moyer. So, well, we'll obviously, if, if we're having our curbside material, and up until the end of December 2022, there was cover material having to deal with our curbside. Mm -hmm. That takes a body doing that. If that's no longer happening, what's changed? And so, obviously, when you have material come in, you have to cover it in a certain time, which then would certainly, I understand. And I don't know all the details I, you know, there, but obviously if you have five days a week of, 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 uh, of um, Wilton not coming in, obviously there's less business going on to our, our landfill, right? There's less people coming in. So does that free up individual time for somebody else? It's obviously that an individual is not doing that job, covering that material anymore and directing and where it goes. And I don't know how many times a truck would come in and stuff like that and all that stuff so it's it's not just material coming in and how busy they are at the gate but how busy they are in the overall site as well right so yeah. you know the, the objective here is is it able to free it up from four days to three days and add an extra day at Artemisia so okay so uh, thank you Mr. Mayor um Director Moyer uh, could you respond to that so I think I don't know it sounds like we're getting things slightly confused here so there's two types of operations there's when the site is open there's attendance needed to bring the public in and direct them and have them dispose of their stuff in the proper manner uh, when the curbside collection material is collected it's brought in in one truck it's, it doesn't take attendance to send that truck to the top of the hill and deal with it uh, so when the site's open the attendants are there to direct the public and ensure that the materials are the proper materials being brought in and get disposed of properly. Uh, the curbside material, the attendants don't do anything with, that's on the operation side of things. Uh, so like the mayor did mention, we have one operator and uh, team leader that's on and take care of all three of our sites and their duties are spread out and assigned as needed throughout all of our sites. Uh, the Markdale hours, will be adjusted now that we're not bringing in the same amount of curbside material, which is aside from this report and having the site open, but there's other stuff that we have them working on like hazardous waste and other diversion materials and uh, other projects. So I think, I guess where my confusion here is, is we're kind of confusing the two things. So if we want site data, that's one thing, but if we want to start tracking which operators and the operations hours at Markdale that we're, we're digging deep into the operational side of our waste and diversion department. Okay, and just, um, I, I do wanna confirm what I've heard. So given the fact that um, we're using waste management and our curbside um, disposal is, is, our curbside is being disposed elsewhere, that doesn't necessarily free up a lot of time of the attendance at the at the at the sites. Correct. The curbside material is separate. The attendants don't deal with it at the sites. And the attendants are who keep the sites open through the weekend on the weekends. Okay, thank you. Uh, follow up, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so I guess the thing is, is from the data coming in there, I guess the question is from the site attendance, can it be switched from four days to three days? It mentions about priorities on the site. I think in my mind, Artemisia on a second day is a high priority in my mind. Obviously there's other priorities that are on site as well, but um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Um, Deputy Mayor, you've had your hand up. Thank you very much, Chair Dubik. Um, it's worked in my favor. I've gotten to hear some extra um, thoughts from from staff as well as council members. Um, the question here that Mayor McQueen is trying to get to is whether or not Markdale site hours could be changed. It sounds like at the Joint Waste Diversion Site meeting, Chatsworth was curious about that too, as I'm sure um, if we'd make changes to the hours of operation at the Markdale site, it does make changes to Chatsworth's residence as well. Um, and that are there is some feeling around the council table that we need to make an adjustment to the Artemisia site. 
So I'm wondering if, given what Director Moyer just said, which is that staff are already looking at hours of operation and questions around hazardous waste and other things that are happening, and that the hazardous waste will be at sites other than the joint site to prevent so that it will be just for our residents. Is it better to have a motion that says that we direct staff to move forward with adjusting the hours of operation at the Artemisia site and that staff review the needs at the Markdale site, the needed hours of operation at the Markdale site? Um, that's kind of where I'm going. There's there's an amendment on the floor, so I can't change anything now, but that's kind of where my thoughts are headed. Okay, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So Raylene is, I think, putting an amendment together. Uh, Councillor Allwood. Yes. Uh, Chair Dubik, sounds to me like uh, while the clerk is putting together uh, the wording on the amendment, the, the issue at the Markdale side is there are up to four people there, um, two of which are attendants and two of which are dealing with cover material and supervisory duties. So the intent of council seems to be they'd like to get the Artemisia site open an extra day. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of could we close the Markdale site for one of those four days is open now, or could we simply reallocate some staff uh, and still keep it open four days and have two people down at the Artemisia site on another day and not incur the staffing costs? We still have some additional costs, but that, that seems to be I, um, just I'm getting out of this conversation anyways. And uh, we would we, we just need some data on staff allocation and, and the amount of uh, waste is being brought in now that the curbside is being re-diverted. Thank you. Yes, uh, so thank you, yes. So, so I, and I think what we're hearing is, um, you know, it seems, so, so maybe we, we pose the question a little bit differently back um, to the environmental services team um, in terms of, you know, how we think about, um, you know, having the goal of opening the Artemisia site for one more day um, you know, with the current resources that we do have and, um, you know, maybe then juggling or cut, you know, cutting back a day from, from the Markdale site to make that happen. <laughs> no, I know I'm, I'm, I'm really, were, were you, um, uh, providing an amendment? Ah, here it is. Fantastic. Okay. Um, okay, that the amendment be amended by changing to provide data on the daily attendance counts to available site data at the Markdale diversion site in order to determine whether a day swap between Markdale and Artemisia could be warranted, which would mean that a final would be, okay, so this is the final one. The council receives staff report ENV.23.05 regarding amending the Artemisia WDS hours and that council maintain the current schedule of hours at the Artemisia uh, waste diversion site and that staff be directed to provide available site data at the Markdale diversion site in order to determine whether a day swap between Markdale and Artemisia could be warranted. I think I'm seeing a few nodding heads, which is okay. So if I can just clarify, I provided the final because I think we're getting lost in the fact that there is a main motion and an amendment, an amendment to the amendment, all that kind of stuff. And what we really need to do is flesh out at the end of the day, what do you want to happen here? And then if we find that out, I can give you the requirements of how to get there with the amendments, the amendments. But I think uh, as long as the mover of the amendment to make it happen is aware of what he's hoping to accomplish at the end of the day, yes. then we can get there. Okay. Um, no, 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 I think, so Mr. Mayor, I believe you were the original. 
mover. Um, okay, and the seconder of that was. Do we have this to? New, this oh, this is, is the new one. To the amendment. Okay, so sorry, we're layering here. Okay, so we do have an amendment to the amendment. Okay, so um, Mr. Mayor, you're moving that. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Wickens. Great. Um, so we will take that to oh, open for discussion. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll take that to a vote. Those in favor? Okay, so that is carried. The amendment as amended. Okay, so that the amendment as amended by changing to provide data on the daily attendance counts to available site data at the Markdale diversion site in order to determine whether a day swap between Markdale and Artemisia could be warranted. And so we vote on that. All right, so those in favor. Okay, that is carried. Now, the main motion as amended that Council receive staff report ENV.23.05 regarding amending the Artemisia waste diversion site hours, and that Council maintain the current schedule of hours at the Artemisia waste diversion site, and that staff be directed to provide available site data at the Markdale diversion site in order to determine whether a day swap between Markdale and Artemisia could be warranted. Mr. Mayor, yeah. Question. Oh, question. Okay. Mike, so a couple things. Yes. There's a couple things were one. Um, yeah, I think it's. Uh, it, uh, I'm okay with how it's moving forward. Number two is it was mentioned in the report about um, the extra cost of bins, right? And at one time, a few years back, we were going to investigate. We own the bins, as I understand, unless they're I'm pretty sure we own the bins. Uh, but we pay for the haulage of the bins. At one time, we were going to go out and, 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 and do a report to see if it would justify us having your own vehicle to move those bins. I know we pay quite a bit of money, mm -hmm. but if, if, if we do go to an extra day of uh, El Vardamija, then it may come back that we need to look at that again. If possible, because we're, we're, it's an extra day of business, right? I'm just sort of pat, put that out there. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. I'm not saying anything, but but I think it's good for information because that is something in the past. And number three, um, you as the chair of the Joint Waste uh, Committee for the Markdale site, trying to think when that next meeting, because this might be good information to come back there as well, mm -hmm. because it was raised there. And I think that's in May. I think that next meeting is in May, is it not? June. Oh, June, June think, but it's yeah. early June. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I just think it's it's something that if it comes back with the information, it, it's also something that has to go to the joint meeting as well, because we're, yeah. we're, it, we have, uh, well, we're with Chatsworth on that as well. So there'd have to be some conversation there as well. Yes. So just, this is just for information. Yep. No, no, appreciate that. And, and points are taken. Thank you. Um, so now that we have the um, that final motion on the floor, so we need a mover. No, we don't. We need to. We just need to vote. All right. Uh, so those in favor. Um, so that is unanimous. So it is carried. Okay. I think we can move on. <laughs> We are, are so um, on the agenda, we are at 13.2 draft backflow prevention and the cross connection control bylaw. Uh, the motion is that council receives the staff report ENV.23.06 regarding the introduction of the new backflow prevention and cross connection control bylaw and that council directs staff to bring the bylaw forward to the next council meeting for consideration. Do I have a mover? Uh, Councillor Wickens and a seconder, Councillor Lowhead. Um, so you do have the report. Um, so it is the floor is open for discussion or questions. Going to make me go first again. Okay, uh, Councillor Allen. <laughs> I hate to keep picking on our director of environmental services, but 
The only part I don't like is the fact that the owner needs to have a test by a qualified person annually. And if that's a requirement, you can be sure that it's not going to be a $35 fee for somebody to walk in and, you know, do some little thing and walk out. It's going to be three or four or 500 flat rate because they've got special training. So I'm just thinking that I understand the needy need, the need, sorry, for testing and also the need to just make sure it's still physically in place. But if it's that important, is there a way of installing this on the municipal side? <coughs> I know that would mean it being buried at least four feet to keep it from freezing. But um, I, I just worry about one more cost to um, people, especially if you think of um, multi-residential units where there's more than perhaps more than one connection. So those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, Director Moyer, would you, would you have a response to that? Yep, through you, the chair. So this uh, is all part of the CSA standard and is already in the building code and has been for years. This bylaw just basically allows the municipality to get reporting on that. Uh, we currently, it's in our water use bylaw already that they have these devices. Uh, there's just no mechanism for them to report it to us and for us to be aware that it's actually happening and have uh, any sort of insight to the system. So all this equipment, uh, any business that's been plumbed and done properly uh, already has all these devices in and they're already testing them. We just don't get that reporting back to us as a the water purveyor uh, with a bylaw like what is written. Most other municipalities have these uh, and uh, it would just give us basically the opportunity to see the certificates that are already happening. Uh, thank you, Director Moyer. And, and just for clarification, um, is there a financial impact? Is there any additional costs that would that would be incurred? Uh, as outlined in the report, like there would be some uh, reporting costs. I'd like to get the report sent to us. And then there's the opportunity for council, uh, I believe, to set uh, in the bylaw uh, a fee for like a contractor. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? So the like a registration. So we would have a list of contractors that are able to do this, and to be on that list, there might be fees for them, uh, so that the users of the system, if they couldn't find somebody to do it, they could go to that list and then have them do the testing. Um, any follow-up? Well, my concern isn't that, I understand that these are already in place. My concern is the fact that homeowners are going to have to have this inspected yearly, okay? The director is shaking his head, so perhaps. Sorry, uh, just to jump in there. Uh, this is only for like ICNI. This is not for residential. Well, industrial commercial. I just need to find this. So it says the municipal. Um, where the municipal water service account for the property identifies it as institutional, commercial, industrial, or any combination of the foregoing, or the property has one or more dwelling units located thereon. So one or more to me is a residential unit. If I'm wrong, then I'm glad I'm wrong in this case. Uh, Director Moyer? Sorry, the intent is only for uh, the ICNI thing. Uh, so the, the whole residential is more if there's a separate connection on there to like something like a, a sprinkler system or something that could put our system in danger, then if we found out uh, or if 
in some other places in Ontario, uh, there's other there's residents that have wells that have their own private well for a different use. If we find that that's connected to our system, then in that case, it would have to have a, a backflow preventer in and tested. Uh, but the the main crux of this is for the ICNI and ensuring the safety of our municipal drinking water system. Any follow up? So then item 5.12, which is on page six of 11. So where it says the property has one or more dwelling units, is that one or more dwelling units in a commercial or industrial or institutional building? I just think if, if it's not residential, I think it, it needs to be a little clearer in the bylaw, that's all. But again, I'm glad I'm wrong. No, I think you're correct. We'll look at that and just ensure, but the intent, intent of the bylaw is, is for the industrial commercial, uh, unless there's a cross connection that's identified for that property. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like we may need, need to just tweak the wording there. Um, any further discussion, Mr. Mayor? So good discussion. Um, so for example, if a homeowner is filling up a large pool <clears throat> with a hose and all of a sudden the system goes down and all of a sudden there's a, a, a vacuum created in the, the water system, the whole idea is having the, the check valve or whatever from sucking the water back out of the pool into the system. But is that a possibility that could happen, Sean? Is that something that, you know what I mean? Like, so you fill in the pool up, it's a large pool, the hose is in there, but it, you know, it ends up being like a vacuum system. All of a sudden the system goes down or something happens. It sucks the water back out of the pool. That's the whole idea of having, having, a, having this in, uh, device in place that you don't get contamination back into your your system itself but is that a possibility that could happen even on a residential side uh, director moyer uh through you the chair so i mean that's always uh uh risk i guess uh the plumbing code which i don't know off the back of my hand but it does require outside taps to have vacuum breakers on them uh, the vacuum breaker in that case would not allow water to be sucked back through the system this type of backflow preventer is mainly to prevent our municipal system from like industrial commercial where they have pumps, they have chemical systems, they have even in like a car wash, they have a pressurized pump for soap that if that pump kicks on and overpressurizes our municipal system that that water or chemicals don't get back into our system to contaminate. Follow up? No. I just say that, that that's important to know that information and and uh, and that I just know even on a well system on a farm, if you don't if you're filling up a water trough or something and you don't have a backflow prevent it, it can suck the water out of your water trough if the hydro goes off, it sucks it back into your house. So I understand that it can happen through a pool or something like that as well. But uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, further discussion? Okay, um, so we'll take that to a vote. Those in favor? Okay, that is carried. Um, that is the end of uh, my session and uh, back to you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Dubik, on looking after that stuff. I know uh, uh, Chair Allwood is just itching to get at the finance, but I'm suggesting maybe we take a bit of a break. <laughs> And do you want a 10 or a 15? <laughs> okay, we'll come back at five to four. I'm going to get my math, my clock right. So I'm not going to say 355. I'm going to say five to four. <laughs>
Are we back? Okay, welcome back everyone. And uh, sorry, I just want to keep things moving along here because uh, we still have a bit of business to do here. So uh, item 14, this is uh, finance, uh, and I'm going to pass the, uh, the uh, chairmanship over to uh, Councillor Alden. Thank you, Worship. Uh, finance and uh, the first item on the agenda then in finance 14.1 would be the fleet management program. And the uh, resolution is that council receive report FIN 2304 fleet management program for information and the council authorize the collaborative purchase award of a corporate leased ownership maintenance and management program to the enterprise fleet management leasing program and that council authorize a five year transition plan for procurement and disposal of light fleet vehicles and that council authorize staff to proceed with year one procurement of five light vehicles and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to enter in to necessary agreements. Would somebody like to move that? To get it on the table, moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Dubik. Questions or discussions? Councillor Wickens. Now, I, I know we had a presentation there back about a month ago or so. I, uh, I realize these people are in, in it to make money as well. I, uh, he, uh, he was very good to point out all the plus sides, but when, uh, it came time to say, well, you know, I believe it was Councillor Allen. Well, where do you make your money? So like that wasn't even part of his presentation until it was asked. So I, I just question some of this stuff to me looks too good to be true, honestly. Um, <clears throat> that's. Well, I mean, yeah. it is a program that's uh, recommended by AMO and the uh, part of the LAS program um they are in business i would expect that they're making money somehow yes, but at yeah. the end of the day the 10-year savings for the municipality is significant it's over five hundred thousand dollars and uh, we wind up with a reliable fleet of vehicles on the road uh for our staff and residents and uh save the ratepayers some money but uh I'll uh, stop talking there and uh, go ahead. Sorry, any follow up to that, Councilor Wickens? Mr. Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know Councilor Lohead has a question too. Just on the last page of the report, it talks about as fleet are replaced, electric vehicles and hybrid options will be considered. And I think that's good. I also know that, uh, you know, V6s are something that I think should be considered as well. I, talked to one of our staff that is driving one of the V6 uh, trucks and said, it's working fine. It is better on fuel and it's, it does the job that that particular vehicle needs to do. So I just think that uh, is something to also consider because, you know, there's certain maybe v eight for towing vehicle or something like that, but V6 is something if it works, I'll, I'll leave that up to the direction of staff. But I think it's important that we do try to get the most fuel efficient system that we can because the price of fuel and hybrid and uh, carbon tax and everything it's it, it does we do see that cost going up in the sense of our our budget itself so i just want to make that point that the v6 that we seem to have in our fleet does seem to work very well thank you for that now, my recollection of the presentation was that you know they'd be managing uh, along with our staff uh, the requirements and making recommendations based on cost effectiveness mm -hmm. Obviously, at some point, the transition to hybrid and electric vehicles, but uh, at, at the end of the day, you, you and, and it was a concern during the budget process, as I recall, about the number of vehicles we, uh, we currently buy and pay for up front, uh, the length of time they're on the road and the reliability of that. Uh, but uh, yes, it, it's, it's, it's a good thing that uh, that last page does mention the uh, electric and hybrid options being considered. Any other questions or go ahead, Councilor sure. Lohead. Thank you, Chair Ollett. So the, after the presentation, the time of the presentation, um, I had asked about 
sorry, what? I, that's all. I'm sorry, I'm just too far, I suppose. No, it's not on. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so at the time of the presentation, I had asked uh, about um, the uh, experience of our neighboring municipalities um, with this program, of which there are a few. So Meaford, uh, South Bruce, uh, Blue Mountains, Clearview, uh, Orangeville. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, we don't really need to speculate as to whether or not this is going to be effective and save us money. We could simply reach out to these municipalities and who've had years now of experience with this program and find out um, an actual data on whether or not it works and, and feelings from the staff. And so I'm wondering if um, before we accept this recommendation, if we can hear as to whether or not we've we've heard, we've reached out to those municipalities and we have any idea of, the, of their experience with this program. Thank you for that. I'm not sure if our treasurer is currently available. There she is. Treasurer McCarthy, any comments on Councillor Lowhead's uh, comments? Uh, yes, good afternoon uh, through you, Councillor Lowhead. Um, it is something that uh, we have had conversations with our neighboring municipalities. Um, I know I've reached out from the finance perspective, but also transportation, and even I think our fire department has had conversations with staff to get different perspectives. Um, and we haven't heard any uh, anything alarming or uh, any reason why we shouldn't be entering into this program. Um, I guess I would like to acknowledge Councillor Wicken's comment as well. Um, I thought it seemed too good to be true as well at first. It seemed like a lot of um, just win-win situations, I guess. But um, upon further uh, investigation and again, talking with our neighbours, it seems like it really is a, a good program that will benefit us in, in many ways. Thank you, Treasurer McCarthy. Any follow-up, uh, Councillor Lohead? I mean, it's it's nice to hear that there's we didn't hear anything alarming from our neighboring municipalities, but I suppose I I would like to see, and I imagine the rest of council might like to see some of the the you know promising data if possible. I, you know, I'd I'd love to hear some specifics in terms of uh, of money saved and other net benefits to the municipality if that's a possibility. Uh, yes, through you, I believe in one of the reports there is a case study that was provided. Um, with Clearview um, that sort of touches on some of their savings that they've realized. Um, I don't have any uh, solid data from other municipalities in front of me right now, um, but uh, I, I haven't heard any indications that they're not happy with the program and, and everything that we did here certainly was positive. But again, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now. Go ahead. Thank you, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I would I would like to see that if possible, but I understand that you know it's not always easy to get that information from um, from from other departments and other municipalities. I guess um, to Councillor Wicken's point, the sort of too good to be true. Um, I, I've I've had the same sort of suspicion during the the presentation, and you know I mean quite clearly a presentation from a salesman, car salesman at that. Um, but, uh, but you know, it also, to me personally, does make sense that a, a corporation of that size, uh, enterprise, uh, would simply just by economy of scale be able to deliver um, this type of service more efficiently than we would be able to manage ourselves as a small rural municipality. So um, uh, though I'm skeptical, uh, I guess I, I'm hopeful as well. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lowhead. You know, I don't think you can downplay the uh, the LAS um, recommendation and AMO's recommendation. I mean, these are uh, our fellow municipalities, and uh, their uh, their recommendation certainly carries weight. Mayor McQueen, you'd raise your hand. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm not a, a per se a leased vehicle guy. <laughs> I'm a buy it and own it guy, but I know I do have some, always had some, some reservations on lease, uh, you know, unless you have a high cash flow. And, but you know, the, the question that was raised was, yeah, when you return that lease, you get, you get, uh, you lose money because of there's a dent here and then that he sort of assured us that that's a little different this way around. He did have, he did make a lot of sense in the sense that you're, you're moving vehicles in and out when they still have the maximized value for, you know, changing them out where you get to them 12 years and there's not a lot of money. And I do see the accounts and I do see where we do spend a lot of money on repairs after bit as well. And, you know, brakes are one thing, but then front ends and steering and that does, you know, does sort of um, 
add up as well. So there is that sweet spot you try to find. But I was, I, you know, I know Council Wickens did say about the, the cost, but he, it is listed here, two and a half percent markup when a vehicle is purchased. But if you're purchasing a hundred thousand vehicles a year, you should get a better discount than probably us buying two. So hopefully that's that translate into us and that net on that center maybe even better right i hope and and then there's a 50 dollars per month managing fee and then there's the uh 500 to uh, prepare prepare the vehicle for resale at the end of, the, of that lease period but just going on to what uh, uh councillor lohead is saying you know there are three council members that are attending the good roads conference next week and if you wish to defer this for one meeting i don't think that would be the end of the world if you guys want to have the conversations with those neighboring municipalities uh you know what's your counselors but it is a possibility that if you wish to do that one you know two weeks is not going to be the the end of the world to this i don't think if you find that that is another avenue that would give you that uh, you know and it's good to get that to, you know that's what you that's what's called networking you talk to your neighboring counselors and 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 ask them those questions and it may come back well no or it may come back resounding like yeah this is a great uh, you know from our experience who knows right but sometimes you gotta you know it's an opportunity so I, I just throw that out if you wish to defer it two weeks and get that you know there are three of you going uh, deputy mayor nielsen and yourself and councillor wickens that are going if, you know if we are this is entering into a whole new chart char territory and in, if that comes back, I see Deputy Mayor has his hand up, so I just saw that. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Nielsen, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Elwood. Just a comment, if I remember correctly, I think um, our delegate did specify that Meadford is less than a year with the program. So <clears throat> I know, well, I will rephrase that. I assume Enterprise and LAS will be having a, a booth at the Good Roads um, conference where we could definitely ask some questions and and try to get some ideas to which other municipalities have been with the program uh, for the next time. Maybe to Mayor McQueen, you've sat on AMO for a number of years. This is a program that AMO is supporting. Wondering if you recall how long this pro program has been in place. Um, I seem to rethink from the delegate that at the overall program itself is still relatively new. So Councillor Lowhead's looking for more like historical data showing some savings. And I'm not sure if the program is old enough to show the data specifically you're looking for. Um, I'm I, just my memory of. Thank you for that. Uh, Treasurer McCarthy, did you uh, have a response? Uh, yes, I believe it was uh, in the report in the presentation that uh, it was in 2019 that uh, the agreement was entered into with LAS and Enterprise. Um, and I believe it was 2020 that Meaford entered into the agreement with uh, Enterprise. Um, but prior to that, uh, it has existed for at least 15 years in the States. Um, it uh, runs through a program equivalent to AMO. I think it's called SourceWell. Uh, so it is a well-established program in the U.S., but recently moved into Ontario. Thank you for that. There is a, uh, a link in the report to over 100 client success stories, efleets.com slash case studies, uh, that uh, on the same page that the Clearview uh, experience is documented. Councilor Dubik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just as a quick note, I did have a um, a sample of one conversation with a Meaford counselor, um, you know, very quick, very brief. Um, but, you know, you know, he said, you know, overall, they were happy. They, you know, continued, they approved, you know, the continuation of the program this year in the budget um, and that their staff is open to, um, you know, for, to further conversations. Um, and, you know, from what I hear, um, maybe our director of finance has already reached out uh, to the contact in Meaford, um, to I think I think it was Jessica, uh, but um, but yeah, that was just my sample of one. Um, but you know, obviously opportunities to have more conversations. Thank you for that, Treasurer McCarthy. Uh, yeah, if I could just add that I think it is 
uh, a low risk agreement to enter into and that I think this company can buy better for us, they can sell better for us, um, more than make up for the, the fees that they do charge. If we're not happy with uh, the services, we're going to report back to council before we do proceed with year two. Um, and if we don't want to keep going in the program, then we're under no obligation to do so. So again, I think it is uh, relatively low risk that way. Thank you for that. <clears throat> So at this point, we do have a motion on the floor. I haven't heard of anybody seeking to amend the motion. Any further discussion or questions? No, then uh, all those in favor. The motion is carried unanimously, thank you. Well, I would say that still our members that are going to Good Road still still have those conversations. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Good reason to be there. Networking opportunities. The next item on the agenda, then uh, item fourteen point two, is a bylaw to amend bylaw twenty twenty two dash zero two nine, being a bylaw to adopt. Policy AO9-C-02, Council Remuneration Policy, updated April 2023. Basically, uh, this fell out of uh, the Deputy Mayor's Notice of Motion and the discussion Council had and a resolution that was made at that time. And the uh, motion today would be the Council approve the bylaw 2023-040, being a bylaw to adopt policy a09-C-02 as amended. The draft is attached. It, it dealt primarily with mileage and some definitions. Moved by the mayor, seconded by Councillor Allen. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's carried unanimously. The motion is passed. Thank you. I'll pass the chair back to the mayor. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Chair Allwood. And moving on to our consent agenda, are there any items which to be pulled for separate discussion? Hey, Councilor Allwood. Yeah, I'd like to pull, sorry, let's see. I'd like to pull the... Uh, um, 15.1. I'd like to talk about 15.1, but the uh, natural gas task force expansion. 15.9. Yeah, 15.9. Sorry, I was just looking for it. All right. Are there any others wish to be pulled? We still have discussion, but if not, can I have a mover and a second for the consent agenda, please? Councillor Dubik, second by Councillor Lohead. Discussion. I just wanted to touch briefly on 15.1. Uh, I spoke to it earlier uh, in the uh, amended terms of reference, but uh, municipal support is required now for any um, um, siting of uh, renewable energy projects. And uh, again, it's that whole situation that's gonna arise out of the new uh, storage situation. Um, there, there's a report that, that fall that was uh, part of the minutes of the March the 9th meeting of the uh, working group that'll be coming to council once those minutes are approved. But uh, again, the, uh, the working group did lobby hard to make sure that municipal support was required and not just a, uh, not just, not just a consideration uh, uh, where you get some points awarded for municipal support. It's a required, um, part of getting uh, a renewable energy project approved. And uh, I just, uh, I think um, maybe for the benefit of the new councillors, uh, you know, Gray Highlands is on record as being an unwilling host of wind turbines. There are a number of our rate payers who have some serious concerns about issues with wind turbines that have uh, been present in my mind since I became a councillor and certainly uh, go back as far as 2014 for myself. So 
uh, that, that municipal support and having the right kind of information in front of you when you when you decide on that support is important. So I just I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. And just as noted in the minutes itself on that particular item, it does show that I was in attendance, but I was only in attendance as the as the alternate. I was only listening, but I wasn't partaking and uh, only would partake if yourself or Councillor Wickens was not there. But I, I still have a lot of interest in it. So I, I listened through. And so it's recorded that I was at the meeting, but I certainly wasn't. Uh, I wasn't being uh, uh, taking part in motions and that type of thing or 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 putting in for remuneration as well. So. <clears throat> I think uh, uh, the, um, Stuart Halliday will be was is appointed, but he couldn't get in because he had some technical yeah, issues that he did. Right, which I think he's fixed. Fix it, and he is the public rep that uh, comes from Greyhounds itself. So, uh, any other discussion on the consent agenda on on their items? There's a number of uh, well, Saga Conservation Authority with some updates. What's happening? Saugeen and Grace Sobel's minutes. <clears throat> Maxwell Hall meeting notes, Osprey oh, Recreation meeting minutes, Senior Advisory Committee unapproved minutes. Senior note. Maybe a comment on 1510, the uh, letter of council on the, uh, the fact that Enbridge wants to charge uh, for uh, locating. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> Maybe uh, just a comment on 1510 that uh, Enbridge Gas is proposing that they would charge for uh, locate costs on uh, their lines in the municipal right of way that municipalities have granted them free access to. Uh, and uh, we might want to respond to that or, or, or join a group of municipalities that are uh, thinking that is not a way to move forward. But, uh, I'll just leave it there for now. Well, and we did have that discussion in our uh, review of the agenda last week. And I don't know <clears throat> if uh, Director Cornfield is still with us, but that was something that uh, was thought that uh, when, again, the three representatives of council attend Good Roads is to maybe follow up with that and, and get some clarity on that, uh, uh, on that, because uh, it used to be uh, call one or call one call or whatever it is uh, that it wouldn't cost anybody. It's all part of what's it called? One, one call, one call. Yeah, one call, and just suggest. And I know that. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't know if, if is Director Cornfield is he? He's gone. Okay. I know that uh, during our discussion at our uh, at our draft or agenda uh, review uh, coming board for council, that was something that was mentioned by him, and and we'd had a little bit of a conversation on that. And uh, I know we didn't pull that item, but uh, go ahead, uh, Councilor Alwood. Well, today we're receiving it for information, but uh, there's no reason that if uh, you come back from good roads with yeah. some more information for council that we couldn't follow up on this. Right. Yeah, and that was the feeling. Yeah. So we're giving you guys lots of duties when you go there. They're going to be working hard. <laughs> All right, so I don't see any discussion uh, on that. So that was moved by Council Dubic, second by Council Lowhead. That the items on the consent agenda be approved for, with the exception of items that was pulled, and that was 10 point nine, or 15.9. Uh, any other discussion seeing that? All in favor? That is carried. Okay, moving to now to 15.9, uh, Councilor Allwood. Uh, thank you, Worship. Yes, I just wanted to. Um, bring to the attention an item in the minutes that uh, the Natural Gas Expansion Task Force requests the council direct staff to correspond with Enbridge and answer questions regarding the Flesherton and Markdale Natural Gas Expansion Area, reconfirmation of running lines and confirmation of sewer systems in the area. The, uh, the task force was basically um, in limbo at the end of the last term of council and uh, there was, there was a, a period uh, before it was reestablished and uh, we haven't met our mandate yet, which is a report back to council, but uh, Enbridge had requested during that period uh, some information from our staff and uh, unfortunately it didn't happen. And so there's been a few uh, months of delay and I'm just hoping that we can, uh, the council can today uh, make sure that staff uh, connects with Enbridge and, and gives them the information they need so that they can come back to us with the uh, 
the possibility of expanding natural gas in Gray Highlands in the areas that we've already discussed. Right. Oh, Thank you. That motion on the floor, then. Uh, does, does that require a motion, Madam Clerk? You pulled it, so yeah. Um, yes, however, I think the information you need needs to come from the County of Gray and not Gray Highlands. And this body cannot direct the County of Gray staff to correspond with Enbridge. My understanding was it was both the municipality of Gray Highlands and the County of Gray, but uh, certainly if our staff can hook up with uh, Enbridge for uh, the, the uh, municipal roads that are involved in the uh, expansion maps that our director of planning provided. And uh, we can work on the county. So um, Madam Clerk, if that was to give new direction to our staff to do that, then would there be, need to be an amendment to this motion? Uh, so Motion's not on the floor yet. Oh yes. Well, yeah. so then, okay. So uh, Councilor Allward, are you moving the motion as is written into the, are you? Well, I'm wondering if there's a way to, I'm wondering if there's a way to capture uh, our staff connecting with the county staff to give Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Chair McQueen, to uh, Councilor Allwood and the rest of council. Um, so yes, um, I do just want to point out and um, that this is a task force and the task force mandate does state that the research information is to come from the membership of the task force. So generally what would happen in a task force um, meeting or within the confines of the mandate of the task force is that if any information and research is required, the membership of the task force would obtain that information um, and then bring it back to their own body. Um, so there's nothing that would stop a, a member of council um, that is a member of that task force from obtaining that information from the relevant staff of the bodies and bringing that back to the um, back to that body, which is why there was, I think, a little bit of confusion in, in, in this one. Um, and I think there's also probably a little bit of confusion where it comes from a single member of council directing staff versus a single member of council asking for information. So there's two different things here that that uh, provided that little bit of clarity. Um, so task forces generally, um, I just didn't want to get to the point where we're we're setting a precedent where um, task forces are now coming and asking council to direct staff on things um, because if 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 council wanted staff to do the research council would have directed staff to provide a report on gas natural gas expansion um, however they didn't they established a task force to do that research and reporting so i think that's where there was a little bit of confusion on the staff side and on the membership side of what was happening with this so um, for sure if if council wishes to have staff um, provide this information, we will need a copy of this email because as far as I'm aware, no member of staff actually received this correspondence from Enbridge. Um, so we would need a copy of that and there would need to be a recommendation that council direct staff to correspond with Enbridge um, to answer their questions regarding the Flushington and Markdale natural gas expansion area, reconfirmation of running line and confirmation of sewer systems in the area and receive um, in, research information from the County of Gray related to same. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah, I'd be happy to move that if... So, so to direct staff to get that information, is that what you're asking? <coughs> is it, as the clerk has indicated, there's nothing stopping members to ask for information. We just can't direct staff to do things, <laughs> right? So, so there's, we can ask staff to bring back that information as the clerk has ended, or indicated. And, and I think for clarity, that information that they're asking. So from the committee in bridge through ACON is to give us a price of what has been identified as an area of Eugenia, right? And before, and we thought our last meeting, it was gonna be providing us with that price. But the question that came in an email back in December 19th or 20th or whenever that was, Oh, by the way, we need to know if we can place uh, natural gas piping one meter, was it one meter from the shoulder of the road plus or, plus or minus a half a meter, I think it was. They needed to know that information before they could give us a final price on whether it was feasible that they could do it in the 40 year plan that they talk about and, and, and not any cost. I got that correct, right? Uh, to the best of my recollection, that was the ask, but uh, yeah. I don't have it in front of me right now, Your Worship. And I did point out uh, that meeting, and I did point out at our, at our agenda review that 
a big portion of that road is county. I can certainly, you know, reach out to um, Pat Hoy at the county, but I think uh, thinking about it, there may be roads that will be in Eugenia itself that are municipal. So we do need that information from our um, our local staff as well. From our and, and I don't know if we have a policy on that. I guess it all depends whether there's a policy on determining. I know. We have a policy on installation of buried lines for wind turbines, which is, I think, a meter from the property line. We have that in place from from, from burying lines. So, um, so again, uh, that information back to you as the chair, um, Councillor Elwood. What do you wish to to do? Do you wish to direct staff to do that, or do you feel between the membership that we could get that information ourselves by following up? Well, I'd be happy. Uh... To get the information from our, uh, if, if you're able to connect with the county staff and do it, then the task force will undertake if that's the best way to do this. But I'm seeing some. Uh... <laughs> I can talk to the county. You do talk to our local staff. We can get that information <clears throat> back if, that's, if that makes it easier. Uh, but again, we can pass a motion to ask our staff to do that themselves too, right? There is that ability, yeah. right? I mean, I'm looking at getting this done the most expeditious way we can do this. Um, Madam Clerk, what do you suggest? Um, Not to put you on the spot. No, expeditiously. I think um, if, if council would have asked for a report on natural gas expansion, you would have had it last year um, from staff. Um, so expeditiously, I, I would think that the, there's potential that staff could probably obtain this information um, quicker. Um, but I was just, I was hesitant on setting a precedent on the difference between a task force and advisory committee, council committee and direction to staff. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page with that information. But I don't disagree with um, asking staff to come to, to provide this information. Okay, then we'll, we'll leave it there. And, uh, so and, then, and that would include talking to the county staff so the information is complete. So as the motion is written in that minutes would be suffice, suffice with the exception is the clerk was saying they need it, need a copy of the email to know what information they are required to provide. Yeah. I mean, our, yeah, I think our coordinator has that email, but I can forward it to whoever I need to. Is this is this uh, direction clear enough, or do we need to make an amendment to that? Uh, no, what I read out originally was that the what was in there in uh, in research information. Uh, regarding confirmation of a running line and confirmation of sewer systems in the area and research information from the County of Gray regarding the same. Can you move that? I'll move that. Move the seconder, Councillor Allen. Any further discussion on that? Seeing that, all in favor? That's carried. All right. Thank you. So that takes care of the consent. Uh, moving on then. Uh, and the, uh, motions where notice has been given, there are none. Are there any new notice of motions? Councilor Dubé. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so as per this morning, um, we were discussing um, uh, growth and ensuring that you know we leverage best practices and gain learnings from those um, who have gone through growth spurts. Um, so I will bring a motion, um, I guess for the next- It's due tomorrow for the next one. It's due tomorrow. Okay, I, I will be very busy tonight drafting up my motion um, to, um, you know, that we approach uh, other municipalities or cities, you know, such as Guelph and, or, you know, other maybe, um, uh, municipalities um, that have gone through, you know, sort of a, a growth phase um, and um, to gain learnings on, um, you know, strong, you know, strong, strong town principles, smart growth principles, um, and any, you know, tips um, and best practices that they, you know, may want to share with us so that we are best prepared as, as we continue to grow. Okay, thank you for that. I'm just trying to look at a calendar here. Um, are there any other notice of motions? <coughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. 
Thank you, Mayor McQueen. I'll bring forward an notice of motion regarding uh, resolu resolution for Greyhounds to recognize two different events. Sorry. To recognize two events? Two different events. Two. So uh, two different recognitions for the month of May. Oh, okay. Like a like a like a proclamation type thing? Is that what you're <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. But notice I'm using the word recognize. Mm hmm uh not sure <laughs> you'll have to find out when he brings it are you uh i so will you double check that it goes with the policy clerk martel yeah, right and just for clarity madam clerk if you want it on the next agenda you need it in by tomorrow oh you saw you yeah right it's 10 business days and there's two holidays coming up friday and monday which means the following monday day comes back to the thursday Right. Okay. There you go. All laid out. Are there any other notice of motions? I was considering one. I mentioned this to one of the councillors uh, about, and help me out here a little bit, council, just in the sense of, of something else that happens to other municipalities. I think the city of Own Sound and other municipalities have had a free giveaway at the end of your driveway type thing. I forget what you call that. And I would like to entertain the idea of bringing that forward. And I don't know the time frame because I'm thinking like sometimes around the May 20th or May 24th weekend is something where people clean house and stuff like that. And again, it's another way of diverting items from our landfill. Can somebody help me what you would call that? So our, our esteemed uh, journalist friend is re referring to it as a curbside swap. Yeah. So Deputy Mayor, did you have a comment? Is that what you... Uh, a free giveaway. It, 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 there, there is a technical term because I thought the city of Wonsan has done it before, or others have done it. I'm just looking at some help. It, Councillor Allen, is one here curbside free for all? <laughs> I googled it. So if, it, if you happen to leave your car out there and it's gone, then <laughs> you might. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll 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 try to get it in for tomorrow. Then if I don't, then I guess I'll it'll be the next frame of that. But I notice a motion to have the opportunity to have a, a, a curve free at the curve day. I, I don't know. I'm trying to find the right terminology. Help me out some here. Curbside swap. Curbside swap. Curbside swap. Okay. Curbside swap. Okay. Curbside swap. And, and I just for clarity, Madam Clerk. Curbside exchange. Okay. So, and the reason being, and, and Council Allen, we're talking about this break is if it's, if it's, if people know it, they'll drive around and, Right, and people get rid of their stuff and sometimes gain more. <laughs> Councillor, Councillor Lewickens. So uh, being a swap, uh, could I bring something and put it at the end of your lane that I don't want, Paul, and take something of yours? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you might just put it in my driveway and drive away, right? Um, anyway, I, I just, and I guess in procedural, Madam Clerk, if that was something that was brought forward in the time frame of next meeting, is there a bylaw or something needs to happen after that? Or, or like, can it just be that matter of emotion that we do it? Because obviously it'd be nice to have it in place for the end of May, but I don't know. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know because I've, this is the first I'm hearing of it within the last five seconds. But the first thing that comes to mind is there may be an amendment to our waste bylaw because we're not allowed to place. That would be illegal dumping. Could be, I don't know. I would have to look at it, but. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. No, that's, that's, that's fair enough. I just procedurally, and, and maybe it doesn't happen until the fall or whatever, but anyway, I'll, I'll leave it on the books for now that I, I'll, I'll try to get something drafted. By what time tomorrow? By, by 4.30? Yeah, end of day 4.30. Okay, all right. So curbside swap idea. Uh, Councillor Allen. Could I just ask a question of our clerk to do with notices of motion? I understand that a staff report needs to be in at a certain time because it has to be approved by the CAO and the director and perhaps finance. But a notice of motion is basically you just cut and paste what we send you onto the council agenda. So 
Um, almost. No, no, almost. no, no. Every time a council member provides a um, notice of motion, we actually do a precursory look to make sure that it is in compliance with legislation, that it's within the jurisdiction of council, and that council is not getting themselves in trouble by passing such a resolution. We also uh, will generally reach out to finance and find out if there's any financial implications that affects the municipality that may need to be included in the resolution or any other thing. So it is actually quite time intensive for notice of motions, more so than when I'm reviewing a staff report. So if somebody brought a staff report forward and say, we want to double staff, you would have to make sure that we reviewed it, that we weren't going against anything, right? <laughs> like the budget. <laughs> All right, our last call. Is there any last notice of motions? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, county report, Deputy Mayor, I'll let you go first, a report there. <clears throat> Thanks, Mayor McQueen. Uh, uh, stumbled, sorry. Um, Gray County Met, we had a wonderful presentation from uh, the Safety Village, uh, the Saugeen Valley Safety Village, uh, regarding the um, role and responsibility and the, how busy they are. Um, they bring a lot of education and awareness around uh, safety for road traffic, safety for farm traffic, fire safety and such. It was a pretty neat presentation that they delivered. Um, the County of Gray had an extensive report on Rockwood Terrace. Um, I'm sure Mayor McQueen will want to expand on that one so I won't steal his thunder. Um, but there was a change of direction from the county. Um, other than those two items, I'm, I'm foggy because I'm under the weather today and can't remember what other big things happened at the county. Okay, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. And yeah, Gray Road 7 and Gray Road 18. I'm looking at Chris because we were talking about this at lunch. Uh, uh, along with Gray Road 28, have uh, came in with uh, our tenders uh, below budget on the two, uh, which are, um, well, Gray Road 7 is in Gray Highlands and uh, surprisingly uh, quite a bit below uh, budget. So that's nice to see. Uh, obviously there's a, an index on asphalt and oil and wherever that happens as well. So we know that can, can affect that pricing a little bit, but yes, uh, on the, uh, Rockwood, um, uh, development for the 128 beds, very extensive report. Uh, our committee met, um, a few days before our last county council, and then it was added to the council, full county council, uh, discussion and, Part of the original uh, proposal that was approved about a year uh, back in last March of 2022 was to uh, look at building um, 128 beds, um, assisted living, and uh, a center in the center that would that could be opened up for a store or, or common area. The th there was three options when that was provided a year ago was with regards to um, uh, long-term care, assisted living, and apartments or, 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 or senior, senior units, but that part, option three, was not included. Uh, we're finding out that the cost to build the, the units are, are, get, are coming in quite high, suggested from our consultant. Um, we're, really, we're really nervous, and we've, you see there that uh, council voted to set an upward spending limit of $92 million. We've eliminated or, or, or passed on the assisted living and focus on the 128. Now, the original proposal was a two-story, 128 facility with a third story, story would be assisted living. But, uh, you know, because of a lot of different things, and I think some of the high cost is coming from, because there's a lot of projects throughout the, the province that are in the pipeline. I think something like 360 some different long-term care and development similar to that are in the pipeline. So you're, you're seeing there's a competition probably to a certain degree. We're hoping that uh, as we move forward with the long-term care, we're not locked and loaded at this point yet. But as we know uh, in the report um, that came from our, our treasurer, uh, we know now that a year, years, a year in a year's time, our cost of borrowing is certainly much higher. We're looking at 4.3 to 4.5 percent over the over a period of where you know a year ago we were at two and a half percent or two two and three quarters percent. So that the cost of borrowing has greatly uh, uh, increased the cost of the project over a period of time. And the feeling is they also offered the provincial government back in November of 2022 offered <clears throat> some incentive program if you get your uh, project in the ground. By August, I think it is, 
there is the opportunity to get an extra $35 per day per room subsidy, which $15 of that can be upfront cost. But you know, the timeframes are, are, are looking at being quite tough. And it, you know, we're, we're sort of scratching our head. Is this the right time to you know, move, move forward just at this uh, atmosphere, not the atmosphere, but the climate as far as the high cost of building you know, long-term care? And it's just you know, the cost of borrowing. And I think one report was going to be <laughs> just an interest cost over the next 25 to 30 years was $72 million or, or thereabouts. Like it was quite high. And, and I know Chris was there as well reporting on that. And it's like, you know, and people care and other facilities that sort of got into their tender process just prior to COVID, you know, in sound, <coughs> we're coming in at $200 uh, um, a bed. And now we're looking at anywhere from 500 to 700,000 per bed. So it's just, it's just, um, and, and I'm being high level here in the sense of, of those numbers, but it's just like, holy smokes. And it's just like, and, and you know, we're under a mandate with, with Rockwood Terrace as we're supposed to have those beds replaced by 2025. But even with the timeframes as of now for the rebuild of, of Rockwood Terrace, we're looking at 2026 for occupancy, right? And the other thing was with doing the assisted living part, Basically, it was coming in that we would have to charge to cover our cost at over $5,800 for assisted living. So basically $6,000 per, per room for assisted living. And, you know, that's a lot of money per, per month. You know, you know, it's over $70,000. That's $200 a day for assisted living. And I guess there are individuals, seniors that could afford that, but there's a lot that can't. And, you know, are we going to be struggling at that? And I understand from some of the conversations, some people are paying that for assisted living that high. It's just, it's, yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's just, and, and that 5,800 change per month, it's not even covering our borrowing cost, the infrastructure cost to cover that. Just, that's just for building it. That's not covering our borrowing cost. So you almost need to charge 6,500 a month just to cover that. So Anyway, there was, you know, a lot of discussion on that and, and uh, you know, we're in, a, we're in a tough situation and I know the Greg Gables thing is sort of there and it's like, oh boy, where do we go with that, you know, and, 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 and all that borrowing and the borrowing capacity of the county is going to have to be amended because it's getting outside that current, um, on the books is 10% of our, of our borrowing capacity to our revenue and we're going to have to change that. To, to 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 move forward if we you know when when and where we we do move forward so big discussion big numbers huge numbers and uh stay tuned on, on that part as well it's just uh it's uh, and, and i mean that that's that's the taxpayers of the county that uh are going to have to cover that cost which limits other borrowing and other other things that we need to do councilor allen i think those high costs and, and even the 200 was probably high before, but it's because it's a government agency. If the private sector was building that, they could build it a lot cheaper. And yeah, there's a high, high, there's a high standard. Right? Well, a high standard and it's like our bridges and roads. Yeah. It's, you know, I'm sure I could build a road cheaper than the municipality could. Well, you know, Dan could. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But there is certain levels of procedure and process and, and consultants. And, you know, we have colliers that are consultants on this project and, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you're right. It's, but just in the site when bird, um, bird construction did and got the, the job for building the hospital, uh, it was down to, uh, bird construction and, um, the ones that built the sky dome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, they actually, the price I understand came in to under budget for, to build the hospital back uh, uh, March of 2021. I think it was maybe just a little bit before that. Maybe it was the, the fall of 2020. So, I mean, I said, you know, there's a, there's a construction company, Bird Construction is going to be wrapping up here the end of September. So, you know, obviously they're, they're out tendering and doing the projects and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, a bit of it's supply and demand. We know a little bit on the trades and all that stuff. And, you know, I know the, the issue that, you know, 
steel and different things uh, have gone up and, and all that stuff. So did I miss anything, Deputy Mayor? Mayor McQueen, I knew you would want to have that uh, more fulsome discussion on it. That's why I didn't want to steal your thunder. Um, just the, the way the motion got worded from the county is that we are changing the fulsome scope so that the total budgetary cost, including cost overages, percentages and such, come in at the 92 million. So we haven't seen uh, at the county what that new scope Folsom looks like. Mayor McQueen did touch out on a couple of ideas that we'll probably have to change in order to fall within that number. Um, my perspective at the county was the building we're trying to do here, like a lot of construction we do, while I don't disagree with Councillor Allen's perspective that government agencies do tend to take a hit, we are looking at trying to put, build a uh, a project that will be in place for 50 to 60 years and I, I'm concerned that we'll change the scope too much and end up with a building that 30 years from now when the debt is paid will be disappointed in what we actually built so I'll just be having those that lens when we're looking at this at the county. Thank you for for that and just one other comment with regards to the county we did talk about that uh, renewing that route from on Gray Road Four, and I did go back and it, and it said we must give six months notice. So I think maybe Deputy Mayor, you may be right. We had to approve that in order to carry it over, but then there's a six months cancellation clause that's already maybe been given. Who knows? I, I don't know. Okay. So any other any questions with regards to Deputy Mayor and myself with the county? Okay. Can I have a motion then to receive those highlights? Councillor Dubik, Councillor Allwood, all in favor? That is carried. Thank you for that. Councillor Privileges, what do you want to talk about? Councillor Wickens. Yes, uh, April 29th. Write it on your calendars if you wish. Uh, someone here is having a 60th birthday party at the Maxwell Hall. I believe my wife is organizing it. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty well zeroes in on somebody being as my birthday is april 25th that's yeah. anyways i know all about it and all of you are invited uh, i don't know if you've ever heard fred the singing dj from own sound he's really good and uh it's uh, karaoke as well so i want to see if uh, clark martell is a better singer than she is a bowler <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, anyways, you're all you're all welcome to come. I think eight o'clock on the 29th of April. So the saying goes, are they going to play the song? It's your party, and you'll whatever you want to. And you'll... well, I hope not to cry. <laughs> I cried at my 30th birthday. That really bothered me, but none none have since. Oh. Well, that's that's anyways, great that you're celebrating right. it. Uh, you're Wickens. all formally invited. There you go. Bring your spouses. Okay. I'll hand out flyers at the Home and Garden Show happening the same day, Councillor Wickens, just to bring everybody out. We do have a capacity level at Maxwell, I'm presuming. <laughs> Deputy uh, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor McQueen. Uh, I want to make sure I state that the uh, Gray Highlands Public Library has uh, opened up a survey today, starting today, for the Gray Highlands Public Library strat plan for the next term, next four years. Just want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. Um, you can find it on the library webpage, as well as there are links to it all over social media now on the uh, library Facebook page and others. Um, and just so that people uh, get engaged to give their opinion, just like when the municipality is going to do its strategic plan, the more opinions and the more people who engage and give us comments, the more fulsome we can do and the uh, better we can serve the municipality. Okay. Thank you for that. Other, uh, Councillor Dubik, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so another um, date to note in your calendars, Thursday, April 20th at 7 p.m. Um, is the Earth Film Festival um, hosted by the Grace Sobel Conservation Foundation. Um, so the film does start at seven, but come early at 6 p.m. for the silent auction. Um, so it is at the Roxy Theatre in Owen Sound. So you can get your tickets at the Roxy Theater .ca. <coughs> Um And oh yes, and they will be showing the film also earlier during the day for students as well. So um, 
Um, and the film is Antarctica from above is the future film. Um, so this movie is an interesting and dramatic view of the most Southern continent, Antarctica. And Sarah McComb Turbett will be the presenter. Um, and she's a phenomenal um, you know, scientist and, and artist. So I'll go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor McQueen. Uh, Deputy Mayor uh, mentioned this already, but April 29th and 30th is the uh, Home and Garden Show at the Fleshton Arena Complex. Uh, that'll be in conjunction with uh, the South Great Chamber of Commerce. And also on September the 10th, there's a fundraising uh, bike event that will be uh, marshalling at the Markdale Complex, but it's a Grand Fondo and uh, there's three or four different uh, lengths of rides, but it's it's not a race. It's a, a fundraising uh, event for the Center of Gray uh, Health Services. Yes. And uh, sh should be a good day. Thank you. Okay, any other council privileges? Council, go ahead. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> so one more uh, date to note in your calendar is this upcoming Saturday, April 8th. Uh, at uh, 11 a.m. at the Kimberly Hall, there is an Easter egg hunt, and for, that's for the little kids. Um, <clears throat> I attended it last year with my son. He had a blast. Um, you know, they put out, the KCA puts out a, a whole lot of fun little prizes, chocolates, etc. Beautiful day this upcoming Saturday too. So, uh, if you got a little one, uh, bring him on out. Um, but you do need to register in advance. Um, they say by the end of today, but I'm sure that you could probably sneak it in tomorrow as well. Well, I spurred on Deputy Mayor here, so uh, thanks for that, Councillor Lowhead. Deputy Mayor. Um, just another Councillor privilege, just uh, thought we should have a quick discussion on the um, uh, Gray County Federation of Ag and Bruce County Federation of Ag uh, Politicians Day that took place a couple of Saturdays ago. There was some very <coughs> great, uh, very good discussions on a lot of different items, um, not just on the different commodities, Quantities that exist agriculturally speaking, like the sheep farmers association and the beef farmers and the dairy farmers and such. But there was a really good discussion on Bill 23, and it was fortunate that we had um, both Bruce and Gray County local MPs and MPPs there. So there was um, a good uh, bit of a back and forth discussion between the presenter on Bill 23 and some of the uh, responses from our upper tier politicians. So I uh, was very grateful to be there and to be able to hear the, the uh, conversation and, and discussion around Bill 23 and how it can affect um, land use and some concerns that exist for municipalities and for farmers as well. Um, There's also a good discussion on um, road usage for farm vehicles and wear and tear on, on roadways and such. So yeah, just uh, want to touch base that it was uh, really well attended, um, pretty full house at the uh, KD Market Arena or KD, Mar KD Arena and um, really good discussions. Well, thanks for bringing that up. And yeah, that was well attended and, and certainly it's nice to see both uh, local MP, MP, MPPs being there. And I know our local MPP, along with the Minister of Agriculture, was certainly taking notes and, and, and comments back from uh, Bill uh, about the discussion around Bill 23 and, and the federations did pay for that individual to come and speak on Bill 23 as well. So it was good to have that as a, a main speaker. Anything else? Uh, a couple things, uh, uh, myself, Council Dubik and Council Rollhead, we attended the Southern Georgian Bay Institute sustainability strap plan on last Friday. And I think it was around 70 people attend it. Uh, wrote, uh, uh, four main uh, focus areas, there was breakout sessions and sort of feedback. Uh, I know a lot to do with affordable or attainable housing was uh, the big thing at our table. I know I think both uh, Councillor Dubik and Councillor Lohead, I don't know if you want to speak to your table. I know that we had uh, actually our table split into two uh with regards to other opportunities for municipalities and i and it's it was i found it was interesting from the group i sat with you know i, I certainly have the, the you know the mayor hat and the municipal hat and, and you know there's a lot of questions well what, you know, the municipalities can do more and more and more well 
I sort of said, well, the municipalities are sort of strapped, you know, in the sense of what they can do, but there's opportunities maybe through land or other things that maybe we could, you know, do, but we just don't have bags and bags of cash to make things happen. So it was, it was good to have that discussion. And Councillor Dubig, what was your topic at your table? Uh, so I sat at the uh, business and innovation table. Um, and so really good discussion around um, how to support uh, small business uh, people, um, you know, about finding, you know, getting them connected with mentors, um, sharing resources, um, and having a bigger voice as a region, um, so that, you know, we, we could attract more funding, uh, you know, in terms of grants and, um, you know, from the from the provincial and federal levels um and yeah and looking forward to staying in touch with them i think it's there are some good opportunities okay and council go ahead do you have any yeah thank you mr mayor um my table was sustainable uh tourism um so we talked a lot about uh how best to um yeah, promote uh tourism in this area um green tourism environmental tourism make sure that it's sustainable a lot of discussion about making sure that there was public transit to the area to um lower the number of cars single especially you know single or, or uh, two passenger cars on the road to get up here to enjoy uh, our natural environment so a very fruitful conversation I'm glad I went. And, and furthermore, at the table I, I sat with, I talked about housing and, and uh, tiny homes and different things around that part, which I think still needs to come back on. I don't know if, I don't know if anybody ever attended a few years back that uh, Meaford held the uh, small homes conference. It was at the Opera House. I don't know if anybody was there, but that was really, and I talked about tiny homes and tiny homes have changed a lot over the years in the sense through the building code that's allowed even ourselves reducing or eliminating a thousand square feet as a minimum, you know, and letting the building code determine that size is, is something that uh, has been in play. And, uh, and uh, anyway, the uh, Southern Georgian Bay Institute has been established, I think about 2018 um, or 19 thereabouts, but uh, I know myself, Mayor Measures, uh, uh, Mayor Hanley, and uh, Mayor Matrosoff from Blue Mountains was there. And along with the mayor of uh, Meafruit, uh, Ross Kentner was there and uh, we're missing the mayor of Saga Beach, but anyway, it was uh, very well attended. Um, last week, I don't know, Councillor Wickens, do you wanna speak about our hosting our farm safety meeting and we invited all the mayors to come? Before we do that, we're gonna go past five o'clock. So I'll make a motion to go past five. Moved by Councillor Allen, second by Councilor Dubik, that will go past five o'clock. All in favor? That's scary. We won't go past five very much, but anyway. Council Wiggins, do you want to speak to that at all? I was hoping that motion would be defeated, but anyways, now I have to speak. <laughs> so we had uh, we had uh, 20, 24. 24 there, and we uh, we gave uh, some of the some folks. Uh, I know there was one. A uh, politician from the town of Blue Mountains, and she's a veteran politician, and she had no idea that such a thing even existed. So it's just getting the message out there to the the people. Um, Tony Bell gave a really good uh, talk, and uh, we had uh, we had Sam Lemon's granddaughter. I forget her name. Sydney. Sydney Martin. Right, Sydney Martin. She gave a speech on. Uh, mental health on the farm, how uh, farmers deal with or don't deal with mental health issues. Uh, it was it was really well done. It's a, a speech she did a couple years ago, Paul. Yeah, through the, the public speaking contest. Public speaking through. contest, yes. Yeah. It was well done. Linda Leith uh, did an amazing job and we had her pineapple chicken. If you've never had her pineapple chicken, it's... I don't know. I, I'd like to. I'd like to break into her house and get the recipe. Right. But I think she keeps it a well-guarded secret. Right. But uh, it was a good night. Lots of discussion. We, uh, Diane uh, Booker, she uh, she told us of uh, her husband's experience. He had a bad accident on the farm, and uh, it's really eye-opening when you get to people people telling different stories, their own or you know something they have firsthand knowledge of. So. It's it's worthwhile and um, to get the to get the message out to the kids, you know. Uh, somebody I don't know if it was you, Paul, that used the analogy. Uh, 
you know, when the seatbelt laws come in and uh, most of us disregarded it for a while, don't want to be told what to do, but, you know, it's been pounded or hammered in or whatever you want to call it, the message to the kids, put your seatbelts on. And now when I get in the car or previously that my kids don't ride with me that often anymore, but, uh, you know, let's say, dad, put your seatbelt on. You know, it's, uh, and it's the same. It's the message on the farm, you know, stop, think and act before you do anything. So. Thanks, yeah. uh, thanks, Dan, for that. And, and what it was, we invited the mayors or alternates from all the counties, all the municipalities in the county of Gray. We had representation all but the city of Montana. And uh, I sat beside Mayor um, Sue, uh, Sue Par yeah, Carlton, but Sue Patterson said, Patterson. she said, how come you guys don't have a booth at, uh, at Hanover? And I said, well, if you support our organization and put a member on there, we'll, we'll make sure we'll get somebody at your fair, right? So, oh, okay. But it was an eye-opener and it was really good. And we, you know, I think, Tom, you were at it four years ago when you were on there and it was a great opportunity just to showcase what we're all about on a shoestring budget, as uh, Tony says. And uh, we try to bring the best awareness that we can to the farming community that's that's out there. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's covered. I don't know if there's any last uh, comments with regards to... Council Curley's, I see under the uh, Maxwell Community Center rental rates, I see uh, there's a there's a category for adult birthday parties. So I guess that's where you're fitting in there, Councilor Wicken. So I saw that. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's no closed session. Uh, lots of jokes there. Uh, I see there's no closed session for today. So let me move on. Uh, we need a motion then to confirm the uh, a bylaw that confirm the proceedings of today. Councilor Lowhead, Councilor Allwood. Any discussion there? That's with regards to uh, 2023 43. All in favor? That's carried. Upcoming meetings. <clears throat> so we have the upcoming meetings uh, listed there. Uh, there was some discussion at our next council meeting with regards to I know three members are going to be at Good Roads um, about moving it, but there's some conflict with other dates. It was scheduled for 10 o'clock. My suggestion is, could we move that to one o'clock and keep that day? And that would allow, it's just one suggestion, uh, maybe not such a long agenda. <laughs> just just saying in the sense of, of canceling a meeting, then it, it gets long on the next one. So yeah, I mean, it is what it is, but uh, are there any, because I think uh, we know like the deputy mayor, Council Lowhead, Councilor Wickens, uh, we'll be attending the Ontario Good Roads Association and it might be a little, a little late getting back to meet 10 o'clock, one o'clock might work. I don't know if, so the option is, is canceling, looking for a different day or does one o'clock work for you guys? It's more about you guys. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be remote at the next meeting, whether I have, if I can get in on, uh, I'm going to be going away a little bit of a trip, but I'm still going to try to get in on the meeting if I have internet. So um, what's your thoughts? Council Lowhead and then Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I think that we should uh, be able to get back up for the afternoon. I take a look at the, um, the program for the uh, conference and it seems to wrap up sort of, you know, um, late morning. So we could probably skip out on the goodbyes and uh, and be back for a council meeting at 1 p.m. That works for me. Generally 11 o'clock. It's not too bad getting out of Toronto at 11 o'clock, right? You're missing it. Councilor Wickens? Yeah, I wondered if you would uh, rent us a private jet. We could definitely be back at one o'clock. Well, I know a guy who has one. Whether he had to give you a ride or not, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think that one o'clock would probably be all right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And Deputy Mayor, sorry. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think uh, one o'clock should work if we're um, leaving around 1030 from Toronto or 11 o'clock at the latest. Should be able to make it back in time. We just miss it on the good old prize giveaway. You might still be all right. <clears throat> yeah, Camp Madam Clerk. I think you. I do just have to let you know that we do have three scheduled delegations for the April nineteenth meeting. Um, so whatever decision we make, we will um, check in with them and uh, make sure that it still works for them. And if not, we'll see if we can't schedule them for another day. Um, however, our first meeting in May is already a full. Um, the schedule is already full for delegations on that meeting as well. Well, I want to be want to talk to us. <laughs> right on. Okay, so that uh, takes care of that. Okay, I can have a motion then we move the, what is that date? April 19th, April 19th to 1 p.m. Council Lowhead, Deputy Mayor, 
Any discussion on that? Seeing that, all in favor? That is carried. The only other date is in June, our first meeting in June. I'm not sure. I, I booked up for the Ontario Association of Committee of Adjustments, and I don't know if you're considering it. I don't know if anybody else is, Paul, Councillor Allen. I wonder if that one could be moved to one o'clock as well, because it's uh, it goes on to the Wednesday. Do you need that motion now, or could that come a little later? No, okay. Um, the sooner you schedule, the better it is, and the easier it is for us when scheduling delegations or anybody that needs to speak. Okay. But when would somebody care to move on, the, I think it's June 4th. Uh, June 4th, is that our first meeting? Oh. It's whatever. Yes, it's 4th to the 6th. Yeah, so June, whatever the Wednesday is. Sorry. So moved by Councilor Wickens. Do we have a seconder? Councilor Dubik. Uh, the first meeting in June be changed to one o'clock. Does that work? Is it the seventh? Yeah. Okay. Any discussion there? That's good to get it ahead of time. Okay. All in favor of that? That's carried. Okay. Anything else on meetings? Oh. Yes. Yes. Zoning. Um, so, Madam Clerk, hmm? but you're saying the next next one is full. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah. If you if you want to do a poll, I understand the urgency of moving quicker than than later on that. So we can have a separate committee of the whole, which the uh, chair of planning would chair. And uh, would three hours be suffice? <laughs> or is this something that we want to do a, a full day, like a ten to ten in the afternoon till? What's your thoughts? Do you want to do that in the Google Bowl too? Um, how about I touch base with the manager of planning and see how long he thinks that he needs to portray the information and then give another hour after that for uh, answering questions and that kind of stuff. And then that'll determine the timing if that works for everybody. And I'll send that out in the poll. Sure. Okay. Yep. Okay. We do want to keep moving things forward because there also is the review of our official plan that needs to have it moving along as well. And maybe that could happen. Son of a team, sign a team, can't say the word in parallel, in parallel. <laughs> well, I know the county did the second roll around with their official plan last year. Staff. I, don't know. I, know. I know there's just some housekeeping stuff that uh, needs to be addressed. I'm hearing that a bit from the public as well. Okay, so is there anything with me in regards to the meetings then? All right. To adjourn. Yeah, uh, Councilor Wicken, second by Councilor Lowhead at uh, 507. All in favor? That's carried. I got that right. 508. That's carried. Well, thanks, everyone. We only went seven minutes past five. So, Councilor Wickens, does that work? We're seven minutes past five. Well, uh, oh, Deputy Mayor. Have a great Bye. night, everybody. Okay. See you later.